What is the most unreasonable thing you've been asked to do at work? Worked at a grocery chain as a courtesy slash utility clerk. The vendor for 7up and Dr. Pepper screwed up stacking their pallets, so they all fell over, creating a nice pile of broken glass, sticky soda, and wet messy cardboard point boss made me clean it all up and told me not to leave it even for a second. Got it all cleaned up in about 2 hours. Not bad save for me nearly getting shanked by some large glass shards on the floor, but where it became unreasonable was the very next day, I got called into the office and written up. By the same boss. Why? I had failed to do floor inspections. He expected me to be able to be in two places at once point that was fun to contest, edit, wow, this blew up. I'll try to address some things in the comments here, he's just a shitty employee, that's why he was fired, nope. My store was closing, and management kept mum on it until 6 months out, opting to instead weed out whatever employees they could easily fire and transfer the rest to surrounding stores. Most everyone who was not protected by seniority via the union were let go for stupid reasons, myself and others, who were under the 15 year mark. If they couldn't find a reason to toss you, you were transferred to another store and hoped that you couldn't make it there. Like one guy who was transferred an hour away. By car. He had no car. Furthermore, when it came to floor violations, one, the one mentioned in this story shouldn't have counted against my three, two. The management loved to let them stack. Like, I didn't know I had two more, until I was fired, when it was mentioned I had missed one the day before, and then another one many months back, that they decided to say absolutely nothing about. Had I known about that one in the middle I would have probably began taking that sheet way more seriously, and telling my boss to fuck off, lest I get fired for not doing floors so why was I singled out? Because I was the last one in my job class who had less than 15 years seniority. Everyone above me had been there for 20 and 30 years, and I was the last to go. They saw an easy reason to toss me out, and they went for it. They did the same for everyone else, that they could point was this at X. Sorry, to protect myself, I'm not going to confirm or deny what grocery chain this took place at point there's no way it took you 2 hours to clean up some pallets. Yes it did. First off, it was a bunch of glass and ruptured soda bottles. The glass was from Snapple bottles. Second, it was about 4 pallets full of this stuff, stacked on top of each other. When that sheet falls, it tends to go everywhere. This stuff wasn't even constrained by ties or anything. It flew. Everywhere. Something I didn't mention, didn't think I'd have to, is that I had to cut off all the UPCs I could from the destroyed packaging and document how many of each item we lost. I also had to clean up the vile mix of HFCS laden water and tea from the ground, and that sheet is very sticky. It also got everywhere, almost flooding part of the back room. Part of it also seeped into the meat department, and of course, that had to be cleaned. When I was 18, I worked part time at Ups, and also part time at Burger King, which was more of a way to eat for free every day than anything else. This was in 2000 or 2001, so minimum wage was still $4.25 $5.15, and I wasn't making much more than that at back point I'm working the drive through window one night when a visibly intoxicated couple comes into the dining room and orders some food. My manager was working register, and one other guy was there cooking the food. The drunks ordered a bunch of deep fried stuff, and we didn't have enough chicken tenders on hold, so the manager tells them it's going to be a couple minutes while the tenders and fries cook. No problem, they're going to use the restroom point the restrooms were down a hall and the doors faced each other, so we didn't think anything of it when they went down the hall together. Their order comes up, and they're not back yet, so we bag it up and leave it under the heat lamps while we wait for them. Two minutes turns into five, and I'm busy on the DT window, so I half as forgot about them point an indeterminate amount of time goes by, probably 15 minutes, maybe half an hour, and my manager asks me if I expedited that order, gave them their food. I tell her no, they never came back for their food after going to the bathroom. She goes into the women's room, doesn't see anyone, then opens the door to the men's room. I heard her dry heave from my station at the window, a good 20 feet, 6 meters, away. 
she came around the wall that separated the dining area from the work area, and it looked like she'd seen a ghost or a dead body. I asked her what was wrong, and she just shook her head, telling me that she would take over DT window because I had to clean the bathroom. Point I geared up, elbow length gloves, goggles, dust mask, and slickers, not knowing what kind of hell was unleashed in that stall. Nothing, and I mean nothing, could have prepared me for what I saw in there. It looked like they huked up a colostomy bag full of mostly liquid sheet and semi-chunky vomit to a paint sprayer and blasted every single surface in there with the sheet puke. The stall was caked, the door handle had sheet smeared on it, there was vomit in the sink, next to the sink, in the trash can, next to the trash can, just faking everywhere I looked there was sheet puke or both point i didn't even make it three steps into the room before my gag reflex reminded me that it existed my eyes were watering my stomach was doing somersaults and i was choking back my own barrage of puke when it hit me hey fuck this nope not a faking chance i choked out through gasps of air not a faking chance in hell i'm cleaning that up call hazmat half joking not thinking my manager would actually expect me to clean that up Boy, was I ever wrong. Optical delusions. If that bathroom isn't clean by the end of your shift then don't bother coming bae she didn't get to finish the sentence. I'd already thrown my hat and shirt on the floor. Sorry, Joel, but you don't pay me nearly enough for this sheet. I can find another sheety minimum wage job tomorrow. Good luck with that debacle in there. And just like the phantom sheet pukers, I was gone point at it. I quickly looked at this to see the minimum wage in 2000. Federal minimum was $5.15. Ohio's minimum was $4.25. Federal Trump's state. So I was probably making $5.15 slash HR or a little more. I wouldn't have cleaned that sheet pockle pice up for $51.50 slash HR. So the point is moot. Thanks to the dozen or so of you who caught it. We used to have to destroy hundreds and hundreds of books at my job and we weren't allowed to do anything with them, but put them in the recycling bin. This is called stripping a book, strip because this process involves tearing off the front cover to be sent back to the publisher as proof of destruction, and then the actual book discarded point I felt like my heart was being ripped out when I had to strip my favorite books and throw them away. At one point my staff recommendation was the Hunger Games not long after it came out, and at the height of its popularity I had to strip 300 copies of it, because my assistant manager decided we had too many copies, and she was sick of looking at the boxes in the back room. In the back room. The storage room. Where overstock is supposed to be. And this is a book, that we literally could not stop selling it was so popular. The biggest burn of it all, when our computer system saw we had suddenly lost 300 copies from the store, it ordered us 500 more. Which I warned the assistant manager would happen, but she said it wouldn't throw chairs. They used to allow employees to take stripped books, but that ended after I'd only been with the company a couple years. Whenever we had to strip hundreds of copies of children's books I'd get so upset since there are so many schools slash children who'd love to have those books. Edit. People keep asking why the books weren't donated. The reason is that after a book is stripped and processed out the book is once again the property of the publisher. For the publishers, it's much easier and more cost effective to destroy the books than have them returned to them. As for why publishers won't let the bookstores donate the books, well, you'd have to ask them, read, sales, and bookstores, mine at least, can't sneakily donate the books instead of recycling them, because that would be fraud and theft, which could get the bookstore sued, or their relationship with the publisher ended. While this sucks, no matter how you look at it, it's actually not uncommon. It's very possible that it had some sort of safety recall on it that they were trying to keep under wraps, but it happens to regular product as well. Point I've worked at three different retail chains and it's more prominent at the larger corporations. At one of my jobs, we regularly get items that are penny items. They ring up for zero dollars and one cent on clearance, and while you can ring one up for a customer slash sell it, as soon as you are able you must remove the product from the shelf and destroy it slash throw it away. You cannot knowingly sell the product unless it is brought to you without your guidance, and you cannot buy the product point it has something to do with taxes. 
If they feel that the space the product is taking up is worth more than the product, they can write it off on their taxes as a loss. Pretty faked up point of course, if someone buys it first, good for them. I saw a woman walk out of our store with two buggies slash carts full of Marvel product, lunch boxes, mugs, cups, posters, for $1.39. She made it her job to find the penny items, buy them all, and then donate them to charity. She even gave one to the daughter of one of the workers, who couldn't buy it for herself. Edits. Did you know that there are YouTube videos that chronicle the sales slash clearance prices on items? There's one lady who keeps track of every good deal she can find and posts photos, prices, and information on where the clearance is kept, bins, shelf, bags, etc. Every time an item goes on mega clearance, a mass corporate email goes out notifying the general managers. If you have managers that aren't great with keeping up with those emails, or that make an executive decision that it can wait, then people see the YouTube video and buy it all before you lift a finger the recall thing was wishful thinking. I admit point, since I've been called out on bashing a tax system I don't fully comprehend, I'll admit I don't know the ins outs of how this helps the business. I understand that it is used as a way to lower the overall amount of money the company sends off in taxes each year ad. That is how it was explained to me by my boss. Marking down product to nothing doesn't really bother me. However when a perfectly good product is thrown away or destroyed rather than donated or given away simply because it wasn't worth it. That's bullshit. The fact that anyone can save slash make more money destroying non-perishable functional product than they could make by donating it is faked up. When I worked security at a hospital, I was walking to a parking garage to let someone out. On the way there was a set of bathrooms before the bridge I needed to get to. The supervisor of my team called me on the radio and told me to go into the women's restroom and find out who was in there. Me being a guy, I was obviously a little concerned with this order and said I would wait outside. He then begins badgering me, again over a radio, saying just do what I tell you to do, and go in there, and figure out who that girl is. Look tell that nurse to go in there. A nurse happened to be walking past me to go to the garage, as her shift was over again. No, even if there's someone, that is not supposed to be here in that bathroom, I'm not sending an off the clock nurse, even an on the clock nurse, to figure out who someone is for me. So I wait for a minute or two, and out walks this girl, that is like 13 years old, then around the corner, comes a guy that looks, like he is around my age, that was waiting for her, he probably heard this whole radio exchange, they are here at 3am, because a family member has been in critical condition for the past few days and she just needed to use the faking bathroom. What happened was, my supervisor was watching where I was going on the cameras, and saw I was going towards where this bathroom was, saw her, then tried to get me to do the above point later. Something that couldn't be turned into a bedophilia charge occurred involving someone falling on the sidewalk near the hospital and him, and I happened to be free and went over. In front of another guest, and some EMTs he asks me to go into the security office and get something, and this as whole, has the nerve to say, or are you too scared to follow a simple order? Well, if you want to be this unprofessional, sure we can have this out I'm thinking. I explained to him, again, that I'm not walking in on some girl in a bathroom, when I can simply just wait for her to come out and not look like a creep point god I hated the supervisors there. They were all those stereotypical one ablio security that we all find annoying a sheet. A few years back I was working at a cafe owned by a free spirit. Our restaurant had a history of hygiene issues and only ever barely passed our health inspection tests. A bad Yelp review had just turned the spotlight on us even more, and the worst part was, our biggest threat wasn't even known to the customers. Mice. Mice of every shape and size. Numerous mice point my employer had asked me to bring my cat in for an overpass mice romp, but something told me she would fire me, or the cat, if he wasn't successful, and I just couldn't do that to either of us, so she turned to non-lethal traps. These sticky traps unfortunately worked, and they worked well. Right around the time of our lunch rush, the sounds of our meager kitchen were being drowned out by the screams of a half dozen, very much alive mice. 
We had to keep the radio on extremely loud otherwise the customers would have easily been able to decipher the odd noise that sounded a little like bacon frying. But no smell did accompany point around 3pm my boss finally decided what to do with the mice. I told her about what my family did to moles growing up. Grab a shovel and send them on their way to the other side, but she wouldn't have it. Instead she told me that I had to bring them a few miles away and release them. She gave me directions to a graveyard where she was sure no one would be. She gave me a bonus of the efforts and with how broke I was in college, I couldn't possibly say no point so there I am, driving to a graveyard with six or seven mice screaming their heads off on the floor of my backseat. I, the insane bastard I am, telling them all that they would be alright and believing it. Maybe only because I had just read Morse did I feel very uneasy in what my mission was as I pulled into a small road that winded through some trees. I began going over my checklist. Knife, spatula, get the mice free, run. That is all I had to do. Like most seemingly straightforward plans, mine was doomed from the start point the mice were freaking the fuck out. I couldn't cut around the mice because they were twisting and the stickiness wouldn't cut into squares along their feet like I had thought. They were also stuck far worse than I had imagined. Their faces, their bellies, they had pissed themselves and all of it was making my lunch break very disheartening. I did my best. I felt like the opera meme. You get a spatula, you get the knife, you, well I don't know what the fuck to do with you. The mice ended up breaking their own legs. Most hobbled away with large pieces of sticky trap still on them. Others weren't so lucky. For the ones that were too trapped in the sticky, I decided to dawn the cloak of death and become his willing tool. Driving my car with the music on full volume do make say think, so I didn't have to. I carefully crushed the helpless couple of mice that were left by the others without an ounce of hope. I drove off without throwing away the trap or looking back. Part of me wanted to at least give them a somewhat honorable send off, however I felt that they were in the right place for that, and after all that sort of thing has to go through the right channels and paperwork and the gravekeepers would know much more about their profession than I did point flash forward one week later. More mice. Literally, many, many more, all on sticky paper. This time I did the only reasonable and humane thing I could think to do. I looked up what dissolves sticky traps. Within 5 minutes using a corn oil based solution, the mice were running free, headed right towards our competitor's kitchen door. And that ladies and gentlemen is not only how I got into the business of sabotage, but also the story of my most unreasonable request I've been asked to do at work. Not me but in a book I have called in your own words. Basically it was an article in a British newspaper every Sunday that got stopped and all the articles collaborated into a book. Anyway the story is quite long, a fair amount of time ago boy scouts used to do bob a job, to earn some money for themselves, and to get a badge for helping the community. Then they would give a job done sticker to the person they helped, so they wouldn't keep getting pestered. Well I was doing this job for my badge, and went into a local co-op he brought me into a back room, it was large and cavernous, and not very well lit. Full of boxes, sacks, and smells as you can imagine a store would have. However there in a clearing on the floor was a cat and some kittens. The store owner said to me something I never wanted to hear now for your bob. I want you to take this sack and bucket of water, get the kittens and drown them. We need the cat to keep the mice down but this is too many. I'll leave you to it with that he turned on his heel and strode back out onto the shop floor. I hesitated but felt committed to do the task. To this day the movement of those small animals in that sack still unsettle me. I told no one what I did at the co-op that day. It still haunts me whenever I see a sticker saying job done in a window for the boy scouts by the way I have paraphrased this. It is a lot better in the book. I worked as an assistant general manager at a small radio station for almost 10 years. I was very passionate about my job and loved working for my boss, the general manager. In my last year there, the general manager quit. She was an excellent boss with an amazing work ethic and was extremely knowledgeable about the radio business, so it was a real shame to lose her. I considered quitting myself, but decided to stay on because of how much I loved the station slash my job. Big mistake point the problem started when it took 4 months for the position to be filled. In that time, I stepped up as interim general manager and basically ran the station with only one other part-time person, while still completing my job duties as well as the GM duties. 
At first, they offered me the job, but it came with more hours, less pay, and they would also dissolve the assistant position, since they knew I could do both. Needless to say, I turned it down, and the higher ups were pissed point, when the position was finally filled, they hired a lady who lacked even a single day of radio experience. She came from sales at Comcast, and had been released from duties by her previous employer, which was in the sales department at a local TV station. It was made very clear to me, that I had to do the training for the new hire, since no one else knew what the GM position really required. The higher ups wanted the new GM to be finished with training by the end of the first week point I had to train my boss to do her job, while also acting as her subordinate. Not an easy balance. To make matters worse, this new GM was an alcoholic, homophobic racist idiot who couldn't remember anything longer than a few seconds so, when it came time for her to do a task on her own, she would freeze up freak out, or just walk away from the situation altogether in hopes that I would do it. And because I loved my job and the station, I would clean up her mess. She would yell at callers who called with complaints about how the station was being run. She also ignored our sales clients when they called, leaving me to clean everything up. The higher ups noticed that things weren't running smoothly, so they blamed me and told me I hadn't trained her properly, even though the job was super complex with a wide variety of tasks. They also allowed the new GM to edit her job duties so that she could pass on the boring, challenging, or time-consuming jobs down to me. So by the end of the new GM's first month, she was sitting at her desk shopping online, while I rushed around the office doing my job as well as most of here's the kicker, the GM position came with a stipend that was supposed to cover any overtime slash evening slash night hours in case of emergency. It was a pretty hefty stipend that had clear guidelines for why it was in place. The GM handed all overtime slash evening slash night hours down to me, while still paying herself the stipend and mileage for these late hours. When I approached the higher ups about it out of concern, they yelled at me for not knowing my place, and for being disrespectful to my boss. I kept count of how many hours I worked overtime without getting paid, and by the time I found a new job, they owed me close to $3,000 in unpaid overtime. At the same time that I handed in my two weeks notice, I gave them my detailed list of overtime hours and demanded I get paid. They knew they were looking at a possible lawsuit in the works, so they basically paid me to leave Point Ugg. It still irritates me to talk about it, even after two years. It was the weirdest, most miserable year of my life. Gather round children, and I'll tell you the tale of the sheet biscuit point I used to work at a truck stop, and this particular truck stop I worked at had a scale. When they are over the weight limit 4 roads truckers like to dump anything they can. So I'm cleaning up the perimeter of the back parking lot, and one trucker has dumped a pallet of biscuit dough. Think those tubes of Pillsbury biscuits you can buy at the supermarket. Now it's one of the hottest summers in Florida in a good long time, it's easily 105 degrees. The biscuits have all exploded and formed a blob of dough that is easily 4 feet tall and about 8 feet around point it gets worse other truckers have dumped their piss bottles, sheet buckets, just he used condoms and bottles of other bodily fluids into the biscuit blob. Hell one or two of the truckers probably vomited on this thing trying to stick piss bottles into it. So now there is a giant 4 foot tall sheet biscuit baking in the 100 degree sun. Nothing comes close to even describing this thing. Imagine the worst thing you've ever smelt, and then think of what it would smell like if it had been marinated in sheet and piss and stuck in an oven to bake. My boss, this is whole Arabic dude, comes out and looks at it. Now this guy, this faking guy, has the nerve to tell me to get some gloves and start scooping it up. He wants me to scoop up a 500 pound sheet biscuit with my hands, put it in a tiny wheelbarrow, and walk it all the way across the parking lot to the dumpster, and then pick it up with my hands again. Point I told him no way, in faking hell I was going to do any of that. He then proceeds to pick some of it up with his bare hands. See it's just smeldo, now get to work, or you not come back tomorrow I quit on the spot, and left him with standing there with sheet in his hands and the abomination baking in the sun. I was working at an auto parts store as a teenager. One day, the store owner tells me that I will be installing plastic conduit piping for the power cable on some piece of equipment. This will require climbing a 20 foot ladder multiple times. No big deal, 
I get to drill holes into a sea idea block wall. Sounds like fun. Halfway down the side of the wall I was working on, I encounter stacks of shelves up against the base of the wall. These shelves make it impossible to prop the ladder against the wall. No sweat, he says, we'll prop it against the shelves, and he'll just hold it in place, so I don't fall. Sounds good. I climb up, get the drill going, and as I'm about to huck the piping in place, the bottom of the ladder slides out about a foot. I panic, grab the top of the ladder, and look around to see the owner walking up towards the front of the store. By the time he gets back, I'm three or so feet further out from the wall, and holding on for dear life. He walks up, and starts explaining why the ladder was sliding out from the wall, using words like fulcrum point and coefficient of friction. I yelled out, no, the ladder started sliding, because you weren't holding the faking ladder. I climbed down, ask him how he would have handled the workers comp claim, if I had fallen. He tells me I wouldn't get workers comp, since I was a teenager slash part time employee. That was my second to last day working for that store. I've got a bunch, this all occurred, when I worked at a machine shop, boss demanded I work a 23.5 hour day then return, to work at 6am the following morning, that's a one half hour to drive home, and sleep and drive back, to return to work on heavy machinery point forced to wash boss's classic car collection on a regular basis, forced to pull weds out of the cracks in huge parking lot, no tools, just my hands 8 hour shift. The next day I was told to do the same thing, but to scrape the dirt out of the cracks this time point forced to scrape decades of grime and tar off the shop floor 3 inch thick. After 10 hours I had cleaned 6 square feet. Completely pointless forced to climb on top of a 100 years old running drill press to oil the bearings. Nearly lost my hand when the bearings seized point forced to dig through a dumpster and each trash bag. To retrieve a check that was mistakenly thrown away by my boss three days prior six hours later. Found the check. Torn up into little pieces didn't even need to look for it anyway. Point forced to clean aluminum parts with toxic corrosive solvents and acids. No gloves or safety glasses. When I complained I was given vinyl food service gloves that were about 20 years old. And no goggles the gloves melted onto my hands upon contact with solvents. My boss found that hilarious told to manufacture parts to within 0.003 tolerance, extremely precise, on literally broken machining equipment that had been broken for 20 years without repair. When my boss was informed his request was impossible to accomplish due to the state of repair of the machinery, he was totally pissed and completely taken aback that his 20 plus year neglected machinery was not functional. The staff was accused of breaking the equipment to avoid work and sent home for 3 days until the boss relented and paid to fix the equipment he neglected for 20 years. Even the repair guy was disgusted and told my boss the machine was destroyed by neglect point told to take my lunch break, paid, working at my machining station, filthy cutting coolant and metal shavings thrown everywhere, not to mention heavy machinery all around me, if I wanted to eat lunch in a sanitary and safe place I was told to clock out and go home for the day point forced to piss in the shop bathroom sink. For months, all guys at this shop, because the toilet got clogged and boss refused to call a plumber, the office bathroom was off limits to all shop staff. Some people had some close calls and nearly sheet themselves at work point yeah, that place was funded I mentioned my boss would also throw blocks of aluminum at you if you made a machining mistake and I don't mean throw it in your general direction, I mean throw a block of aluminum right at your head point did I also mention this job paid $8 an hour, yeah. Fact that point it was an unfaking believable experience point eventually I one day I walked into work one morning, dreading existence, and shortly after clocking in I was greeted with a screaming boss and a huge workload for the day. I was done that was it. No more point I was still holding my time card and I tore it up and threw it on the ground then spit on it and walked out point I was followed to my car by my boss berating me about how I better not come back and beg for my job back point I went home and had a nice 2 hour long phone call with OSHA and the department of labor. I also made sure to contact all my former coworkers and have them call as well. I also called the BBB and reported them as being an extremely unscrupulous business and shipping refurbused manifolds as brand new. This is fraud. 
I considered contacting the customers and informing them of the fraud, but I just wanted to forget about the entire thing at that point. Point my old boss was righteously faked in the as by OSHA in the Department of Labor and prosecuted for wage theft. Point as far as I know the shop was shut down last year and the property is for sale. I don't know why though point I swear, if I ever run into my old boss randomly on the street I'm going to bludgeon him to death with the nearest blunt object. To work with the most negative, passive aggressive person on the planet for a boss. She hated her job and life and had an office just outside where our desks were. My other coworker and I would talk about how bad she was, then one day he left. She never replaced him, knowing I would be swamped under the all the work. I worked like that for a few months, stressed, unhappy she would barely help, instead go in her office and talk on the phone and I knew at times was talking shit about me with whomever. She started going home early, so when it got late and everyone left I would go into her office and read her emails. Yes, she was too stupid to password protect her computer. Nothing groundbreaking in the emails, but a few about how she disliked me to another person, and then I found a few where she badmouthed the head boss who worked downstairs. I made a plan to leave that job a few weeks later, but what I did was also plan for a massive exit. Our work needed to get entered for a Friday cutoff. It was 100% necessary to be entered by Friday 4pm. Starting that week's Monday, I kept all the documents to be entered hidden. I didn't enter one thing the whole week. During the week, I started forwarding her emails where she badmouthed the boss to my email. I then deleted the sent email. On Friday, she went to a late lunch at 1pm. I then composed an email saying goodbye to everyone and that I could no longer work with this horrible person. I then copied the emails below what I wrote to prove how nasty she was. I then took all the saved up papers to be entered, a huge stack, and put them on her chair while she was at lunch. On it, I left a sticky note that just read payback is a beach. Sent the email and walked out. Never. Felt. Better. This will probably get buried. Used to work at a very high-end men's only golf club. Average member was likely worth in the tens of millions. A lot of them were pigs. We'd routinely see them with their mistresses at the course and hear stories about their constant cheating. Point one day I'm working the morning shift, 5.45 a.m. start, and I get called into the pro shop around 7.30. Apparently one of these assholes has left his cell phone at home and couldn't have his still sleeping wife find it and all the evidence of his transgressions. But said asshole also has a tea time coming up and god forbid he miss that point enter the lowly range attendant to save the day. I had to drive to his house, which was about 20 minutes away, and wake his wife who greeted me in a bathrobe. No this isn't going where you think it is. She was decent looking, and probably 20 years his junior. She kindly provided me with the cell phone and I returned to the course anticipating a huge tip. I drove out to the third hole, where his foursome currently was, delivered the goods, and got a patronizing thanks buddy. I had literally saved this guy half of his net worth by preventing a divorce and had nothing to show for it. Worst of all the pro shop didn't even count me for the gas money point TLDR. Saved a guy from the same fate as Tiger Woods. Didn't get tipped. There are just too many points as the night manager of a fast food place near campus asked or closed at 3am. We had exactly one half hour to clean and close. If we were going to go over that one half hour, the manager wanted me to call him at 3.30 a.m. to tell him why, so he could approve our staying on the clock to finish cleaning. Otherwise, we could clock out and then finish cleaning. I only had to call him once before he changed the policy point same place as above. Money was disappearing. The manager decided to assign us cash registers. This would have been great, except when it go busy, he expected us to let others use our register. I told him that was fine, but once someone else touched the register, I was no longer responsible for the amount of money in it. He said I was. I said I wasn't. I wasn't. Turns out a fairly new employee had gotten the combo to the safe and was taking money directly from their point same place, same manager. Stop taking gifts from customers. I had exactly two customers that for some reason, took a liking to me. One was a four-year-old girl accompanied by her mother. One day, they came in, and the little girl gave me a dime store necklace. 
It probably didn't cost more than a dollar, but they bought it just for me. Another customer was an older guy who I actually thought was homeless, but he would bring me ice cream from the store next door every once in a while. I told my manager there was no way I was going to turn down token gifts from appreciative customers and that, unless he thought I was exchanging food for dime store gifts from toddlers or ice cream from homeless guys, I would continue to accept these signs of customer appreciation and he should be glad the customers thought I was doing a good enough job to express their appreciation, because he sure as hell didn't express any to me. Point 4. I worked at a school for emotionally disturbed children. There were five dorms, read old houses, on campus, each housing about 10 adolescent children who were either mentally challenged, emotionally disturbed, or, sometimes, just normal kids. All these kids had been taken from their parents by the state, and were essentially warehoused at this type of residential treatment center they were all on copious amounts of medications which were doled out in little cups, and then distributed by a nurse who walked to the dorms from the main building. The kids would like up, and the nurse would hand each kid the little cup with their meds. As often as not, the kid would say these aren't my meds. The nurse would look at the cup, take it back, and then give them the right cup of meds we got a new nurse who decided it wasn't safe for her to walk to each dorm at 8pm at night to give the kids their last dose of meds for the day, so management decided the minimum wage child care workers could pass out meds. After bringing up the prior medication mistakes made by the nurses passing out meds for the 100th time, I refused to pass out meds. The other staff member on my shift did it. I told him, if anything happened to one of these kids, because of the wrong meds, he would be the one fed to the bears, not the nurse, and not the management 5. When I was at EBA, the Shio hired two project managers he had worked with at a major consulting firm. These women had no technical expertise at all, but wanted to make all the technical decisions we had just installed a new app a couple of months prior to this incident. I had sent emails to all project personnel, including these two project managers, with their login credentials. This was before its security was a big issue, so emailing credentials was SOP. In the email, I asked everyone to log into the system and let me know if they had any problems. Fast forward two months. I had been allowed to go to training after much begging and pleading. Two days of off-site training in my field. It was manna from heaven. Halfway through the first day, I get a call from one of the project managers. She needed her password to log into the system. The one I sent her two months ago, and asked her to checkpoint I explained to her that I did not remember her password, and I had no remote access to our systems, but she could probably find the previous email I had sent her, and get her password there point no, that was too much work for her. She wanted me to leave training, travel the hour back to the office, find her password, and then return to training. I explained that the training was very technical and fast paced and that if I left, there would be no point in going back as I would be too far behind to catch up again and understand what was going on. I told her that my boss could reset her password point not good enough. She had looked for my boss and he was not immediately available, so she wanted me to come back to the office. Nope. Not even point I finished the training, and when I returned to the office I was called into the Shio's office for a dressing down. I listened quietly, went back to my desk, wrote up my resignation, went back to the Shio, and gave it to him. He started backpedaling so fast it would make your head spin point this was back, when DBAs were hard to find, and I could have another job within the hour complete with pay raise and signing bonus. It took them a while to find another DBA point so, whether it's a minimum wage job or a six figure job, many, many bosses are just a holes. While working for a non-profit organization in Zambia, the boss of our organization ran away from the country for two months. Cut off all contact. Told us all he had testicular cancer, later found out it was a lie, we were in the middle of a huge audit by UNICEF that had $50,000 riding on it, and the whole office was in a huge mess. I was a 20 year old summer intern, and my two years of college made me the most educated person in the room. My Zambian bosses started asking me to forge everything. Minutes that never happened, contracts that were never drafted, budgets that did not exist, because they had spent all of the money on themselves. Everything. The justification? You're from America, you know how to do these things, when. I refused, they all flipped out. 
I told them it was illegal, and they emphasized that everyone does this. They were sort of correct in that sense, almost all the organizations I knew they were taking money and fudging the numbers. But I was not about to shake down UNICEF point regardless, I stopped showing up. The staff rebelled because they hadn't been paid in 6 months, and I went into my own pocket to finish up my time there. The boss eventually returned, everyone came back, and UNICEF approved their audit. Because why the hell not, right? TLDR non-profits waste your money in the developing world. Don't let your children carry around orange UNICEF boxes on Halloween. This might get buried, but here we go. A few years back I worked at a music retail store that also gave instrument lessons. Well one day one of the piano teachers approaches my manager and me stating that someone had clogged the toilet. Being the only guy working at the time, I knew it would be my duty to go clear things up. Now oddly enough, I've had to deal with situations like this in the past. Why people decide to unleash their fury in a music store is beyond me but it usually doesn't take more than 5 minutes to clear up point. When I entered the restroom I was immediately greeted by the putrid smell of something that had been sitting for maybe 30 minutes or so. I wanted to get this over with so I could get back to work as fast as possible. So I immediately went to assess the damage. I had no idea what I was in for. I looked into the toilet only to come across, no exaggeration, a solid log that must have been at least 12 inches long with the girth of a solo cup point I was absolutely dumbstruck. None of my past experiences could have prepared me for this, and I could not wrap my head around the fact that this behemoth came out of someone, regardless of their size. Unsure of what to do, I attempted to flush the toilet in order to see if the any water could drain. As it turned out the water was able to drain due to the way the turt coiled around the bowl, however none of the sheet would drain with it point the first thing I had to decide was how I was going to get this monstrosity flushed. I decided that the best course of action would be to cut it up into pieces using the plunger. Well as it turns out, the smell of a turt on the inside is a lot worse than the smell of it on the outside. So after a combination of cutting, gagging, and constantly spraying Febreze I eventually cut it up into several pieces. I then decided to flush which worked fantastically at actually causing the toilet to clog. So this was just getting better and better to wrap things up. I had to end up mixing the sheet into an esquickish soup. And after an hour of plunging, spraying, and wondering what crime I must have committed in a past life to deserve this, I finally subdued the beast. Luckily, none of it splashed up onto my white dress shirt that I was required to wear, so I suppose it could have been a lot worse point TLDR, I didn't get paid enough for the sheet I had to put up with. I'm an electrician. A couple years ago I was driving a service van for a company. My boss asked me to go to the penthouse suite of a condo building to meet the owner. When I asked him why slash what I would be doing there, he told me that our local utility provider had called him and asked that someone go visit this suite because it was drawing way more power than it should be and the monthly bills were ridiculously high. Then he told me that either he or the utility provider thought that the high power draw was due to a grow up being located in the suite or somewhere else in the building. I thought it was a request more suited for an undercover cop pretending to be an electrician, but I went anyways. I was kind of happy that I wasn't changing light bulb somewhere instead, and looked forward to the excitement point when I arrived. I met the owner of the penthouse and everything went fine. I even joked about searching his suite for a grow opus. We both laughed, but the whole time I was there I was looking over my shoulder to see if this guy was gonna pull a gun on me or something. I searched his whole suite and found nothing really out of the ordinary. I concluded that the excess power draw was likely from the rooftop hot tub he had that was old and poorly insulated point in any case it was an interesting day. Our faking lieutenant, Colonel, who was too faking scared to leave base our entire deployment in the summer of 09 in Afghanistan, told us that we needed to dismount our trucks and use metal detectors to sweep for IEDs in the dried up creek bed called IED Wadi, Wadi, because it was a major chocker point point at this point, we had lost about 30 some trucks to that faking. Wadi, which is a dried up creek bed, 
It was bullshit to get out and sweep, because we all knew there was barely any metal in these IEDs, because those fakers are smart, and stopped putting metal in them, when they realized we were using metal detectors to find them. Anyway, so we have three marines on the ground to lance corporals, and our staff sergeant who wouldn't let the lances go out without him, because if he had to give a stupid order he was gonna be out there with them, while I watched over them on the 240 medium machine gun from the truck point so they swept and didn't find anything. We let an ace, basically a mini bulldozer with a bucket behind the blade, so it can move more dirt around cut us a new path, basically dig up a few inches and hope to dismantle any IEDs in the ground. Didn't get anything. Fifth or sixth truck that went through was blown up point that LT point colonel's reasoning for having us sweep. It's too expensive to keep losing trucks. Fact the marines lives, though. Then this faking sheetstin refuses to nominate a bunch of guys for doing heroic sheet and get them their medals and nominates himself for a bronze star because of what we did. I was the only guy at work when a complaint came to the manager that there was a clog in the men's restroom. Manger approaches me and asks if I could take care of the problem being the only guy at work that day. No problem, I think, means I can avoid customers for a bit. I get the supplies throw on some gloves and make my way to the restroom. Then I see it. A huge log the size of my calf is sitting in the toilet. The beefy turt is textured with bits of corn visible on its surface. Atop it lies one square of toilet paper, a veil over the gruesome bride I had no choice but to marry. I ponder the possibilities and decide breaking it up with the plunger was the best option. I give it a poke. It is firm in its resolve. My bride is feisty. I become more aggressive hacking and slashing away to reduce the log to a manageable size. The water line begins to rise. I flush. It still does not go down. Water is rising, rising, rising. My mind is racing. I say a prayer. There was no answer poo chunks spill over. I'm mortified. Luckily it stops quickly. I fetch them up and disinfectant. The cleanup is unpleasant, but the escaped poo chunks make it, so the rest can be freed into the watery pipes below. I breath a sigh of relief and cry a little inside, before returning to work. My boss had no clue the fiasco I had to deal with, but I felt a little bit like a poo hero for the rest of the day poo in peace my friends. I'm way too late to the party, but it's nice to get off my chest. I worked for Child Protective Services, CPS, and was asked by my supervisor, and by extension the director, to go remove a six or so our old newborn from his mother. I asked why, and was told we already have custody of her other child. Okay. Not unheard of and there is usually a good reason why someone who could not care for one child would not be able to care for another child, much less a newborn. However, there wasn't any direct evidence that she was a threat, and it seemed silly to take custody so soon point. So I go to the hospital, inform this woman who has just given birth that she is losing this child too. Her response was strange, and not at all what you would have expected. She was coherent and logical. She said that she had been doing everything the state had been asking her to do with this other child. She was under the impression she was on her way to getting the other child back and was not at all aware the plan was to terminate her parental rights I went back to the office and started asking questions. I had to anyway. When you remove a child you need to write a legal document outlining under which laws the child was removed and why there was imminent danger to remove the child without a previous court order. I'm not a fan of perjury, so I needed more supporting information than we already have her other child. I was told unequivocally that I needed to stop questioning that this case had been in the works for a year and who the hell was I to question point I dug through the three foot case file and read every goddamn page. She was right. Every hoop she had been asked to jump through, every drug test, everything just as we had asked. The case file said she was psychotic and made her a danger, but there was no mention of any psychotic behavior. None. I went back to the original complaint. She was arrested for appearing psychotic, but the hospital determined that she had been acting that way because she was high on something. Okay. It was worth removing the kid in the first place, but she got clean. She did everything she asked and was not psychotic. In fact, she was much more reasonable than I would have been in her situation. 
No one had bothered to read the report from the hospital and no one questioned that they hadn't seen psychotic behavior from her. So the case passed from one case worker to another and the story of her issues gathered more life from one to another. No one read the case file from start to finish point I brought this to the attention of my boss and was told that not everyone else was wrong and that I was not to acknowledge that she had done what she was asked to do, not reference the hospital report in any way point I will admit I went to court and presented the least information she affidavit ever written. I didn't lie, but I did omit. However I kept trying to give hints in my testimony that this was utter sheet and we should lose. However, the judge actually respected me and had no reason to know that this damn report even existed and what she had been presented so far was all based on the idea she was psychotic point this was so very very wrong. The baby wound up staying in the hospital for a bit for health issues. I made it so she could visit as much as she wanted because she was supervised by the nurses. I fought to undo everything that had been done that I helped to do. By the time the baby was being discharged from the hospital, the baby had been returned to her custody and the goal was no longer termination of parental rights for her other child. Point Myers had a giant target on it because of my insubordination, but you know what fuck them. I had no problem removing when a child was unsafe. But I would be damned that I would be party to tearing someone's family apart for no reason. Point TLDR. Fuck you former CPS supervisor and director. Best wishes to mom and her kiddos, who had way more strength and ability to be reasonable than most people could accomplish. Incoming wall text. TLDR at end point I was in Iraq in the Marine Corps. I was what is called a pogo person other than grunt. That means that I wasn't what most people think of when they think United States Marine. I was a smart guy in a very technical job field. I worked on lasers and guidance systems and sites. I was very much a nerd mixed in with a bunch of feral dogs. I was thrown into a grunt company so that if they broke any of their sheet, which they did on a regular basis, I could fix it so they could remain combat ready. So, I've been in this platoon and Iraq for a month now and sheet has been pretty quiet. We all of a sudden got an order to raid a village to try to nab someone. We are getting ready to do it and I assume... Since I knew the very basics of infantry tactics, I was going to wait in a vehicle. No point one of our grunts, a sergeant, came up to me and told me I was going to go point for his fire team. That means a lot of things. It is by far the most dangerous position in a fire team, as I'm the first guy to go into any area. I didn't know this at the time, but there are so many things a point man has to do when he is going house to house, most of which I had no idea about or maybe had the slightest inkling about. Also, all of this was going to be done in the dead of night, and I knew I had absolutely no idea what I would be doing point so what came out of my lance corporal mouth when he told me that, fuck no, to a sergeant that already didn't like me because I wasn't a grunt. So, I sat there for half an hour listening to this Filipino man yell at me buck no, buck no, you don't bucking, tell me buck no, I obviously caved in and ran point. Not two minutes into the op my co came out of nowhere and asked why the fuck is whoop leading this faking fire team. He then took point himself and I kind of followed people around learning a lot of what I should have been doing. I wouldn't have done a tenth. Of what I should have been doing point in a hoe. Long story short, after that my sergeant was chewed out and officially reprimanded via some paperwork. His excuse had been he didn't want one of his men, obviously excluding me as such, to be hurt on a simple raid. I was more expendable. I hoped he felt stupid after Myko explained that he would have four grunts die for one optics tech due to how long we have to train and how specialized we are. After that, on off days, guys would help me out with tactics and stuff, so that I could perform in a fire team without being a risk to everyone around me. Point TLDR, I was asked to run point for a fire team, when I had next to no experience with infantry tactics. I work in a restaurant that specializes in barbecue, and I'm often working on the grill turning out steaks, ribs and what have you. So, this one time I was working on the grill during a pretty busy night, full tables a decent wait at the door, and I'm cranking out steaks like a metherfica, due to the promotion happening at the time. 
and of course the dumbness of these stakes run the gamut from still sort of moving blue to burn the fuck out of it well, as there is a wide variety of tastes for the dumbness of one stakes, and some of our customers are stupid. Well, this one lady ordered one of the latter types of steaks, but also requested we send out one of our digital scales with the aforementioned shoe leather, citing the fact that an 8 ounce steak should only lose 1, 1.3 ounces of water during the cooking process. I was quite taken aback as I had never heard of any such fact, nor did I believe that this customer could possibly be serious. She was. And when I sent out her overly well done steak, cooked exactly as she ordered it, with a digital scale for her weighing pleasures, I still didn't believe the manager was allowing this to happen. Well, you can guess what happened by this point I assume. The steak came out to a weight of 6.8 ounces, and she sent it back to be recooked, but properly this time. I then had to remake a very well done steak and weigh it periodically to ensure that it was no less than 7 ounces at the end of cooking. I definitely loved my job that night. I'm a manager at a startup commercial facility maintenance company. We subcontract multiple trades. Vac slash plumbing slash carpentry slash electrical slash roofing slash etc. To good, licensed contractors in the area and we simply mark up their prices. Well, the president is the lead sales force and he doesn't spend enough time selling. He's doing side projects like real estate and whatnot. So we have no steady clients. Instead, he has me signing up with management companies that do what we do, but for real estate owned, fanny me, HUD, houses. First problem, they have set pricing. Our subcontractors are already priced out. Second problem, they take 20% off our invoice, which means in order to make a buck, I have to use the cheapest possible, read, immigrant, contractors. Not just to make a buck, but so we don't piss away money. We have to supply all the materials, which are only obtainable from one supplier. Genius strategy. On top of that, they expect us to do a ton of stuff for free. So we keep eventually quitting these clients due to credit hold issues, and he keeps signing up with more of them despite the fact that all of them have the same business model, which is to screw the contractor now. Perhaps a pair of 18 year old kids with a van could do this work and make a profit, but our overhead and infrastructure prices us out point oh yeah, and my Brazilian contractor, he barely speaks English, can't read it, and can barely read Portuguese, which is his native language. He also can't properly operate a smartphone, can't figure out how to email or use drive or dropbox to get me my pictures in a timely fashion. It's horse sheet. Unfortunately the job market is pretty dry still, and I'm on a non-compete. I worked in a family owned swimming pool store. The store was a reconditioned old house. As such the only bathroom was upstairs. Well we got really busy in the spring and fall, in spurts, and of course busy all summer. One spring we were busy, and I couldn't keep track of who was in the bathroom. All of a sudden I saw an old man walk down the stairs clutching an armload of paper towels, and immediately ran out the front door of the building. His wife came inside, paid for the stuff he was going to buy, and they left. It was about 45 minutes later I was able to investigate, during which time no one asked to use the bathroom point. When I got up there, as soon as I got to the top of the stairs, the smell hit me. I forced my way forward, and opened the door. The bathroom looked like a 5 year old had painted it with finger paints. But it wasn't finger paints, it was sheet. The toilet seemed to kind of be the epicenter of it, but it was up on the walls, like waist high on the walls, smit, it was on the floor, it was on the sink, everywhere. I gagged, managed to not retch and ducked out. I headed downstairs to report it to the manager, I was the assistant manager, but my subordinate was off that day. She, being an older lady who got her nails done the day before told me that she had cleaned it last time, and it was my problem this time point, so I went out to the pool supply area and armed myself. I got her a breather type thing they used when they acid washed the pools. I put on rubber gloves under elbow length rubber industrial gloves. I hung bags of raw mint flavored leaves we used to keep mice out of heaters during the winter around my neck, a good dozen of them. I also shoved wads of Kleenex up my nose for good measure. I wrapped my feet in plastic bags and grabbed two rolls of paper towels it was not overkill, it was horrible. The paint was old and had been painted by hand over wallpaper, so the sheet had almost seeped into the walls. 
I had to scrap and muscle some of it off, taking a lot of paint with it. I sprayed stuff, I squirted stuff, I washed and soaked. For over an hour, and two trash bags full of paper towels and paper products, not to mention the ruined rolls of toilet paper, ruined magazines, ruined cloth towels, and other stuff we had to dispose of. Point the stench remained for a week. Point I promptly afterwards informed the owner of the company, above the manager, that if it ever happened again, I would quit before cleaning it up. That is not what I got paid for I never had to do it again, though it did happen again about 2 years later, different old person, different day, a subordinate won the honor of cleaning it point DLDR old people painted bathroom with sheet, I had to clean it up. It's a tie. Two stories, same job, one, had to come in on a weekend to do warehouse inventory. Not unreasonable, just a massive hassle, because it has to be done on the weekend, and sometimes takes all weekend point the problem was that when inventory went well, instead of letting people go home they asked a friend slash co-worker, and I to drive to Alabama, tear out carpet that has been ruined when the basement of our boss's house flooded, then shop vac, mop, etc. Until the area was dry point we got back. So late that everyone doing inventory had gone home, and the gate surrounding the warehouse had been closed and locked, with our cars inside point it should be pointed out that this particular job didn't do things like overtime pay point two. The owner of the warehouse decided to make some money by collecting these things called cores from a nearby plant, factory, and having us stop our normal jobs. In order to sift through the old cores to find usable ones. We would then give the usable cores back to the plant, and they wouldn't have to buy new ones. Problem is, that these boxes of old cores had been sitting around so long they had spiders living in them, as well as a lot of old trash, including several discarded razors used for bark scutters. So we had to dig through spiders and sheet, which created a lot of dust, which hurt people's eyes, and gave a few people breathing issues. So I asked for breathing masks and goggles, which management refused to do, until I made enough of a huff about it, that they very reluctantly gave us a few, making it very clear, that they thought we were being pussies at it. For clarification, we separated cause most days of the week for at least a month, possibly a bit longer. This was several years ago. I bartended in a hotel in college. We were 3 star, but the biggest and best located place in our small city, so we used to get most of the commuter traffic. A lot of guys who weren't anyone remotely important, but liked to act like they were, when they finally got the chance to get paid to travel somewhere. Point one night I was cleaning some glasses off a table near the TV, when a guy sitting at the table stopped me and asked me if he could get some cigarettes. I politely told him we didn't sell cigarettes at the bar, but there was a machine in the lobby, literally 20 feet away from him, not even a separate room, and you could see the machine from where we were standing, where he could get some any time, as long as he didn't smoke them in the bar or the lobby point the guy then handed me some money, and indicated that he expected me to go and buy his cigarettes from the machine for him, and bring them back to his seat, so he didn't have to stand up. When I told him that not only was I not allowed to leave the bar unattended, my colleague had briefly left during our conversation, but it wasn't in my job description to do that, and the hotel didn't provide those kinds of services, he then protested, told me again to go buy him some cigarettes, and attempted to hand me the money. I politely refused, and returned to the bar he then stood up, went to the reception desk, which was located a similar 20 to 30 feet away, right next to the cigarette machine, to complain to my manager about my behavior. My manager told him he would have to buy his cigarettes himself, and so he decided, rather than to walk the additional 5 to 10 feet to his right, to simply return to the bar, eyeball me for the rest of the night looking shifty, and never actually buy any cigarettes from the machine point I couldn't work out whether he was drunk or just a huge as whole, but it was incredibly demeaning in a strange way to have. Someone try to pay me to walk across a room and put money in a machine for them because they couldn't be bothered to leave their seat. Very glad I got out of that job. I worked for an NPO for close to 30 years, one dedicated to providing clean water to people in the United States who were affected by natural law and made disasters. 
We hired a new CEO a couple years ago, a woman who I'm pretty sure was only hired to appease her husband, he works in politics, and a lot of politicians' wives in my city have nominal titles with NPOs to pretend like they actually work. Now, this woman has been fine for the last couple years, letting us do our work without too much oversight, which is just fine for me. Then one day she comes in, sits me down, and tells me that, instead of doing what we've done for 20 years, providing water alongside the Red Cross, Salvation Army, etc., we are now going to be digging wells in Africa, something we've never done, and have no experience doing. Typical was because, wanting to help poor African children, so they can meet Bono instead of letting a charity, you know, actually making a difference. On top of that, she tells me that, in order to take this next step, I, as the office manager, am going to have to fire about half of our entire staff, people that have worked for us for decades, we are that small. I'm pissed, and I argue with her vehemently, but it doesn't matter. I spend the next three days winnowing down the names, and on Friday I sit in that same goddamn corner office and fire over a dozen of my best friends in the world point. After I do that, and I'm done crying, I meet with the CEO, and tell her it's done. Then she tells me, that I'm going to have to be let go, too, because I put up such a fuss about firing everyone as the week went on. She says, and I, roughly, quote, I can't have anyone working for me that I can't trust. Fuck. That beach. I hate Claire Underwood. I was a lifeguard at a country club pool in the south. This happened right after Hurricane Gustav hit my town in 2008. For the most part the damage wasn't terrible there, but there were a lot of leaves, pretty large branches, shingles, and just general debris was all over the place. The pool I worked at was filled with this sheet, which I wasn't aware of, cause I was at home still waiting for the power to come back on, until my boss called me. He wanted to know if any of us were in town to clean the pool. This might not sound particularly ridiculous, but by this time it's a few days after Gustav, and there's another hurricane in the gulf, Ike, expected to make landfall within 24 hours. Does he not watch the weather? Is anyone seriously going to be upset that the pool is dirty right now? Regardless, I go because I was young and dumb but my mom, smart, fortunately demanded that I was home by a certain time, no matter how far we had gotten. So for me, it would be this time where my boss had two teenage girls go into a 12 foot deep pool full of debris to where you can't even see the bottom with snorkels and nets to pick up the trash at the bottom while a hurricane was on its way. We got to quit after a few hours, because lightning had started. I didn't go back for a while, because it was after the main working season, but I have no doubts. Just as much crap as we took out found its way back into the pool. Ridiculous. In college, I worked a summer at the local family owned 7-Eleven. I'd worked at one in my hometown, and it was awesome, I was quick at everything, and the mom pop were very nice people. Not this family point on my first day, they had a guy they knew come in and put a flim flam on me, then accused me of stealing, before admitting what they had done. To test me point I was often stuck there till 12 to 1 am, 1 to 2 hours past my shift, to wait for the overpass guy, the oldest son. Whenever I complained I was consoled by the dad, verbally not creepily, and always paid for the overtime. I needed the money for my rent. So I stayed, even though I was getting a bad feeling about the whole family point the final straw came, when I had what I later learned, was my first migraine on the job, and when they kindly gave me aspirin, I felt even worse, and started shaking. A short time later, I sliced off the tip of my thumb in the meat slicer. You can't even tell now, so it wasn't the worst injury ever, but it bled a lot, and I was distressed over it. Guess what? The aspirin was actually no doz. The family was super caring then, drove me to the hospital, and assured me it would be taken care of point. After being at the air uh, half the night, the family called me repeatedly the next day demanding to know why I wasn't coming to work with a bandaged throbbing hand point I only worked there a few more weeks. My last night, I was stuck again, waiting, and this time I called the dad and said I'm through, I'm leaving. He kept me on the phone till the son got there to attempt to force me to stay. They were all psychos, for months after I kept getting bills from the hospital too. 
I sent them a letter about what happened, and finally they left me alone. Point oh my god, I'm sitting here, rereading all this. I can't believe that was my life at one time. I was young, and hadn't developed my nano to where it is now. At my last job my manager had a breakdown crying in the bathroom, because I took a 5 minute break, to make a phone call to make a nap to get my car inspected. She told me I wasn't allowed to take breaks. She hired me as an independent contractor with promise of being an employee and I worked nearly 50 hours a week in her office. Point she asked me to professionally photograph own 16 root beer bottles separately and then in sets for a client's website in my studio and was upset it took more than 2 hours and told me not to charge her for it because she thought it took too long. Also, I got fired because when she sent me an email with a list of bottles and order to be shot, she didn't include one of the sets, so I didn't shoot it. After that and telling me she didn't appreciate photography and she didn't see the value of having a professional photographer in a social media business because she could do the same thing with a cell phone, then wanting to cut my pay to 10 an hour and work a couple times a month. She emailed me about one of the clients, a four diamond hotel, wanted to use some of my photos for their website, I told her I'd love them on the website, but I'd have to charge the hotel a usage fee. She told me that was ridiculous, and that she was just letting me know that it would be great exposure for me, then called me unprofessional, and entirely cut off our business relationship. I'm a sound mixer for feature films, and I get asked to do unreasonable stuff all the time. Mostly stuff that is dangerous. A few highlights. Been asked to strap my car to the back of a process trailer, which is a trailer that you park a car on with space around it to film. Usually not a big deal, but this time we had no first AD. Guy who would be in charge of safety during this sort of thing usually. Going over the Mississippi River Bridge entirely too fast with bikers getting entirely too close to the back edge. Had a biker hit the back of the trailer and almost eat it. Told the director to stop the thing. Cause me and my cart were getting off point was asked to record on top of a moving elevator that was going to fall twice the speed it normally does. This was to save a 10 minutes it takes to prepare it for wireless audio transmission hard a boom op be asked to boom a scene on the ledge of a 13 story building. I said absolutely not point had a metal drum explosion not be rigged correctly and sent a flaming steel barrel 100 feet in the air and come down around 6 feet from my cart. I got pushed into a camera cart on that one, and cracked two ribs. I didn't get paid for that job until three months later. That was the same show as the bikers across the bridge point that's just a few. I don't know if you guys heard about the camera op who was recently killed on set, but from where I'm sitting I'm shocked it doesn't happen more often. Back in university, I worked part time at an indoor gun range as a cashier. It was an extremely small facility, and quite dirty, lead exposure was starting to become a concern for some of the full-time instructors. A few had blood tests, and the lead levels came back as dangerously high point an OSHA inspector showed up one day, demanding to see proof of the facility's lead removal and safety training program. The facility didn't have one, so the owner lied to the inspector and somehow convinced him to come back in a week. After the inspector left, the owner turned to me and demanded that I write up the required paperwork. I was working on my biology degree at the time and was familiar with some of the material he needed. He said he'd pay me an extra $50 if I did it at home. I refused. It was clearly illegal. He threatened me, stating everyone would lose their job if I didn't do it. Point a few days later, the owner came in with a folder of papers he clearly printed off the internet and a training form regarding lead exposure. He had every one sign and backdated to the day they were hired under threat of being fired. He also hired a contractor that is one of his neighbors with a shovel to handle the lead removal, meaning the business was not held responsible for providing any safety equipment. He cackled for months about getting around the dirty government regulations. A year or so later, I was let go when the owner married and his new wife took my job. The very next week, the range burned down in a fire, sparked from the excess gunpowder and lead bulled up. I'm still not sure if it was karma or a ploy to get insurance money. This was when I worked at Walmart. Of course, I was asked by this very loud electronics supervisor, I worked in the back room and she didn't have much authority to give me instructions, 
to pull a big screen TV down from the top of an 16 foot high shelf for a customer. The TV was on a pallet with other big screens TVs on and around it. At the time the back room was very busy unloading a truck and there was little space to move. The top shelf was intended to be loaded and unloaded by a power lifter and this minor supervisor insisted I grab it by hand because the power lifter had no space to maneuver. The tallest ladder we had was 12 feet point I'm 5 minutes and 10 seconds, but I very obviously would have had to stretch dangerously to get the TV. I gained a very healthy respect for safety from my time in the army and watching Walmart screw people over who hurt themselves on the job. I looked at the TV, looked at the power tripper, barked a laugh, and told her that there was no way I was going to do something so dangerous and stupid. She was used to most associates jumping at her word because she was very aggressive and tried to tell me that I had to and to do it for the customer. I just calmly told her no and pointed out that what she was asking me to do something unsafe and thus illegal point her own haranguing, shrewish screeches were drawing attention after a minute or so of this, so I just had to raise my voice a bit and repeat that this was illegal, unsafe, and unnecessary and that OSHA might have a few words to say about this as well. I turned around and continued with my job. She left but came back a few moments later and bullied someone else to do it. Luckily, no one was hurt, but the guy who went up was pretty scared. I made sure he knew that, if he got hurt, that Walmart would not care past the point of the barest legal culpability, and that a fall like that would likely have paralyzed him. Point the plus side is that she never tried to give me stupidly dangerous or dangerously stupid instructions again. I worked on a maintenance team back in high school. Overall I did learn a lot. We changed light bulbs and busted ballasts, painted, set up air conditioners for the dorms, on the second floor, from the outside of the window using a forklift, mowed grass, steep hills were done, by attaching a rope to the mower and wiring the handle down, so you could lower it down the hill then pull it back up, treated water, the school had its own small treatment plant. Sold oranges, installed insulation, in an attic, made your budgers black, and buried bodies of rabid animals. Guess I didn't bury it deep enough, because the next day something had dug it up, and I have a few really unreasonable requests which, in hindsight, were really dumb to do. But I was a kid, and didn't realize that the law was on my side point this specific examples comes to mind. One of the buildings on campus had large wooden pillars that were pretty old. My boss had noticed that they were getting sort of rotten, so he decided that we needed to replace them. This was a long process because we had to do a few things, put a placer holder beam in by lifting it with a jack point cut off the portion of the pillar that was rotten, about 3 feet from the bottom, sand off the paint and repaint the beam, build a cinder block and brick square thing for the pillar to set on. Now that the pillar was 3 feet shorter place the old pillar back and remove the placer holder. So the fourth step was the part that was unreasonable. I was asked to cut cinder blocks to size using a skill saw. No problem. Except that cinder block dust was getting in your lungs, and you need to cut enough for eight pillars, and no fassa mask was provided. I ended up coughing a lot, and asked the boss for some sort of fassa mask. He didn't have one, so I offered to bring my own the next day, but I'm not getting more of this sheet in my lungs. He was quiet for a minute then angrily told me to just go home. I don't want cinder block lungs, fact me right. Working at a Tex-Mex. Dirty places. Cockroaches under food crates. No contract. Paid by the hour. That day, water leaked from under the dishwasher machine point I was the newest guy and everyone looked at me and told me it's your turn. They asked me to open a trapdoor under the sink, where the dishes are washed point, when the trapdoor was opened. Well. The horror. Where I was supposed to see dirty water flowing through, there was a faking mass of organic dirt. Small insect flying around a pile of organic leftovers. This sheet hasn't been cleaned for ages. It was red, yellow, green. It had the faking Mexican flags color on it. When I tried to touch it with my foot, the sheet was solid in some parts in ecosystem point, and I'm not talking about the smell. Some things can't be described, because they can't be compared. Anyway, I put my arm to the shoulder in there, to remove pitch black goo, that was blocking water from flowing under the organic mass on the surface. When my arm touched something, at this point I thought it can be a corpse or some sheet. 
No, it was a grid from the nearby fridge. They used a grid as a filter. This is so ineffective and stupid I lack words TLDR. I had to remove black goo from a dirt mass of organic leftover with the color of the Mexican flag on it, when it was supposed to be dirt water from the dishwasher. Obligatory this didn't happen to me, but a buddy of mine told me this. Actually it was my main tank and guild leader in WoW, and he would tell this story to the newbies, and whenever we down at a hard boss as a reward. It is called, the cucumber story, the mound was an overpass stocking manager, while in college for a major grocery store in Florida. One night he's got a new guy on the crew, and he hasn't been stocking his aisle, boxes are still full, and the guy's nowhere to be found. His car is still in the parking lot, so the mount asks around, calls a guy on the intercom, has the rest of the stock crew do a scavenger hunt, still no guy. Finally hours later the guy comes waddling up to my mount, and asks him, I need to go home. My mount says where the fuck have you been, I out fire you. The guy repeats, I need to go home, my asshole, is bleeding to which my mount responds something along the lines of alright, have a nice night, after. The guy leaves the crew is still wondering what happened, so they finally check the women's bathroom to which they find on the floor a pool of blood surrounding a cucumber with a condom on it. Everyone is in disbelief, they go through the 12 stages of grief, and finally my mound realizes someone needs to clean this up before the store opens at 6am. He goes to his best stoker and offers to let him go home early and not come in the next, but still get paid, and the guy says fuck you, far me. He goes down the line through the crew, all of them say fuck no. Mount is freaking out, thinking he's going to have to clean this, when he hears a tapping on the front door of the store. It's the janitor for the store, an elderly Chinese man who spoke little to no English point my friend opens the door, Han, women's bathroom, clean up, KK. My story isn't anything fancy or exciting. But I think a lot of people can relate to shitty managers worked at one of the popular office supply stores. I've never been surrounded by worse people in my life. There was a general manager, did nothing in his office in the back, a manager for each section of the store, technology, furniture, supplies, etc., which didn't do anything, mods, manager on duty, which were low-level supervisors who delegated work and performed some tasks, then the peons who did everything. One day, after a couple months of putting up with the hierarchy and being one of the only people to do any work, despite being the lowest pay tier, I was getting really swamped with work in the copy and print section. Got to a point where I had 4 to 5 big jobs lined up that needed to get done, and there were 3 new customers lined up waiting to consult about new projects one of the customers was trying to ship something out through our shipping service. Because I was backed up with customers, I had to make her wait. One of the managers on duty walked over, obviously with nothing to do, and sat at the nearby computer to check her email, or whatever. I asked if she could help the customer with shipping point what she said was the final straw for me. You need to learn how to multitask. She walked away shortly after. The customer even said did she just refuse to help me? I was finished at that point, and just said yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know what to tell ya, I... Went out for lunch one day, and didn't go back in. I did go in to grab my check. Boy was that awkward. In the early 90s I was the network telecom admin for a medium sized private company that made tons of money, but had very little intellectual property. The owners became increasingly paranoid about their sales people leaving and taking all of their contacts with them. Initially, I was asked to do a fair amount of forensic type work, and I was successful in proving that a couple people were stealing from the company. Then it escalated to the point that the owners wanted me to enable them to eavesdrop on the emails and phone calls of the employees. That was where I drew the line, because at that time it was illegal. A couple weeks later I had a vacation, and upon returning I did what I would normally do, check the logs on the phone system and network. I discovered that they hired the phone system vendor to enable all of the functions that I refused to do. I played stupid until I decided to resign from the company. Their standard exit interview was with the COO and he would threaten everybody about non-competes and similar sheet. They had a track record of suing anyone who even appeared to breach the agreements. As he was handing me the paperwork I was required to sign to get my last paycheck, he started to make thinly veiled threats. 
that was when I made threats of my own. I let him know that I knew exactly what they had been doing, that it was illegal, and that I had plenty of physical proof of their wrongdoing. I refused to sign his bullshit documents and let him know that they needed to leave me alone. I was going to do work for whomever I wanted to, including their competitors. I was one of the few that did not get sued. First, you'll need a little backstory. My boss tends to be very unprofessional, and she lets me in on a bunch of personal drama I honestly couldn't care less to hear about. One of these conversations led to us discussing her daughter's marriage and her disapproval of her husband. Now from what I gathered, the only reason she didn't like him was because he's black, deep south here, god help me. So the daughter has forcibly estranged herself from her mother, likely to keep her batshit craziness from rubbing off on her son. However, my boss desperately misses her grandson and does everything she can to see him, even against her daughter's will or knowledge point so one day I'm working and she walks in and asks me if I'd be willing to give her a ride somewhere. This is a first, so I'm confused, but I oblige and off we go. On the way she begins telling me that it's her grandson's birthday and she wants to give him a gift, but she has no way of actually getting it to him and she needs my help. Now looking back on this, I should have definitely shut things down right here as this is a ludicrous request of me, and I don't want anything to do with it. But I didn't, and figured the sooner I get it over with the better she directs me to the child's school, which is currently in session. All the while, she's scooting lower and lower in her seat the closer we get to the school. Just acting incredibly sketchy slash nervous. So I pull into the parking lot, and she instructs me to park far away from the entrance, and behind another car, so she won't be seen. She hands me a brown paper bag with the kid's name on it, and asks me to simply drop it on the stairs in front of the main entrance. I'm hesitant to do so, because of how faking crazy the nature of the request is, but whatever I'm already in too deep. I take the bag, drop it off, walk back to the car, and leave point TLDR. Boss got me to drive to her grandson's school and drop off a birthday present for him on the steps, because she's not allowed to see him due to her racist tendencies since then, I've learned how to dodge conversations and altogether shut down any type of personal request like this. I've got a bunch of other crazy stories about her though. I used to work at a small indoor amusement park, like Chuck E. Cheese, but not it was a Sunday, and the night shift was from 4.30 to 9. Company policy was that, if an employee worked at least 5 hours, they get a break meaning that Sunday night workers never got a break, because it was only a 4 and 1 half hour shift, whatever not a big deal however this. One particular Sunday, we hadn't gotten the building cleared out, until about 9.20. The end of every night consisted of each employee cleaning their station, and then a group of all the employees would check each station one by one. Not having started the group check until about 9.25, I brought it up to the supervisor over watching us that we will be working past the 5 hour mark, and then should be able to go home with an extra 30 minutes on our hour stub. Paid 30 minute break, I wasn't too serious being that the supervisor and myself were friends. But that didn't stop him from coming up with a solution all 13 of us were to clock out in less than 2 minutes and be back at the first station ready to work. I laughed my eyes off in his face he looked at me like he was serious. I could barely handle all the facts I didn't give I punched out grabbed my coat and was on my way out he threatened me with my job and I laughed again while walking out. The job was practically slave labor anyway. When he brought up my insubordination to a real manager, he got suspended for a month for making the others work without pay I never heard another word of it. I used to work at a place where the boss was a literal psychopath. He would spend one afternoon running around the office treating it like a playground, the next he would fire someone for being on Facebook during their lunch hour one day he asked me to serenade the overweight black girl in the office because I was a good white boy and I could raise her out of the ghetto. I would do these horrible raps to take the attention off of her, and afterwards I would go to her and tell her that I was only doing it to try and defuse him and asked if it bothered her. She smiled and said it was okay. From then on I would usually redirect his psychopathy towards me instead of her he would frequently screw with interviewees. One time he made me go into the boardroom where the interview was being held with a tray and two periers on it. I was to place the trays on the table, pour them, and then pretend to take their order. 
not too bad, until he refused to hire the girl, because she was fat point he also used to call me gay and a virgin, which if you spend some time on the internets, doesn't bother you at all. But then he realized my weakness was confidence in my work, so he squeezed that until I wanted to quit, but I didn't I kept going cause I knew I was better than him as a person. Well he saw I wasn't going to break, so he fired one day before my 3 months I opened a human rights claim against him for all the abusive things he would do to us, but unfortunately when you try to fight a bullshitter in a bullshit fight, you're going to lose. He basically just turned around in his rebuttal and said that I had been the one to do all the things I had accused of. This is about where I realized I was wasting my time so in my response I offered to withdraw my claims. If they withdrew this, if you don't deny the accusations the tribunal assumes they are true. Moral of the story, if you work for an asshole, quit and find something else. It will only end with you being miserable. I'm a special ed teacher in Los Angeles, not LAUSD. My credential is early childhood special education, which is pre-K and infant slash toddler the district was putting kindergartners and first graders in my class. I was a new teacher, so I figured it was just part of the deal. After two years of teaching, the principal called me into the office and said, Hey, you have kindergartners and first graders in your class, did you know your credential doesn't cover that? End result, the parents of those kids got letters sent home that their teacher, me, was not highly qualified under no child left behind, and if they wanted their kids moved to another class they could request it. If they didn't mind, they signed a waiver and the kids could stay. Since I have a great rapport with the families I work with, they didn't mind. However I called ours and asked politely for them to not send any more kids to my class that my credential doesn't cover. I politely pointed out that it isn't me that places students in my classroom, so didn't want this letter to have to go home to new families informing them that I wasn't qualified. But the lesson was that I have to watch everything even more closely than I thought because it really is up to me to cover my ass. Admin is going to do what they want and blame me when they screw up point the magic word is waiver. There is a teacher at my school with no credential at all, but actually just an assistant, who was grandfathered and long ago in a situation where a teacher was needed immediately. He's been here for a long time, and all of his students get the waiver sent home. Most parents don't mind point yay, it's pretty screwed up in public schools, but the actual reasons are quite different from the popular ones you see on TV and in Bill Gates editorials. Everyone is in sire mode, everyone is overloaded, and you have to keep your head down or anything and everything will be blamed on you. Stay off the radar back to the topic, I have a student who now has behavior support, that is an extra person in the classroom with the necessary training. It took me a year and a half of emails and in-person requests to admin and the school psychologist to get the help. Meanwhile, this student was a clear danger to himself and others. I had videos on my phone of him destroying the classroom and basically rampaging for up to 20 minutes at a time. My staff and I all went to occupational health several times for serious bites, and the other students got bitten, and otherwise attacked as well. I'm trained to handle this situation, but my assistants are not. I'm lucky if they have a grandchild, much less trained in child development and much less trained in special ed. With 11 other students in the class, I couldn't always be on top of him. Luckily now I have the extra help, and E. Dufresne finally got his library books this is the tip of the iceberg. I didn't realize I was going to post this long. Maybe someday I'll make a full story. It's nuts. TLDR, I was asked by the owner of my company to transcribe the secretly recorded conversations he had with his wife who probably could have been admitted to an inpatient mental health facility against her own wishes the owner of my company came to me and asked me to transcribe some recordings and handed me a personal recorder. I said sure and got to it 5 hours later, I had heard every phone conversation and a few in person conversations that he and his wife had over the last few months his wife was threatening to divorce him for cheating on her with a fellow employee of mine. My associate was very attractive and had been hired by our hour manager, another woman that was apparently too unattractive to threaten the owner's wife, the owner's wife explicitly told him this, my associate had a great husband and wasn't the promiscuous type, anyway, even then, there was no time for them to have done anything at work, 
she got word of the implications and promptly quit without finding another job first because the idea put her off so badly. In the recordings, were the incredibly paranoid and outlandish accusations by his wife. If he took longer than 15 minutes to get home, he was cheating. If he got a call from my associate, he was cheating. If he didn't seem excited that day, he was cheating. Apparently the owner was on the phone when my associate asked the owner where the toilet plunger was, which the owner's wife assumed was some sort of code for let's fact point I also got to hear a conversation about how groceries needed to be purchased. All food from one food group, for instance vegetables, fruits, meats, grains, dairy, etc. had to be picked up on one trip. He was to go to the store, buy a food group, bring them home put them away, then go back for the next group. After he had wiped down the trunk with Clorox wipes I later found out that their kids teachers had become alarmed due to the kids coming in with rashes on their faces from regularly having their faces cleaned with Clorox wipes. She apparently had a QVC shopping habit that was costing hundreds of dollars a day and when she was on a QVC binge, she told the kids that she was working and would completely ignore them to the point where their 4 year old broke their arm trying to climb up onto the counter to get into a cabinet. No food was kept in lower shelves because it could become contaminated there were some tax issues discussed as well and he discussed how she made $90k as an employee of the company, but after 6 years of working there, had never seen her on the grounds and I know for a fact she did nothing remotely. He also talked about laying off two of his employees 5 years earlier and having them collect unemployment while they still worked. He then paid them the difference months later, the company is seasonal, so he was able to pay them less in the off season. This part was really odd because it had nothing to do with her. I think he may have been lying to bait a response from his wife, but I'll never know for sure because he fired those two people and sued them for breaking their non-compete. It was creepy how little she seemed to care about any of those issues to this day. I have no idea why this was asked of me, specifically. I know that he was expecting a divorce and I know that money was being moved into shell companies with the kids names in some kind of attempt to keep her from getting to liquid assets. What I don't know is why having me transcribe the audio helped anything, because he had an attorney on retainer that could have had it done in an admissible way. They're still together, and since I left, he became a state representative. I've heard through the grapevine that he's going to run for a position in the US House. With the little bit that I know, he'd be a gold mine for a reporter trying to break a story. I can't imagine what you'd find if you dug deeper I still have no idea why he involved me. He's not a dumb guy. There had to be a reason. I worked in retail, and one day a manager who I had refused to go out with was working with me. Much to my despair, he made me day a living hell. We had just had our floors waxed the night before, and he had noticed that some wax had sprayed up on the very bottom of the aisles, usually hidden by shelves and no one effing notices that part, unless they are a psycho. He decided that it was now my job for the day to somehow get that wax off of every aisle in the entire store. I had to, in high business hours, mind you, get on my hands and knees and scrape all the wax off the bottom of every aisle. I came to find that it was not just a collection of last night's wax job but all the wax jobs that have occurred in the entire existence of the store. I had to scrub with steel wool, noni pads, the snicker of teenage boys and the concerned stares of senior citizens for an entire 10 hour shift. Every time this boss passed by me, he made a comment about how comfortable I look on my knees and how being that low to the ground fits me. My hands were bloody at the end of the day. It was the worst day of my working life. He laughed at me constantly and said it was my head manager who was feeding him these tasks, which is a load of BS. I should have reported him. Whatever. He had a hand in getting me fired a few months later. Best thing that ever happened to me. DL. Doctor manager had me on my knees all day. Hands bloodied. Okay, so I used to be a manager at Coles. I dealt with a lot of pretty shitty people, but could always manage to get them to leave relatively happy. So much so that there were repeat problem customers that the other managers would send my way because I was the only one who could deal with them. Point I had just one customer I could absolutely not make happy point. So it's a day like any other day. Relatively busy, understaffed. 
I haven't clocked in yet and I hear the paging system from the home department, which is where a customer pushes a button to request help in that area. It goes off until an associate resets it. Well, I hear it go off twice, then stop, so whatever I clock in and almost immediately hear the home depth pager go off again, just a few times, then it's reset. Okay, still no big deal. Obviously just a lot of customers over there. It's being reset, so it's being taken care of, right? I start my walk around the store and I get to the home department. This woman rushes up to me demanding that I assist her because everyone is ignoring her. She says she's pushed the assistance request button multiple times and no one will help her. I apologize and ask what she needs help with and she says she wants the manager. I tell her that I'm the manager on duty and she just scoffs and tells me you're not the manager. I know the manager and her name is woman's name who quit months ago. I explain that there are several managers, that that woman no longer works here, and I'm the only manager in the building, and she has my undivided attention. Finally she very angrily stomps over to a coffee pot on display and says, that's what I want. I scan the barcode on the display, to see how many we have in stock, and it says one. The display, of faking course point I, still smiling, explain that the display is the only one left, but that I can see it to her for 15% off, the standard reduction for displays. She is absolutely fuming, like I just told her she was a moron or something. I say, okay, well let me see, if I can order one. Give me just a moment. I check our online website, and wouldn't you know it, this coffee pot has been discontinued. I explain this to her, and say I can sell her the display for 20% off, and she flips her lid. We had these small buggies and she straight up picks it up, and throws it across the aisle, and knocks it over I found it easier to think of bad customers like children who were having a tantrum, so I just ignored her bad behavior, and go over the information with her again. I explain that this coffee pot is no longer made by the company and we only have the display in stock. I tell her, if there is another coffee pot she likes, I can price match, or discount it 20%, if it is already lower than the display one. I even offered to help her compare coffee pots, so we could find one similar to the one she originally wanted. Point at this point the woman starts to storm away, kicking her fallen buggy along the way. Then suddenly she turns abruptly, runs over to me, and screams what is your name? I start to tell her, and she very angrily reaches for my lanyard and tries to rip it off me, finally just twisting it around until she sees my name tag. Then she screams at me, I hope you've enjoyed having a job, because you're not going to when I get done, and stomps out of the store point the whole time I had kept my cool, so after just standing there for a few minutes, flabbergasted and speechless, I made my way back to the stockroom, let the doors close behind me, and just cried. Then I collected myself, and wrote out a report, and submitted it to my manager, the store manager head honcho manager, who submitted it to corporate. Clearly I had done nothing wrong, so this way, when the crazy lady called in they would already know my side of the story.0, oh, and I wanted to know, why she thought she was being ignored, so I did some research. There are a lot of cameras in the store. She was pushing the help button, then immediately walking back deep into the aisles where no one could see her. Every time someone would come, reset the button, walk around a bit, and then leave because there was apparently no one who needed help. Point TLDR, a woman forgot to take her meds and wanted me to pull a new coffee machine out of my ass. My boss asked me to take a cardboard box out to the dumpster this dumpster was used by two nearby restaurants. Its foul stench permeated the air from upwards of 15 feet away. Stains of an indescribable nature were crusted onto the sides and ground around it, and a cloud of flies stood guard over its contents, like gargoyles on a rooftop. I was instructed not to let our garbage cans touch the walls of it when taking out the trash, lest the smell linger in the container from that brief contact. I pitched the box into the thing from a reasonably close distance, and returned to work. Several minutes later, my boss realized that she was missing a small statue. She is an older lady and her son, who also works there, suggests that the statue might have been in the box I threw away. He asked me to go get it from the dumpster. 
His mom seconded the request point after clarifying with them that they wanted me to go digging around in the dumpster to find the statue. Just in case I misheard them, I slowly walked out towards the dumpster. A garbage truck rumbled around the corner, driven by the god of well-timed garbage trucks, and I returned triumphantly to declare that the box was gone. The statue was gone. My boss hobbled out to the dumpster to check if the dumpster had really been emptied and returned looking slightly wilted, perhaps a little ashamed for suspecting me of exaggeration. It was a good day. Yes I'll take unethical business stories for $500 Alex, so I worked at this retardedly popular bowling alley for a while. Super eclectic clientele. I was hired to work front desk and that evolved into running everything that isn't the bar or kitchen for $8 slash HR. This included, but was not limited to, the following, being told to fire other employees due to management faking up their schedules. The girl I primarily worked with was out for 5 days for Christmas. Saw the request she made personally. Management scheduled her for a day she was in Texas. I was told to call her and fire her for not showing up on her vacation day point being called a worthless bussy for refusing to fire my co-workers. By two managers being publicly berated by your drunken manager when you won't sell a lane at 1.59 am. The lanes have already been waxed and closed. That's not happening and our policy was no lane sales after midnight. Being asked to sit in on interviews with new hires because they wanted my input on where the new girl was on a scale of 1 to 10 point having my fee and K. Now my wife being told by the manager that she was far too attractive to be with me and then proceeding to lay it on thick. That was a good one point the final straw was being told in the owner's wonderful shouting voice. At a full employee meeting that their 3 star Yelp review was solely my fault. I ran those goddamned lanes like a finely tuned machine, but you can't help a 2 slash hours wait when you only have 14 lanes and the entire 20 something population wants to bowl. Not to mention I had only been working there for 4 months. I was let go shortly after that meeting after a co-worker told management I wasn't pleased with the blame. My friends, who bowled regularly, are all given different reasons as to why I was fired. From he cussed out a customer nope, never did, and it was common for me to get home with at least $50 in tips from working front desk, to he was giving away lanes and making the queues longer nope, friends got no preferential treatment. Hence why all the leaguers are at the bar drunk instead of bowling. Owner's word in the neighborhood essentially blacklisted me from working anywhere near my home point fun times. Was an assistant manager at a retail store. I was with a customer when I realized lunch had completely its journey and was ready for disembarkation. Now, I finish up with the customer as quickly as possible and head up to the restrooms. Now I'm in full on walking funny mode at this point when I enter the restroom. The smell is so wretched, just opening the door, that I have to back out. I pace around the break room for a few minutes hoping the thick fecal fog will pass and hurry back to the bathroom. If anything, the smell is worse. I may actually be in danger of a ruptured colon at this point, so I take a deep breath from outside and head for the stall. There isn't much that could stop me from doing what has to be done. However, as soon as I open the stall door I see a sight that will haunt me for all time sheet smeared everywhere on the walls, on the toilet, everywhere. I only have a moment to fully take it all in. On the floor right in front of the toilet is a gigantic inhuman pile of sheet. But, but, okay someone was upset and this was their passive aggressive revenge. Then I realize there is clearly a chunk missing, where this person used their hand to grab a chunk of their own sheet in order to smear on every wall in reach. Then to complete the insanity, they used their own fesses smeared hand to write fat computer on the wall. I realized at this point that I'm moments from puking, and if I puke in my current state it is inevitably coming out both ends, and I will of course end up blamed somehow for this atrocity. I muster up every bit of willpower, bear down as hard as I can, and take off for the burrito joint next door as quickly as I can. Not running mind you, that is impossible, more like a brisk waddle. On my way past the manager on duty, also my best friend at the time, I yell someone smeared sheet all over the bathroom. And before he can respond I'm out the door I get back a few minutes later, and 10 pounds later, to quite the sight. Here is my buddy, the sales manager, standing outside the restroom's hands on his knees heaving. In between gags he is trying to convince the maintenance guy to clean it up. 
The maintenance guy isn't stupid, he's not getting paid nearly enough to even look at that, let alone clean it. No one can really blame the guy. My buddy at this point looks at me, and I go no way, I will hand in my resignation right now, and I'm the best sales guy you have. There is no way he's going to be able to do anything about it, he's still heaving from just a moment in there, he just doesn't have the stomach for it. He does the only thing he can do, he goes to the only guy higher up than him currently in the building, the regional loss prevention manager, and says there is a biohazard in the men's restroom. No one here will clean it, they have all threatened to quit, rather than get near it. I'm going home now, if you don't want me to come back you let me know, but I can't wait to explain this one to the unemployment people. Then he walks out point we all just stood there, and watched the poor regional LP manager walk past us, and into the restroom. Head held high, trying to convince himself it can't be that bad, he's going to handle this, and make us all feel silly. The moment he opens the door he yells out oh dear god, but he goes in anyway. He cleaned it up, by himself. From that point forward no one ever messed with that guy again. He had literally seen some sheet. Not sure if this is on the same level as the rest, but my entire experience at my last job was full of the most absurd demands and expectations. I worked for a nanny placement agency in the office, not as a nanny. Some background, it's a really small operation and it's owned by a woman and her husband, technically, who are Jehovah's Witnesses. She worked in the office, he didn't point she would constantly have me do things for her personal Facebook page, like editing the privacy settings, changing her pictures, basically help her stalk people, etc. Point she once asked me to proofread an email she was sending to a man she cheated on her husband with, at work. I declined to help further after reading it, and realizing what it was, I had to watch at least one of her five children on multiple occasions, while at work, with no additional pay. Again, I'm not a nanny, at that point I had no experience with watching kids we had to wear a uniform. Not just like a polo shirt with the business name on it, this, and it was a different color every day. It was an actual on Wednesdays we wear pink scenario. I got in trouble for wearing light blue on the day I should have worn dark blue. I could never get the schedule down. I personally refused, but there were a few girls who got roped into Bible study with her. Plus, she would hand out these insanely thick booklets to all of us and expect us to talk with her about them. Point we were never allowed to eat in the office, but she would. Sometimes on my desk. So even on the worst winter or summer days we'd be forced to go out to lunch every day or eat in our cars. Also she had me get a McDonald's practically every day point I had to wrap a ton of presents for her children. They have one big celebration for school or something in lieu of birthday slash Christmas or something. One time she gave us a fashion show of the clothing she'd be wearing on her upcoming vacation. She made us give feedback. Just try to imagine a 40 year old woman trying on prom dresses meant for 16 year olds. Bright pink purple, etc. There were bikini bathing suits involved. It was not good. This all happened during office hours and I wasn't allowed to answer the phone during the whole ordeal point that's all I can really remember that relates to this, but it was awful. That entire business is a reality show producer's wet dream. Oh man, I used to work at a small family owned Italian restaurant that yielded so many good stories that my buddies and I though about writing a book point as anyone who's worked a small business knows, you may not have to deal with corporate bullshit, but at the same time you can get asked to do some shitty jobs and have no higher ups to complain to. I was still in high school, and I was the dish beach, meaning that on slow nights I could be given almost any sheety task and be expected to do it. The restaurant had recently built a detached patio area with lighting, but with typical lack of planning, had not run cabling out there to be able to power the lights. So the manager slash owner sent me out into the parking lot, armed with a chisel and a hammer, and instructed me to dig a 1 inch trench in the fresh asphalt, across 20 feet of parking lot, so that they could lay down the cable and the cover it over with more asphalt. So there I was, in my kitchen scrubs, kneeling in the parking lot, occasionally scrambling out of the way of cars, while the owner, accompanied by whatever rich businessmen customers he was currently sucking up to, stood there watching me, smoking and drinking brandy, and treating me to gems like hey kid, I don't know how much you're making for this, but I'll pay you double, to come dig trenches in my driveway. Smug bastards. 
My first job was at Wendy's, despite my resolution to never work fast food, and my boss was an absolute horror. She was sheltering an illegal immigrant from somewhere near the Ukraine. In the restaurant. Her other managers were the kind of people who would clock in, run to the liquor store, and spend the day drinking in the manager's office. This story isn't about them though, it's about a customer one family in particular was fairly regular, they spoke mostly Spanish, and they would come in, at least, every Wednesday night with their son, looking like he was coming home from junior baseball practice or something. They would typically order the same things, burgers, not exactly complex, but somehow they managed to have some kind of issue every time. One night it would be too much mustard and the next it would be not enough, or the father slash husband would decide that, even though he said no onions, he didn't get enough. Even though I wasn't the one making the food, he always seemed aggravated about how stupid I was my favorite unreasonable request was, when they came in one evening, and after getting their meal and sitting in, the dad comes up, and says his order is totally wrong. He's getting pretty steamed up at this point and starts explaining to me exactly what he ordered, ingredient by ingredient, and that he ordered what his son got, and his son got what he ordered. Think about that for a second, I did too. I paused to see if it would hit him too, no luck. I slowly reached out and picked up his burger and his son's burger from where he placed them on the counter, and I slowly switched them while he watched. I saw it in his eyes that he finally understood, but he looked up at me again, visibly frustrated point they still got new burgers. I was once ordered to drive a 15,000 ton warship to within 100 yards alongside of another 10,000 ton ship in order to take on fuel that we didn't need so the captain wouldn't have to submit a report that we'd gone below 85% fuel on board. This was during a rain squall with high winds and rough seas complete with heavy fog that limited visibility to about 100 yards despite my misgivings and only a collision, we did it and got alongside to start the refueling. But as soon as we were about to huck up the refueling lines, a ship lost primary steering control and, luckily, veered away from the tanker to safety. We couldn't regain primary steering control, so we had to shift back to emergency steering at the aft of the ship, where the person steering the ship has no way whatsoever of seeing outside point now, that's not the most unreasonable part. That comes next points despite the storm, low visibility, utter needlessness of the operation, and the fact that we are now driving with a delay via sound powered phone lines, and had already nearly collided once and waved off, the captain made a brilliant decision. We were going to try to make the approach again and still take fuel points so we tried. And I white knuckled the railing the whole time, sure that my nascent naval career was about to go down with a loud crunch and a lot of screeching. Luckily, after about an hour of unsuccessfully trying to get alongside, the master of the oiler came to his senses and decided the whole thing was too risky and called it off. Used to work at an electronics store in the cell phone department. One guy came in wanting a new iPhone, of course, so I asked him what kind of plan he'd like to put it on etc etc. He goes on to tell me that he wants as much data as he can get, unlimited talk plus text, long distance, all the good stuff. Then he goes on to tell me he doesn't want to pay any more than $20 a month. I tell him he's going to be looking at at least $80 bucks a month for everything he wanted, and the best he can hope for at the $20 level is maybe unlimited text and 500 megabytes. So he flies off the handle proceeding to tell me that I don't know who the fuck he is, and that he's been a loyal customer for however long, I'd never seen this guy in the store before in my life, and how he was in tight with Frank the CEO, I call bullshit. So I apologized and started entering in his information knowing exactly what was going to come up on the screen. I'm sorry sir, it looks like the computer doesn't know who you are either. Surely it wouldn't try to put a credit limit on the account of someone with your stature. But it seems to think that you're just some nobody with shitty credit. Maybe if you put in that call to our CEO he can sort this out for you. And when you call him, ask for George. That must be his coded name for anyone who isn't close enough know him as Frank, guy. Turned red and started shaking as he walked out. I went back to browsing Reddit. I work for a recruiting firm point my manager recently acquired this new client that he really wants to impress. 
Now, we normally only recruit for full-time permanent positions, but this client wanted contractors, which would be something new for us. That's all well and good, except we've had to build a network of contractors from scratch. We have been lucky enough thus far to find some good people for them. Point is a problem. It seems as if every new order we receive from this client has less information attached to it. For example, I may be aware that I'm looking for, say, a senior project manager with 10 years of relevant experience in mining projects and a peeing in Saskatchewan. I have no idea what project it's for, what the shift rotation is, specifically how long the contract will be, or really, anything. Unfortunately it is not our client's fault, their client who isn't providing any information to them to relate to us. In essence, our client can't tell us what we need to know to sell this position point here's the other problem. My boss wants to impress them so much that he's had us pretty much drop everything else and focus on that. We haven't been able to make many placements elsewhere lately as a result point I suggested to my boss today that we spend less time on the orders given to us from this particular client because he's had us focus about 75% of our time on that lately and we are spinning our wheels. I didn't say let's stop recruiting for them, I just asked him if he could either request some more information from them, which he did, and got none, or that we could possibly re-evaluate our priorities he got angry at me for potentially threatening the relationship between the client and our company for suggesting this. So, yes. Spent the rest of the afternoon calling people to see if they'd be interested in an opportunity I couldn't describe, sounding like a moron. Don't get me wrong. I like my boss as a person. I don't like him as a manager, though, if that makes sense. I realize he's run the business for 8 years now, but a good manager should be open to hearing feedback from his employees, particularly if an employee is trying to draw his attention to something that may potentially hurt the company. TLDR. Boss wants to impress client. I need to pull magic contractors out of Myers edit. Words. About 20 years ago, a guy who donated a massive amount of money to the library where I now work asked the curator, boss figure, to look over a definitive history of railroading in the US that he wrote. The old curator accepted, but not because the donor was good at writing, had a unique perspective on the industry, or was even competently knowledgeable. The old curator accepted, because he knew he could get the donor, to give more no strings attached money to the library, if he said yes. Fast forward to present minus 6 months. The current curator of my library was going through all the stuff the old curator had on his to-do list when he was fired for being a general scumbag. On that list was, sort s book. He finds this thing, and he sees that no two pages are in order. He also notices that the first three pages he looks at are outright plagiarized. Point my official job description is to scan stuff so that we can have a digital copy to send people. The current curator asks me one day if I can do a special project, and I ask him to tell me what's up before I agree to anything. He shows me the three foot cubed boxes of paper and tells me the story. He asks me to simply put the pages in order I took the job at the library to learn about the history that I was handling, so I started asking some questions. I find out that the author was a spoiled brat who had no idea what he was doing and that he had since died. As my boss is explaining all this to me, he pauses and says, actually, this is pointless. Let's not do this. Worked as a computer repair specialist at a local mompop computer store for a few years. Owners turned out to be completely self-centered fuckbags with an equally dick nose faxed cover know it all son. Anyway, they also had two daughters. One was actually really nice and pretty awesome. A little stuck up, but she found me mysterious and that had its perks. That has nothing to do with this clusterfuck, though, just remembering the positive stuff that happened during my time there. Point the other sister, however, was a faking diva. A big fat diva. Talking, I only want blue MMs touched only by the hand of a virgin level beachy diva. Well, this beach was getting married. Who actually agreed and wanted to marry this woman was beyond me. The family did a pretty decent business, but they were not even close to rich enough to warrant putting up with that woman for more than 5 seconds. Anyway, the dad, super fat bag senior, as I like to call him, wanted to have the wedding at his house. With that, he also wanted a wooden bridge built over his pool so the bride could walk over it to meet the groom, 
to take their vows gag faking me. Somehow super fact bag senior got it into his brain that I could build this bridge point I know how to work with basic tools. I'm a certified electrician. Huge computer nerd. I do it. That's what I do. I don't build bridges. I don't know the first thing about woodworking besides how to cut or drill holes in the stuff to get cable through it. So, when I set up, I don't even know where to begin, and don't really want to tackle a project like that. Nothing good could come of it. He fired me faking fakbag motherfucker. Turned out for the best, the shops went under 6 months later, and I moved along to a way better job fakbags. That whole family, except the one nice daughter, that used to bend over in loose tops on purpose. I do miss her. I was with a client signing a contract for a great deal of money, when the copier runs out of paper printing off the contract itself. I ask my boss if he can put more paper in for me while I finish up with them in the conference room. Nope, he's too busy. Okay. I excuse myself from my client's company and go add paper to the copy machine. Come to find out, my boss never even ordered paper and he tells me to start cutting legal paper into 8x11. I spent 10 faking minutes cutting legal sized paper with a pair of scissors while my clients waited and twiddled their faking thumbs. And their contract comes out all jagged and misshapen and unprofessional to say the least point I was also the brunt of a legal issue. He didn't want to deal with the lawyers due to corporate lawsuit, so he let them verbally attack me. I was even in the local news when an attorney stormed into the office with a camera crew asking for answers from our corporate office, as if I, a lowly sales rep, had any faking clue what he was talking about. Boss just sitting in his office behind me like a point he also demanded we never poop in the restroom because it was next to his office and he didn't want to hear slash smell it. We had to go across the street to McDonald's to poop. He also allowed the security guards access to my desk slash computer after hours and I would constantly find my browser history cleared and tissues and hand lotion used. I'm still livid about that place. I think he read it too. So I hope he reads this and corrects his behavior for future employees. For the company's sake. I was an intern, and paid of course. Over the summer at a state park as an archive intern point there was no archivist or anyone with archival training whatsoever. They had all of their photographs, 1930 film reels, newspapers, which rapidly deteriorates everything else around it, in, I kid you not, land of lake butter boxes. In a room that was in a humid basement, which also held surveying equipment constantly being used and covered in dirt point I tried my best, via restricted government internet access, to find archiving information, things I was hoping to be taught by the archivist that didn't exist, and organized and exacto knifed photographs, from the 1920s 1950s, that had been glued into scrapbooks made of construction paper. They had very limited archiving materials and wouldn't spend money on very basic material, $12 film cases, sleeves to keep the newspapers from deteriorating etc. The film upset me the most. Almost none of the reels had proper or standard cases and they were all at second or third level of deterioration. I tried to talk to my boss about driving them to a film slash archiving museum upstart but nothing came of it, even though I had access to state vans and working for free. I assume they are still rotting away in cardboard butter boxes, but the unreasonable part of this was that I was told to throw out doubles of photographs. They were awesome photos of guys in wingtips at campgrounds, presidents visiting the state parks, old car shows, things I couldn't faking walk by and look at in a garbage can. I would go into more detail, but it would give away where the park is TLDR, archive internship at state park, doubles of photographs of pretty famous people, hikers, and still frames of a movie filmed here from the 1930s 50s I ended up taking home instead, because I was told to throw them out. Years ago I worked in a hospital mental health ward. We weren't equipped to hold people who were violent or really off their rockers, but sometimes we had to hold people who were brought into the air until a place could be found for them at the place that was equipped to house them. Point one time we had a guy brought in who had stabbed a few of his loved ones before being clubbed in the head by his brother. He had to be taken to the air for some tests to make sure the blow hadn't scrambled his egg. 
After his tests he was sent to Arwing to undergo psych evaluation point he was extremely agitated and violent and had to be put in restraints because the doc was worried he'd brain himself to death. Somehow, he slipped his restraints and made a break for it. When it became clear to him that he wasn't gonna make a clean jet away, he ran into the boiler room and started shouting that anyone who came it would get killed point we called the police and two officers arrived a few minutes later. They took a little while to assess the situation before turning to me and saying, we are not going in there. We don't know the layout, at which point my boss volunteered me, presumably because of how masterfully I manhandled a mop, to ignore the death threats and go into the dark boiler room to wrestle the extremely agitated guy who was at least 4 inches taller and 60 pound heavier than me to the ground, so the police would be safe point I handed him my ID badge and went home to look for another job. This is going to get way buried, but, retail here, I'm a sales associate at a furniture store. Customer comes in, his wife likes this bench we have, and must have it, we have like 3 benches company wide, only one left in store and that would be our display and they are all on clearance, because most of them were scratched during shipping, I told him to look at it carefully, because it's our last one. He then glances at, tells me it's fine and pays for it. When I'm about to load it into his car his wife notices a bit of a scratch behind the arm and complains to her husband. He then demands a brand new bench after I explain that we don't have any left and the rest are displays at other locations throughout the province he proceeds to tell me that I have to have all the benches inspected and have the best one delivered to his house for free because of the massive inconvenience this has caused him and his family. Yeah right, I told him the others might be in the same condition, but I could touch up the scratch for him and give him the paint for free, so he could do the touch ups himself, and it would cover the scratch perfectly. He complains that this is unacceptable and demands me to call my manager on her time off on her cell phone, so I do, and she explains the same thing, she even offers him a refund though we don't usually give one on clearance items. He refuses to accept this because his wife wants the bench so badly, then starts haggling with us saying we cheated him into buying overpriced damaged merchandise and wants a bigger discount and to have it delivered to his home for free, to which I reply that I'm unable to do so because it's against company policy and that he can neither accept the refund or the touch up paint and bench and take it home himself. At this point he decides to start making a scene, yelling at me, calling me unreasonable, bashing the company, telling our other clients not to spend money with us, because we will try to cheat them out of everything they own for defective product etc. etc. I called my manager again, told her what was going on, and she gave me instruction to show this customer to the door with his bench asking him not to return. He never did thank god. Who up, I have one. This was some time ago, when I worked retail. I had been in the industry some time, so I knew to expect hard work and crazy customers. Whatever, it was the job point I'd taken a seasonal position at a pop-up store to tide me over and give me time to find something more suitable. I was hired as an assistant manager, that is, shift supervisor. However, seeing as the manager didn't know how to use a computer, even after weeks upon weeks of me patiently walking her through the processes required, I performed all tasks involving payroll, scheduling, audits, etc. If it was on the computer, I did it point she also couldn't figure out how to work the cash register. Too similar to the computer, and she wasn't comfortable handling money, because she made so many arithmetic mistakes. Even if she had paper and a calculator, because she was uncomfortable with money, she couldn't perform the store opening slash closing tasks. This meant she absolutely could not open the store, as that role involved putting money from the safe into the drawers in the proper increments. If she closed, she'd just leave the closing procedures for the opening manager. That was me. We were required to plug the closing and opening register numbers into the company software, so every closing record noted that it had been performed by me, not the closing manager, the morning after it was to done according to company policy point she also couldn't manage the phone. After huking her into the district conference calls a few times, she had me take over those responsibilities as well point, if there was no one around, to ring up a sale for her, she sometimes just let customers leave with the merchandise without paying for it. 
She got very angry when I explained this was theft and corporate might be concerned when they discovered thousands of dollars had walked out the door to top it off. She started accusing me of thinking she was stupid. Which, to be fair, I did. But it was also pretty clear she had some sort of learning disability and she was my boss and she was my elder and it was a short term job so I had no reason to be disrespectful like that. She did this with increasing frequency until she finally made me cry. Imagine Forrest Gump with neither the good luck for things to turn out alright regardless of what he'd screwed up nor the niceness after the season was done and the store had closed. The district manager told me they should have hired me as the store manager instead and gave me a stellar recommendation that helped get me out of retail. I worked as a concierge in a Sheraton, but I was employed by a different company that ran the concierge desk. This guy calls down from his room one day obviously upset about his flights being delayed and having just then got to his room. He says I have to be a half an hour from here in an hour and I need to mail this package. Do you have any mailing boxes and stamps I can have? Have, not purchase. I tell him to hold on and I will call the front desk as that is a question for them. They tell me no they don't have any, but the post office is only a couple blocks away and he can take care of it all there. I explained this to him and he freaked out about how the hotel should have boxes. I explained that I did not work for the hotel directly and if he wanted to take it up with them, I could transfer him to the front desk. He then said, can you send someone out to get them? I reiterated that no, I don't even work for the hotel, if you want to talk to them you can. He then tries to bribe me with an expensive silver nickel. So finally I put him on hold and called my dad who was off work and said look this crazy guy is on the phone, I know we have one of those boxes he wants at home can you bring me one. Dad is unavailable to do so. So I told the guy I'm sorry, but there is absolutely nothing I can do. He is annoyed and hangs up. About an hour later he comes downstairs and is much nicer and thanks me for my help and goes on his way. The next day my coworker gives me an envelope and says some old guy left this for you. Lo and behold it was a silver nickel worth about $85 according to Google. How about cleaning up hundreds of gallons of spilled shampoo with a mop bucket? Yeah. The asshole supervisor at my summer warehouse job enjoyed making our lives hell for no good reason that we could fathom. So we avoided him whenever possible. Point one day we needed to stack pallets of gallon shampoo bottles, four to a box. We obviously weren't smart enough to use the forklift, so he was doing it himself. Point now we were smart enough to notice that some of the bottles had leaked, meaning the boxes were wet and unstable. He decided to stack them four pallets high to save floor space. We told him that wasn't a good idea, but he damn well knew better than us puny minimum wage peons, so he proceeded. We stood a safe distance away and waited for the show point sure enough, as he set the fourth pallet on top and pulled away, the entire stack buckled, then came crashing down, spilling hundreds of gallons of shampoo everywhere. As the shampoo slowly spread across the smooth concrete floor, he screamed to no one in particular, we knew enough to stay out of direct eyesight, quick. Get some mops, mops, and buckets of water to clean up shampoo. Really, we all just melted away and found other, far away places to work. Point he spent most of that afternoon attempting to mop up shampoo as the bubbles just got high and higher. Eventually, I had some sympathy and came over with a large floor squeegee. It still took the remainder of the shift to clean it all up, and that section of warehouse floor remained slippery for the rest of the summer. That was fun, whenever the forklifts got over into that area. And his whole boss never bothered me again. I worked at this sheety music store when I was a teenager run by a weirdo who also sold Swithers and Max out of it and other random stuff he bowed discount rates when it went on sale. In a ho, one day in the middle of a stormy December day he decides to tell me to go hang Christmas lights outside on the front of the building. So alright sure whatever, it's snowy and cheaty out, but it's still Christmas time. But then he hands me a hammer and nails, points me to this rickety as ladder, and tells me that I need to hammer a bunch of nails into the concrete on the front of the building above the windows to hang the lights on with a hammer. Not big nails or nothing either, just regular little guys that was the worst shift of anything I've ever worked. I tried that for 3 hours, I think if I was lucky I got one nail in that promptly fell out. 
most of the time I was just trying to stay upright on the ladder thinking about what the hell I was doing here point. When I eventually quit a week or two later I asked for my pay and he gave me a kick pedal as payment, which wasn't a bad deal. It was sort of why I was there anyways. But then he mentions that I'm going to have to work another 9 hours to pay it off. Took me like 2 weeks of listening to why he should have to pay me to eventually just get cash off the guy for my time there. When I was in high school I worked at a grocery store for about 3 years as a cashier. About a year into the job we got a new manager, and who ended up being a huge beach. At my store they hire people specifically, to push carts back in and clean up around the store. These people are not cashiers. Pushing carts and cleaning was not in my job description when hired, and I probably wouldn't have taken the job if it had been point anyway. A few days after she started she wanted me to help do carts. It was the middle of winter, slightly above freezing, and it was raining. I didn't bring a jacket to work because they wouldn't give me a locker to keep my things in, but she didn't care and sent me out there anyway in thin yoga pants and a short sleeve shirt. The guy who was supposed to be doing carts was sitting inside drinking hot chocolate while I was out in the freezing rain doing his job. I was too much of a pushover to argue with her about it, and I ended up staying out there until someone else realized where I was and yelled at her for sending me out in the first place. Literally not even a week later someone had explosive sheet all over the men's room. It was on the ceiling, on the floor, in the sink, everywhere. Honestly, it was probably done on purpose, because I don't know how else it could have been so bad. Instead of having one of the guys who were supposed to clean up that kind of thing, she came up to my register, turned my light off, and told me to do it point she had me doing all kinds of dumb things. Luckily she only stayed at our store for about 2 months before getting sent elsewhere. This will take a little explaining, but it's pretty crazy point so imagine walking out onto an Olympic sized pool that had a tarp on top of it that you could walk on. Said tarp was made to walk on, so you could erect an inflatable dome over the pool. But this time unfortunately it rained before we could erect the dome so there was freezing water on top of the walking tarp. So it was like standing on a, guessing, 2 million gallon water bed with frozen water on top of it. So when you stood on it the water would pool up around your chest. So you had 10 feet of pool water under you, separated by a thin membrane and another 5 feet of freezing rain water pulled around, while you walked on this unstable membrane with power tools in your hand, and tried to pull together these other sections of tarp, that would be erected into the dome. It was terrifyingly unsafe, but we were not given a choice point unfortunately. I don't have pick of the setup but below is a pick the finished dome, to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So just imagine a tarp over the top of this pool affixed to the edges with 40 guys on top of it. Like walking on a 100 yard waterbed that's 15 feet deep. Dragging the other pieces that make the dome you see in this picture. But that tarp has rain water setting into 5 foot deep pools of freezing on top of the waterbed. Http slash slash com slash b40g2gz here is a pic of the inside of the dome. So just imagine walking on a tarp erected over the water of this pool. Like I said water bed from hell. This reminds me of a story of my grandfather in Korea point he was in combat staying in a small temporary barracks. These weren't nice buildings, they had leaks in the roof and a plywood floor bowed in the middle. Most days a bit of water would leak in through the roof and puddle on the floor of the barracks. As the youngest and lowest ranking soldier in the barracks he was often assigned with cleaning up the water. One night he had watch duty and had spent well over 24 hours working without any sleep. His watch ended and he stumbled back to the barracks to get a little sleep. He climbed up to the top bunk, hung his gun off the bedpost and started to fall asleep. Point a few minutes later he was woken up by some loud talking as some guys were walking into the barracks. Wow, wow, wow look at this. It was the other guys who stayed there. Look at this puddle, I mean seriously is this how we keep our barracks? Apparently some water had leaked in and formed a puddle where the floor bowed. Who should we get to clean this up? One of the officers asked. If you ask me, I think that the lowest ranking soldier would pull that duty another replied point my grandfather tried to pretend he was asleep. He had been up for over 24 hours, these guys had been riding him pretty hard, and now he was getting near the end of his rope. Hey, A isn't here. Shoot, why don't we have him clean it up? 
if somebody were to walk in and see this floor, that would be pretty embarrassing. Knowing that they weren't going to give it up, and that he'd eventually have to clean the floor my grandfather rolled over, grabbed his gun from where he'd hung it, flipped the safety and bang 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 squeezed off three rounds into the floor. The shots punctured the plywood floor and the water started to drain out point my grandfather looked at the two other guys, who now had their jaws on the floor, and said problem solved. Now, unless you have something else for me to fix, I'm going to get some sleep, at least that's how he tells it. Growing up, the family business was paving, building, and repairing asphalt roads, parking lots, etc. in Southern California. Beginning at the age of 13, my dad would send me off every morning with the crews to work all day. When I was 15, I was placed on a seal coating crew point seal coating. For those who don't know, is when asphalt is sealed with what we call seal coating technical, I know. Seal coating is a mixture of sand, old motor oil, tar, I don't know, I didn't make the stuff, but it's really nasty. The seal would ruin all of your clothes, and if you got it on your skin, and it dried, you'd have to use gasoline, petrol for you come on wheelers, to scrub it off. I'd keep a can of gas in my shower, to transport the seal coat to the job. We use these trucks, that are like water trucks, but they had a giant mixer inside the tanks, that would keep the seal coat mixed, or all the sand would settle, and jam the mixer. Because of this hazard, we were always careful not to leave extra seal coating in the truck overnight. More than once, we found ourselves with a little too much in the tank after the job, so we would seal coat a gas station in exchange for a fill up on the truck or something. Never would we leave too much as it would jam the mixer creating a giant problem, which leads me to my story point so one morning we arrived at the job site, which was a Ralph's grocery store, Ralph's is the Croger of California, to find that the tank was full of settled seal coating. I don't remember the story, something about how they picked up the seal coating the day before, but the job cancelled, and someone was supposed to stay with the truck all night keeping the mixer going but didn't. It doesn't matter. Anyway, I remember the foreman kneeling on the top of the tank, looking into the hole and saying, someone has got to go swimming in there with a shovel, to break up the sand enough, so that the mixer can get the rest mixed. Looks at me. Someone else said, I don't know man, that hole is pretty small. I doubt a full size man could fit down through there. More people look at me. After a few more words, the foreman looks right at me, chat, you're going to have to go into the tank, I'll save you the details but in the end we pulled the truck behind the store i got completely naked except for my boots which they said they'd go get me more and climbed into the tank you ever seen that scene and there will be blood where they are down in the oil well with rags over their faces breathing in those fumes digging in the muck getting life laded covered in oil that was me but naked point climbing out i was covered in seal they had a hose ready, and I did my best to wash it off my bits and pieces before it dried. I remember having the worst headache I'd ever had, and had to call my mom, to come pick me up. Point TLDR, was asked to go climb into a seal truck, naked, to break up the settled seal coating. I'm the accountant for a company owned by a man, his wife, and son. One month I sent the financial statements to the owners. It was the first month in about a year that they weren't profitable point the husband and wife were rational and realized it was a slow month. The son on the other hand flipped sheet. He somehow blamed me for the loss. Keep in mind we have a sales team, marketing team, and all the other normal departments that bring in revenue and find more ways to make money. All the other departments have large amounts of expenses and the managers get them approved by the owners throughout the month. My department doesn't spend a dime, and doesn't even see the full picture of revenue and expenses until the end of the month point I tried explaining this to the disgruntled owner, but he wouldn't budge. He sent an email saying it was my responsibility to fix this. I replied by saying there's no point in paying an entire accounting department if you're not going to accept the information we provide. I went on to say that he's creating a environment for fraud to take place and that I worked too hard for my CPA to lose it because he would rather me sugarcoat the numbers than tell him the truth point seeing I was very close to resigning. The other owners stepped in and defused the situation. Going forward, I only sent the financial statements to the first two owners and let them break the news to the son. 
both examples of professional positions, different companies though point I was asked to let them fail I was assigned to a multi-team project, as one of the subject matter experts. My boss felt he was losing his kingdom, and so he told me, in not so many words, to help him sabotage the project. The idea being, that when it failed he could take it over. This was early in my career needless to say I wasn't about to let myself get a reputation as a saboteur, that did not go over well with the boss. Furthermore my boss was not well liked by management the guy we were to sabotage, has since moved upward rather fast in that company. Well have been pretty dumb of me to follow those instructions. Those who did, have had that reputation follow them to other jobs, it's a small world. Point 2, internal espionage, I was assigned to a project, again as a subject matter expert. The project team wanted nothing to do with me where in another state. They had effectively decided my experience was inferior to their ignorance. I was sent out of state for a week to work with this team and debriefed in detail by three levels of management when I returned. My boss didn't want me to actually do anything on the project either. I had been sent in primarily as a spy for local management, unbeknownst to me. I left both of those jobs in about 12 to 18 months of each occurrence, for obviously good reasons. Working construction on a slow day, my foreman said he would let me go early if I drove him to and from the local casino. Very nervous about the consequences from the company finding out I refused. He then badgered me until accepted. He could not use the company truck so as a young college young buck on the job, I was totally coerced by my foreman on the job to take him to the casino and wait for him, and he then said I could leave early after. With comments like we have a half hour lunch break anyway etc. After arriving to the casino the security asked to check my ID because I looked young. After pulling it out and turning around my foreman was totally gone, lost like a kid in a toy store. An hour passed and I tried calling but no answer. I looked around for a long time while casually playing slot machines to pass time. Nervous as hell I was going to be spotted by someone who may have had a relation to the company while I was in a casino gambling making about $20 an hour. My foreman appeared through the crowd like a kid who lost his puppy. Flustered and teary-eyed he said, I was up to grand, and I gave it all back to them. We left and it was an awkward car ride back to the truck. I was now positively convinced that my foreman was not looking for a fun day at the casino, but rather was a complete gambler harlick. According to MSDS for Dawn Dish Soap that comes in bulk, you have to wear goggles and gloves to handle it. Dawn. Soap vacuuming outside. Maybe not unreasonable, but I always giggle, because it seems absurd when I was a lifeguard, I had a boss who expected the pool chairs and stacks of towels to be lined up with such precision that monk would have wept with joy. You want things to look nice, of course. But this lady would crouch down, close one eye, and squint to see if the chairs and tables were lined up. It's a common rule in theme parks, hotels, and retail that guests should never see you eat, drink, sit, lean on things or otherwise behave, like you're also a human being with any emotion other than deliriously happy. We would be standing outside for 8 to 10 hours nowhere near lockers or cabinets, and we were not allowed to tie our jackets or sweatshirts around our waists, because it looks trashy. You had to hold them folded on your arm like a butler or waiter. I'm so used to it that it doesn't seem like a big deal anymore, but a lot of newcomers flip their sheet over these rules another lifeguard story. New parents had a baby blow out its diaper and get sheet everywhere. Liquidy sheet mixed with pool water puddles and where they were sitting. They scuttled away with their little malfunctioning soft serve machine baby and left an apocalypse. I didn't see it happen. Other guests told me about it. I not only had to clean the poo, L, deck, but I had to go on the worst treasure hunt ever. They ditched the sheety towels in the bin, where the regular less gross used towels went. This was a hotel, and apparently the disaster they left for the housekeepers in their room was just as bad. We still haven't forgiven those pricks. When I was at uni, I worked at a sex shop, where I was asked a lot of unreasonable things, but none as bad as the scenario I'm about to describe, and, having taken enough of the sheet I had to deal with there, I decided to change jobs, so I started working at a local cinema point on my third day, my manager asked me to clean a particular theater, saying it's in a bit of a state, you might want to take someone else to help you. I thought how bad can it be? 
and went in there to assess the damage, alone. I smirked to myself, thinking if this is what management consider a bit of a state, then I'm going to love this job. I began cleaning the theater on my own. As I reached the back, I heard a noise that sounded like someone heavy breathing, and I looked round. There was nobody there. That's odd. I continued cleaning point. When I got to the second row from the back, I saw something on the floor of the back row and realized it was a man. I climbed over the seats and started to crouch down towards him before the smell of urine hit me. I saw he'd wet himself and it was only after I'd stood up and backed away a little that I saw the empty beer cans, cigarette butts and the syringes on the floor around him. There was also a needle still in his arm point. When I relayed the situation to my manager, he laughed and said ah, yeah, that's why I suggested you take someone else to help. Safety and numbers and all that, you know? What? I must have looked shocked, because he then explained it's what you're being paid for. He'd expected the job to take two people, so that one person could hold the junkie and the other could pull the needle out of his arm. Apparently, this was in case the guy came to and got aggressive while the needle was being pulled out. No, seriously. The manager casually explained that there were rubber gloves and a sharps bean in the cleaning cupboard for occasions like these. When I realized this was not a one-off and that this was business as usual for him, I got angry. I felt the blood rush to my cheeks and I also had that prickling in the sinuses feeling you get just before you cry. Damn. I hate anger tears, so I hurriedly muttered something about not putting my health in danger for the sake of a sheety job, handed him the cleaning supplies, and told him that I quit. I managed to make it to the staff toilets before my tears began to fall. Small victory. Hooray. I went outside and called my old boss to sweetly ask him if I could, pretty please, have my old job back. The next day, I resumed working at the set shop. Ah, that was a good job. The second time round point TLDR, I worked in a cinema where my boss expected me and another member of staff to hold down an unconscious, urine-soaked junkie and pull the needle from his arm. So I quit point edited to add my TLDR as I hadn't realized it was so long. When I was typing it. I used to work at a Burger King. And one shift there was only three of us me in the kitchen. Someone who was running drive through slash front cash and a lazy manager. Out of nowhere we got hit hard. And people were a lot of orders were coming from both drive through And up front point it was just me. And my friend on doing all the work. Because the manager felt like. Having a break right then and there. And I was stuck by myself to make 30 orders. At first I was doing the orders in the order they showed on my screen, but then the manager came in and yelled at me because of the poor drive through time. He asked me to make all the drive through orders first, before the out front orders. So I started to do that, and then I realized how many orders there were, and I could hear people complaining at this point I had asked for help from the manager a few times, but he just kept saying he was on break. People started asking for their money back eventually I finished the rest of the orders, but some of them still had to be tossed, because more customers were angry that they waited 15 to 20 minutes for their food. The manager blamed me for everything too. I almost quit on the spot when he wouldn't help me. I told the store manager about it the next time I worked with her, and my friend did as well. Eventually we both quit because of the same guy who had yet to be fired. One of the shift managers had problems with him and was accepting notes about how we wanted him fired because he was assistant manager and that still didn't work so I quit. It also sucked that the customers weren't more understanding considering I was clearly the only one in the kitchen but it still was fairly understandable. I probably would have been pissed too. Oh man, a lot point I worked as a team leader for a team of counselors for a boys home. The kids here were aged 6 to 14 and had a variety of different diagnoses and histories, but most featured some degree of PTSD due to trauma and neglect. It was usually a fun job and I had a good relationship with the kids, but sometimes things got really shitty. Figuratively and literally. The absolute worst story I have comes from working with this huge, aggressive 14 year old, didn't contradict myself. He was supposed to have aged out of our program 6 months prior to this event. He was having a terrible night and was confined to his room. It was around 8.30pm when we started to hear him banging on his closet door a little background on the rooms. These rooms were designed with security and safety in mind. 
The walls were covered with a plastic laminate that was extremely durable, and both the bedroom and closet doors were steel fire doors. Their only window was double paned Lexan. These rooms were secured. Their closets were kept locked to protect their personal belongings from other kids and to limit their access to stuff when they blew out in a rage point so anyway, this kid managed to somehow break the handle off his closet door and had recovered his personal folding razor brand scooter. I had one of my staff holding his door shut, the bedroom doors did not lock, for obvious reasons, by wrapping a sheet around the door handle and then around his own body as something of a rope. This kid was now secured in his room, but armed with what amounted to a 4 pound chunk of aluminum, and completely incoherent with rage point, so I'm on the phone with my supervisor, because at this point I'm going to cover everyone's ass, and make sure that everything I do, I do by the book. I'm already thinking of this event in terms of the future court testimony I'm going to have to provide point now, my own take on this thing, is to let this kid rage out in his room. He's not a self-harmer, and I have an otherwise good relationship with him. I'm willing to let him destroy every article of personal property he owns, and then once his prefrontal cortex starts to reassert itself, we'll have a nice, calm conversation and put this whole thing behind us nope, says my clinical supervisor from the comfort of her own living room. He's got a weapon, you need to secure him point secure him. See if you can guess what that means now this kid is, for a 14 year old, huge. He was probably about 160, 170 lbs. I, myself, am reasonably huge. Doing the math here, I'm a grown as man with grown as man muscles. He's a faking pissed off teenager who is enraged and terrified, armed with something that could very easily kill me or a member of my team, and he doesn't, in the moment at least, give a fuck who gets hurt. I have no doubt that he'd feel profound regret if he did any lasting damage, but again, prefrontal cortex point, so she tells me to send my team in and take him down. My team consists of a guy much smaller than myself and a woman in her 50s. Fact that I said, you're going to get someone on my team killed, I'll do it myself point what followed was nothing resembling a clinical intervention. It was a faking brawl. Somehow I managed to get the kid on the floor and remove his weapon before anyone was injured, but it was terrifying and pointless this kind of thing didn't happen often, but I have some other similar stories. Institutional mental health treatment is a sad and scary place, and I don't miss it. The fact that the leadership occasionally made such bad calls as this one, which only resulted in re-traumatization of our kiddo and put us all at risk, still really bothers me to this day. To be fair to my supervisor, she was operating from a different set of expectations and parameters than I was, but I remain confident to this day that I could have resolved that one without violence point edit, formatting for readability. Not me but my mother is having to deal with some BS this week. We are having a ton of money troubles, and her old cowhawkers, who were custodians and got laid off before their contract was up are getting together to discuss a lawsuit against the school. Now, this meeting that's happening on the first is what decides. If you get a part in it, you show up, you get to sue, you don't, you're out of luck point. So my mother put in the day off about two months ago. No prob, said her boss. And then rules started changing in those two months. They couldn't have their phones on them while working, even when turned off. They had to sign a contract stating that they can't post to Facebook about anything that might have to do with the supermarket they work at. They can no longer go see the schedule themselves, and the boss hands out little papers telling them what times they are working every week point, and so she comes into my room, I'm a live and college student, last night with her schedule and she's pissed. She had asked for that day off two months ago, and the bastard scheduled her for it point she's talking to the boss today, but I don't doubt that she'll walk out soon. As she says, I was looking for a job when I got this one, TLDR. Job boss won't give her a day off that she asked for two months in advance, to which they said she could have it. They also have ridiculously strict rules for a minimum wage job. Worked at a Staples as a tech. One bad wintry night we were short staffed, so I did a little bit of everything. Doing copper print stuff, helping people pick out nice pens, etc. Which is usually no big deal when someone calls off or something, 
Since I'm not an idiot point our store location is pertinent to this story, it was right on Route 80, which is basically a bunch of 18 wheelers. Truckers used to stop in our store all the time, because it was a quarter mile from the exit off of 80, and usually came to buy some electronic device, to help them navigate or pass their time point moving on, this night was different. It was fairly uneventful. At the end of the night, we were doing our checks for closing, which includes checking the bathrooms for any merchandise or people, and usually giving them a wipe down etc. Check women's room, fine. Check men's room, and holy mother of god something must have died and here I prepare myself to open up the stall, and when I do, it's an armageddon. It looked like someone slaughtered a full grown bull, a package of green food coloring, and a case of chocolate syrup, while they were at it. There was literally sheet everywhere, except in the toilet bowl. It was like a sheet monster made a final try at escape, before he was successfully flushed point my manager at this point, is walking by the restroom, on the way back to his office, and notices my scream of horror and the smell. He then says this has definitely got to be cleaned up. We exchange looks, and realizing that we are the only two people here, I knew what that meant point the look I gave him back must have said it all, because he just let out a deep sigh, and said I'll help you. The night my manager spent 45 minutes with me cleaning up the poop fest 2k8 was probably the time when I realized I had a really great manager. I liked him up until that point, but after that, I honestly had the utmost respect for him point to this day, he is still by far the best superior I've ever had in any position point tldr, work in a store, sheet everywhere, manager is ggg and helps me clean up. I'm rather late, but, this story is too ridiculous not to post. My previous job was a dishwashing at a chain restaurant, I know it would be stupid, but it was work. Anyway, we had run out of soap for the third time within the 3 or 4 months that the restaurant was open. Which in itself is really dumb, but the sheet that happens after is far worse. I tell my cow walker that there isn't any soap for the machine in the closet and to start filling the compartment sinks. While I start moving dishes closer to where the sinks are one of the managers comes and asks what are you guys doing, and I tell her, but my voice indicates more that I mean to say, are you stupid point. After about 5 to 10 minutes the general manager comes over, and asks the same stupid question, but this time goes to check if we are actually out of soap, apparently under the impression that we'd rather wash by hand than use a machine. But instead comes back with disinfectant. He tells us to use it, and puts it in the machine. However, it doesn't completely fit. For those wondering the soap and disinfectant are solid, and in a bottle, the machine or holder has water rush up at the solid solution, to create the proper mixture of chemical and water. So firstly we are told to use the wrong thing, to wash the dishes people are eating off of. Secondly the thing isn't even properly secured. I show him this second part, but he isn't alarmed by it, and goes back to his office. My buddy and I just look at each other, laugh, and start to use the machine. Now it get beyond stupid, I start to get a real bad chemical smell, so I stop the machine to ask my buddy if he smells it, and sure enough he does. I go to tell the GM and his reply oh, it's bio clean it's fine. Apparently he understood the look of bafflement on my face, because he repeated himself, and added we use it to clean the tables. My coworker and I said fuck that we are washing by hand, only to have him stop every few minutes letting us know the machine would be faster and we should use that instead. Super late to this thread, but on the off chance anybody reads this at all I figure it's worth sharing point at my old job, the one that basically reaffirmed that I should go get my advanced degree, rather than just tough it out in an office setting I hated. I had a supervisor who had been demoted on several different occasions. It got to the point that she was actually my equal on projects, but because she had 40 some years with the company she assumed she was my boss. So anyway, after training on this new division of my job for about a month or so, I quickly learned that the way my supervisor was insisting I do things was flagrantly breaking company policies. And this was in engineering, so our policies were actually, you know, important. Now, I want to interject here and say this lady was extremely kind to me and treated me exceptionally well until it came to listening to my ideas on how to improve how we do things. Then she would brush me off instantly, and that was that. I didn't know enough to know how to fix things, because this is how we've always done them here before computers. 
Ugh point so flash forward to my having been working with her for 4 months or so, and I've put in my 2 weeks notice, because I got accepted to graduate school out of state. My supervisor is in deep sheet with her boss for not having completed a job aid book. Since she was the lead on this project, the job aid book had to be completed by her but you know, she had just too much to do, and simply couldn't find time to do it, so she handed the project down to me. But I got it with the following stipulation, don't let anybody see you working on it, maybe take it home with you? We worked on billable hours, so anything I took home I wouldn't be paid for. I need it done by Friday. Basically just sum up every aspect of what we do, and then I'll review it, and turn it into my boss. Oh, also, I'll be telling her I wrote it, so, I did it. But I did it very poorly and only gave it to her the day before I left, so she had to basically rewrite the whole thing anyway. Too much here refers to spending an hour at the start of every day doing her hair in the bathroom, followed by about 3 hours of personal phone calls, made from her desk, and 2 hour lunches, so she could shop for new clothes. My first job in high school was at a local grocery store in the southern Appalachia area. We had a lot of regulars, most of whom lived further out of town. My manager, a skeezy 40 something going through a midlife crisis liked to help out the regulars, which I had no problem with. Until one day, in the middle of my shift, one of the regulars had car trouble point he was an older man, probably a few years older than my manager. After ringing up his groceries, my manager pulls me aside and tells me I'm going to give this man a lift home. Being a 16 year old girl, I blanched and said it would probably be better if my manager drove him. Insisting he lived only a few minutes away, he then grabbed my purse from the office we kept them in and told the man to start loading his groceries in my car I uncomfortably proceeded to drive this man home. A few minutes down the road we turned down a more rural road, followed by another and another. 20 minutes later I'm convinced this is a trap and that I'm going to get killed. We eventually get to his house, I stay in the car, and make him unload his own groceries and book it out of their point, why I agreed to do it in the first place I have no idea, I can only assume it was my naivety, and thought that, if a manager told you to do something you had to, thankfully I grew out of that quickly after this incident point edit, broke up text block. High school teacher here, had a student who cheated his way through an app class. I knew it all year, but couldn't prove it until the fourth quarter, when he just did a word for word plagiarism of an entire paper he found on a website. Asked the kid if he had anything he wanted to tell me about where the contents of his paper came from. Nope. Showed him the web pitch. Asked if he'd like to say anything now. No idea how that happened, but I didn't use that website. Called the parents and told them I caught him cheating. He's getting a zero on the paper, no response from them point his grade dropped to a D for the semester, but he passed the year and graduation was over. I was at school finishing up final grades for the other classes and packing up for the summer when my principal comes in and says we have a problem with X's grade. I'd left a note for him about the cheating, so he knew what had happened. X's parents just called, and because his app grade was so low, he lost his very big scholarship for next year. We need to do something, they are pissed. I was initially confused about what the heck I was supposed to do, then realized he was telling me to change the kid's grade up to letter grades. I refused, said this is the grade he earned, and I will not be a part of this he went in, overrode the grade himself, and gave the kid an A. When I got home that afternoon I found out that the exact same conversation had taken place down the hall with my roommate, also a teacher who'd had X, and he was getting a D in her class. My search for a new job started that afternoon. Second job in high school working as a stock boy at an old ladies clothing store that had been downtown for 50 years. Mostly it was washing windows, and hanging out in this cool old basement under that store, putting tags on hideous Mew Mew dresses. The owner was batshit insane, but if you kept moving and appeared busy he would leave me alone point one day he got a bug up his as that the air conditioning unit didn't smell right and grabbed me and told me I needed to clean out the drain. The building was built in the 1890s in a row of storefronts and the only way in was through the front. He drug me outside with a shovel and a handful of trash bags and led me next door into the pizza shop through the back entrance that led into the rear of a kid's shoe store behind it and to a door next to their bathroom. 
We pried open the door and the stench was overwhelming point over the decades other buildings had been built hodgepodge around the area behind the strip of buildings that faced Main Street and this door opened to the only part still open to the sky. It was 3 feet wide and ran about 10 feet along part of the back of our store point at one corner was a small pipe running down the wall draining the condensation from our rack unit in the third floor. He proceeded to tell me that the pipe must be clogged and I thought well no sheet. You can't even see the bottom of the pipe where it opened to the dirt the entire 3x10 area was at least 18 inches deep in pigeon sheet. All kept moist from the act drain and whatever rain made it down in this shaft point my job that day was to shovel all this sheet into trash bags. Then I had to carry every full bag through the pizza place past everyone trying to eat, out onto Main Street, and back into our store, and down to the basement, where we had a lift to the street through the sidewalk. It would sit there for a few days until the garbage guy showed up a few days later I dug out that hellhole for 8 hours. As I dug through it all I found dozens of rotting pigeons. I must have thrown up on that muck at least 10 times to the point where there was nothing left to puke. The pizza place was pissed and screamed at my boss, but he was this ancient old hunchback bastard who suddenly pretended to not know English and screamed back at them in Yiddish with spit flying everywhere until they just walked away I had nightmares about pigeons for weeks and couldn't even look at pizza for two years because the smell had been associated with the stench of the island of living sheet. I used to work at an animal hospital at home before I left for vet school. I was a kennel attendant and did duties such as feeding, cleaning kennels, bathing, bringing dogs up from boarding, going home, bringing them back, assisting vets and giving vaccinations slash nail trim slash x-rays. I was a peon, but when compared to the lazy beach receptionists, I was equal. They are all rude, gossipy ignorant, beaches. They will go out of their way to put you down while still asking for more help without helping you. This one time there was a small pile of cat food bags. She started to ask me to carry them for her and then stops herself halfway and goes oh wait nvm hey alex. Kid who is taller than me by maybe a couple inches, a year older, but definitely not built, we need someone strong to move these. She didn't call me weak, but she implied I couldn't lift a 25 pound bag. Anyway, one day the lobby toilet gets clogged. We were really busy, that day and the lobby was packed with people. I bring a dog up to go home, and one of the receptionists says, in a condescending tone, um, the toilet won't flush, points over to the toilet, like I don't already know where it is, me. Well, you should probably call a plumber, or we have a maintenance guy you could call, yeah lazy beach, huh, isn't there a plunger in back, me, I don't know, let me check turn around, and walk out of lobby. I didn't look and didn't come back and the fat beach receptionist walked all the way to the back to find me and ask me personally, not any of the other 8 kennel workers or my shift leader, to go unclog it. So I walk out, plunger in hand, and the 20 plus people in the lobby are staring at me. Someone in there clogged it and they know it and they know I'm the guy who now has to go dislodge their fesses. I did the deed and walked out. For some reason, it felt so degrading point ELDR unclogging a huge sheet from a toilet at an animal hospital. Just experienced this yesterday. It's not objectively 100% unreasonable, but I found a significant personal conflict in that point basically. One of my bosses wanted me to overhaul a website for a relative of his business associate, for free. He's had me do this before. They like doing favors for this guy and his family because he does favors back by connecting our company with potential new customers. It's worth noting that we are not a web development company. I only have self-taught web dev experience and my official position is not as a web dev and I'm certainly not paid like one. I'm hourly and receive a fraction of what a true web dev would get and no payment on a per project basis anyway. So he wants me to do another site for his buddy. My boss explains that, if I do this, he will probably receive in return an all expenses paid vacation down to Florida for golfing. It's business related because he will be golfing with potential new customers. Strikes me as only tangentially related to my job, but whatever, I agree. Then I see the website. It is a website for a Republican political action committee, actively seeking donations and endorsing a candidate because of his agenda to deaf and planned parenthood and overturn Roe v. 
Wade. I happen to be very strongly pro-choice point I refuse to do it. This was yesterday, and he hasn't brought it back up. Wonder what will happen. TLDR boss asks me to do a personal business favor, so he can get a free vacation, and it happens to involve working on an ultra-conservative, pro-life PAX donation site, running directly contrary to my political views. TLDR, manager told me I had to dig through kitchen trash, I told him to fack himself, and I got the health department on there as long ago, when I was a waiter I had accidentally dropped a tray of dirty plates and broke a few. Accidents happen, whatevs right? Nope, not at this sheet hole of a restaurant, I was told as part of my closing duties for the evening, by a manager, that I had to do a trash audit whereby you don a dishwasher's rubber smock and rubber gloves, and have to hand pick through two large bags of trash, and thrown out slash scrapped off food to see if any flatware or dishes accidentally ended up in the trash. Without any hesitation I expressed my profound disgust of the assignment to my manager, I told him that he could fack himself if he was truly insisting I do that, and that if he was really serious, I not only would I refuse, but I was going to call the health department and local county labor board and ask them what their thoughts were on having non-kitchen staff rummaging through bags of trash as a form of punishment point he was serious and threatened to fire me. I told him to fack himself, I continued closing out my section, and did my closing side work, turned in my receipts, and went home for the evening. Needless to say I did not dig through any bags of trash, but I did call the health department that very next morning, and did start a bit of sheet storm. That afternoon we had a surprise inspection from none other than the local health department. They claimed that they had received a call about requiring wait staff to dig through trash and that was very much so against county health code point I got a call that afternoon from the district manager who ended up apologizing to me for the idiot manager's decision to try and make me dig through the garbage. All he asked of me was to be more careful and not drop any more plates and that the manager had been fired for poor decision making. Put the blender away. I know this sounds ridiculous, but I was working as a dishwasher and was told when they trained me to put the blender on a wire rack just behind me. One night one of the shift managers decided that wasn't good enough, that I was somehow being lazy because of it, and told me to put the blender in its proper place at the end of the night. This manager was particularly challenged at clear communication. Where does it go? I asked. The blender was pretty rarely used, and I'd never seen anyone use it, just put it on the thing, she said, the thing, what thing, go all the way in the back and put it on the thing, um, okay, not wanting to seem like I was stupid or just being difficult, I humored her, I made an about face and walked straight ahead until I hit a wall, hoping this is what she meant by all the way in the back, I looked around for a thing to put the blender on, nothing point I went back to her and said, I'm sorry, but could you be a little more specific? She sighed like I was an idiot child. All the way in the back, on the thing the blender goes on. Finally I had to convince her to actually lead me to where the blender belonged. It was tucked away in the fry room, and the thing she was talking about was the blender standpoint not exactly unreasonable on the face of it, but it's pretty unreasonable to think I'd have any idea what the heck she was talking about. That same night she told me I had a bad attitude, because I had to keep asking her to clarify. Oh my god this is a great question. I worked as a contractor for a major corp whose title rhymes with snooze. Fallon. Remilton. I was assigned to a government agency that specializes in mapping just outside of the beltway. This customer had earned the nickname. Dragon Lady. She was a mean son of a beach. She timed our bathroom breaks or would task us to make a Starbucks run then when we returned. She would say make sure you make up that time that you spent running to Starbucks. But the worst, most unreasonable came for Valentine's Day. She had decorated the office with red and pink paper hearts. And for the week prior, she had instructed us to wear red on Valentine's Day. She had also scheduled a potluck lunch, but with assigned meals of course. The day came, and my co-worker Sheila wore a green sweater. I had forgotten V-Day, but in a stroke of luck, my shirt had red stripes, which totally counted to the dragon lady. Dragon lady pulled one of the paper hearts from the wall and asked Sheila to pin it to her shirt with a safety pinpoint Sheila, a hardcore bull dyke, 
if there ever was one, said, I'm not pinning that on my shirt. So Dragon Lady ordered me to pin it on Sheila's shirt. I politely declined and muttered something about not being able to use safety pins. Dragon Lady then attempted to get close to Sheila and pin in on herself. Sheila stood up and said I'm not wearing that faking stupid heart, Dragon. Lady went into a tailspin. Tears wellered in her eyes and she tore down the paper hearts from the walls. And she started throwing little bags of candy conversation hearts at everyone, while muttering things like after all I did to just give you people a nice holiday party, and here's the candy I was going to surprise you with I guess I will just give it to you now, since no one cares about all the work I put into this, she is a maniac. I wonder if she is still there. Our company eventually cancelled the contract because she hit one of our employees. Your tax dollars at work. Not really as serious as everyone else, but I've only had jobs being a waitress. A place I worked at would make all the new waitresses do one hostessing shifts, which fine, the manager wanted us to know the layout of the restaurant. But we only had one hostess who worked Friday nights and Saturday nights, since those are the only nights busy enough to need a hostess, and she would constantly request days off, meaning us waitresses would have to be a hostess sometimes, to fill in her place. Kind of annoying, why not find a hostess who's actually able to work on those days, and instead of sometimes showing up, sometimes not. The manager at first would rotate who would be a hostess, so we all took turns being a hostess. Then it started getting to a point where I would get more hostess shifts, and finally when the original hostess went on vacation for a month, I had like 3 hostess shift a week with only one serving shift. I did not sign up to be a replacement hostess, I understand having to be a replacement once in a while, but this was ridiculous. As a hostess, you only make $30 to $40 a night in wages, since you only work 3 to 4 hours, but serving with tips and wages, you make at least $90 minimum for the same amount of hours. So I started asking other servers to fill in shifts for me, or switch a serving for hostess shift, some agreed since it mean they could leave by 10pm on a Friday. Me giving away those shifts made the manager say a snarky comment about how it shows I don't value and appreciate my job hero and to make it worse, I requested Halloween off because I had plans to go out of town. Nope, I had to be a hostess instead, so I didn't even make money and had to cancel my weekend. The manager had it out for me. I quit very shortly after. I also got beached at for requesting Friday nights off, since my university actually makes us do midterms on Friday nights, and sometimes even Sunday mornings. Since I didn't get Halloween off, I asked in October if I could have New Year's Eve off. Nope, she wouldn't grant me that either. This is a well-known chain of wing restaurants here in Canada 0 tenths would not work again point tldri as a waitress. Basically got demoted to a hostess, since our actual hostess liked to take many vacations and nights off. I worked tech support in college for my university point we had guidelines on what we would and wouldn't give service for. Essentially, if a laptop met our minimum specs, we'd work on it. If they brought in a smartphone, we only did email setups. We could only re-image system if they had a recovery partition of provided their own disks. Everything was set up to protect the university from any sort of legal action point we had one client who was the absolute worst. He constantly came in with his Windows 7, Atom processor, 1 gig of RAM netbook, not for anything actually wrong with it, but just to complain it was slow and demand we make it faster. He'd also constantly try to get us to do his homework for him, even after being told multiple times we don't do that point, but the real kicker was the day he came in with his Walmart quality 3G adapter. This was his solution for being able to do homework at home. Since I couldn't figure out why it wouldn't work on his system, he demanded I call the tech support offered by the manufacturer and make it work point at this point. Three things come to mind we are only responsible for your connection on campus, which is why the university had campus wide wifi we could only spend so much time with a client before scheduling them for an in-depth appointment, and this didn't meet the criteria for one of those appointments not. My faking problem. This is where the manager would usually help us turn the client away, but the manager on that day 
They instructed me to do as the client asked point, so the next hour and a half of my day was trying to work through the problem over the phone with a dude reading from a sheet of steps, offering no help whatsoever. And at the end of it, my client was still irate and ungrateful. This was my first job, flipping burgers at a fast food joint some 10 years ago. Worked there for 8 months, never got asked to clean the deep fry events, I think they sent in a professional to do it instead, with proper equipment and whatnot. But my new boss, about one week into her new role as manager slash Führer, had asked me to clean the huge vents above the industrial deep fryers. For the record, these deep fryers were essentially deathly cauldrons of steaming acid waste point here is what I was instructed to do, take an old wobbly wooden plank, no more than 3 inches thick and just wide and long to cover the deep fryers, place this plank atop the deep fryers, then, I was given a spray bottle full of vinegar and a nasty old rag that looked as if it had been used to wipe up diarrhea, I then had to somehow manage. To hop onto this shaky wooden plank, all the while trying not to slip on the greasy floor or place my hands on any variety of blisteringly hot surfaces. I wasn't given gloves, a mask, or anything. Once atop and fully standing, I was about shoulder deep into the vents. My boss then proceeded to turn off said vents. Within a matter of seconds, my body was overwhelmed by an intense humidity, courtesy of the steaming volcano beneath me. My glasses were almost instantly fogged up, rendering me blind for this ungodly task point. But here's the kicker. In the midst of having to gasp for breath in a fast food sauna and trying to balance myself atop a flimsy wooden plank, I now had to begin spraying copious amounts of vinegar onto the disgusting walls of the vent and wiping them down with the filthy rag. Needless to say, at this point, I was sweating like Shaq at the free throw line, breathing in toxic vine gar fumes, and seconds from passing out, all this pretty much blind, since my glasses were completely fogged up. This lasted nearly 15 minutes until my manager told me I had done enough point I quit after that shift. I used to be a piralegal at a small law firm. The head of the firm was smart, but in a really crazy, disheveled, and unorthodox way, to say the least. I can think of a lot of ridiculous things I did while working there, but I'll go with one of the funnier ones. One Sunday afternoon I get a call from him, which wasn't all that strange, but I knew he was in on the other side of the country, and had trial the next morning, so it was a little ominous. Hey can you get my car from the airport and drive it to court tomorrow morning? I'm changed my schedule and now I'm taking a red eye into a different airport. I didn't have his keys, but that wasn't a problem, because he ties the spare key with some wire to the bottom of his car. So the next morning, I went to the airport, crawled underneath his car, got the key, and start to drive to the exit of the parking lot, but he had at least a dozen of those tickets you get when you enter a parking lot. I just handed them all to the cashier, and she found the right one. Anyway, so I finally left for the courthouse, but my phone started ringing again it was him. Hey, are you on your way? Can you pull over and see if I have any pants in the car? At this point I had been working for him for a few years, so I was only a little phased by the question. Sure, I said, got out, and there were tons of sneakers and t-shirts and candy wrappers and boxes strewn and various piles across the back of his sov, but the only pants were a really old pair of Georgetown Hoyer sweats. I remember those sweats, because I really regretted touching them. Anyway I called back with the bad news, no pants, so he asked me to call the office and arrange for another piralegal to bring some pants he had in the office. Got that taken care of, get back in the driver's seat, take back off for the courthouse. A few minutes later, I get another cal this time he needs a shirt. I pull the car back over, rummage through his clothes again, and I find a dress shirt but it really wasn't in any condition to be worn in a courtroom. So I called the other piralegal again, this time for a shirt. A few minutes later, I get yet another call, and I answer, before you ask me, if any socks or ties are in the car, or whatever it is, make a list, and tell me at the same time. He swears the last thing he needs is a belt. I make another call to the firm, and the other piralegal laughingly says, that he'll just bring an entire outfit point so, I get to the courthouse first, and the other piralegal arrives after me. He brought with him a suit, a tie, a shirt, a belt, and a fresh pair of socks. He leaves the items with me and goes back to the office. 
Maybe 10 or 15 minutes later my boss stumbles out of a cab carrying a suitcase and a stuffed backpack. He was only gone for two nights, in sweet pants and stained shirts, old golf visor openly displaying his mangled hair, and in desperate need of a shave. I'm trying not to giggle as I keep an eye out for security guards, while he changes inside the car. Hey. Hey. I hear from inside the car. I'll let out a good laugh, when he asks me, if the other Piralagal brought shoes. He did not point inside one of the piles of crap in the car was and dress shoe. He asked if he could borrow my shoes, which is what made me think of this story in response to the op's question. Luckily my shoes were four sizes larger than his, and to be honest, even if they were the same size I would have looked for another excuse to not have to wear his shoes. So, being the oddly smart man that he is, put on the one dress shoe and started limping on the other foot that was in a sneaker. I'll just tell people I hurt it this morning, while playing tennis or something. Judges love tennis, anyway that's my story. I worked at an audio slash video store, to pay my way through college. We carried CRTs, the big heavy bulky TVs from pre-flat screen days, and 19 inches and 27 inch TVs were a big seller. We had a giant wall of TVs. Think 40 year old virgin, which was filmed in one of our stores, and every so often, on a slow weekday, our store manager would call over whichever unlucky soul had last upset him, and ask them to reorganize all of the TVs. For example that meant moving the 19 inch ones from the top row to the bottom row, and moving the 27s from the bottom row to the top point now, reorganizing the TVs is an insane task, there were probably 20 per row, 3 rows and we had a standard warehouse ladder. It was fine for moving the first and second row, but the top row was the real son of a beach. In order to reach the plug to unplug, then deadlift the TV over our head to move it, we had to stand on the handles of the warehouse ladder, which meant, in slacks, shirt, tie, and business shoes, having a buddy hold the ladder, while we balanced ourselves on the handle, carefully lifted the 100 plus pounds. TV over our head, slowly brought it down, then gingerly stepped off the handles without losing our balance, place the TV down, and start the process all over again point twice. Once the hours long project was complete, the manager took a look at the new configuration and said no, I don't like it, put it back how it was. We hated that faking dude point dl. Doctor, manager would make us perform extremely dangerous and tedious tasks as busy body work. He was a dick. Mass human waste story time, I worked at a private fly, in fishing camp in near here for a summer between high school and college. There was no sewer system at the camp yet it was quite luxurious, housing 40 guests. The owner was an eccentric billionaire and most of the guests were either family or business associates. I worked as one of four maintenance people. Our duties included painting, general handy manning, helping the fishing guides out etc. One of the duties was disposing of the human waste. As mentioned earlier there was no sewer system, since the camp was built on a huge rock point the toilets worked, by having a really long biodegradable clear bag that lined the toilet, and when you flushed, the bag would drop down a foot or two and use heat to seal it off. The bags were probably 40 feet long, and would drop down into a large rubber bin below. I assume they were clear, so you could find a ring, or whatever if you accidentally flushed it. Imagine a gigantic version of fizz candy, but instead of being filled with awesome sugary candy they are filled with the stuff you would normally flush down a toilet. As I mentioned earlier, I worked as one of four maintenance people. We worked in pairs, and took turns on most of the camp duties. So every second day my partner and I would go around to every bathroom at the camp, roughly 10 if my memory serves me correctly, take all the daisy chain clear bags of sheet, this insanitary womanly waste and use a wheelbarrow, to take the bags down to the docks, where we would use a boat, to take them to another island. Once there we would take them to a massive pit we dug at the beginning of the summer, I would say it was roughly 800 cubic meters, it took the four of us an entire day to dig it, and dump them in. Every few days we would bury the bags that had accumulated and start over. So the bags were transferred from the bins to the wheelbarrow to the bins in the boat, back to the wheelbarrow, and to the pit. Four transfers total point I worked there for four months and we probably averaged 30 guests slash staff at a time. We handled roughly 3600 man slash days of human waste. Say 5 bathroom visits per person per day and you have 18,000 back pocket things. 
Each bag was transferred four times. I would say the average bag transfer resulted in a ruptured bag 1-2% of the time. A manager ordered me to sit silently at an empty desk all day, during which time I was not permitted to say anything to anyone under any circumstances. I was not permitted to put anything on the desk or to hand anyone a note, to respond to anything anyone said in any way, and I was required to keep my hands on the desk at all times I had been the head systems administrator at the company, and they hired a new boss for me. He saw me as a threat, and wanted me to quit, so he did that to me. He didn't inform anyone else, so all day long people kept coming to me with problems, and all I could do was give them pleading looks, because the desk in question was in plain view of the new boss's desk. And of course, it was utterly insanity inducing to have to sit for 8 hours without being able to do or say or read anything point I made it through 2 days. I really needed the money or I would have quit. The third morning I walked in, and before sitting down placed a letter on my boss's desk that said, more or less, I seem to have no duties, and this doesn't seem to be a productive use of my time or an efficient use of the money the company is paying me. I respectfully request that you please give me some work to do. Fifteen minutes later I was fired for gross insubordination for writing the letter. I was so emotionally exhausted from that job that I basically spent the next week in bed and then found a better job more or less immediately. Alas, I'm six hours late to the party. This is probably going to get buried, but I have two examples. A little backstory, I worked as a maintenance man for six years at two mobile home parks that my boss owned. However, you have to realize that maintenance man is a pretty general term, and while I was there I did landscaping, paved the streets, plumbing and sewer work, plowing slash salting, masonry, demolishing slash bringing in new homes, and I got use heavy equipment slash machinery, jack homer cuboter excavator and tractor. Now on with the story. My boss was a major cheapskate, and tried to reuse everything. Most of our tools he got were from tenants sheds after they died. So there was this big deck, probably 15 foot x 7, on front of this mobile home that was getting taken out. My boss wanted to move it to another house, and for some reason we couldn't use the excavator. The only other option we had was to use the 22 year old Ford tractor with a front bucket and backhoe. So we wrapped a couple chains around the deck and the front bucket. However, the weight was not balanced, and no matter how we chained it slash moved the bucket a corner would start to drag on the ground. So what's the best thing my boss thinks of? Hey let's entlin. Go stand on the deck to even out the weight, while I drive up the hill. Unfortunately, I was young, and it was my first job, so I just did what I was told, and didn't realize how stupid slash dangerous it was until later this happened a few years later, I think I was 21. And I had been studying I slash O psych for a while, so I knew about work safety, OSHA and all that stuff. The years had not been kind to my boss, multiple lawsuits from tenants, fear of the end of the world, slowly becoming senile and crazy, while suckling on the teats of Glenn Beck and Rush Limbaugh. Anyway, I come back to work for the summer after college and I noticed at least 25 gallon buckets stacked outside of the shop. I ask my cow walker, and he tells me that a septic tank overflowed, and he and my boss scooped up the excess and put it in those buckets, point three months before. So the buckets sat there until the end of the summer, fermenting into an ice sheet beer with a hint of tampons and disposable wipes, until my boss had the great idea to say hey let's entlin. Go to that empty lot we have, dig a hole with the backhoe, and empty those buckets into the hole. Notice I said empty the buckets, not dump the buckets in the hole, but open them up and pour them out by hand. We had no safety equipment to be handling waste unless you count rubber gloves, so I took my time digging the hole hoping to waste enough time so I could go home, but my boss came to the site and delivered the buckets to me. The first bucket I open, sheet sprays on my arm and I get pissed. I kicked the bucket into the hole, cleaned up, and immediately contacted OSHA. OSHA came in a couple weeks later and made him change tons of illegal and unsafe work conditions, while my boss had no idea why someone would ever report him. Point TLDR boss asked me to stand on a deck to balance the weight while it was being moved, and, years later, asked me to empty 5 gallon buckets of sheet brew into a hole. I used to work at a local burger joint. Good food, 
crazy boss. Sometimes he was okay to be around, but he was probably the most scattered individual I have ever met in my life. He would multitask on things, and get distracted, and do something else constantly. I was originally a cashier there for about a year, because I was bored doing the same job every day, with no raise, I asked to be trained on assembly line, and for a raise, they only paid me 50 cents more an hour, and only when I was working assembly they were cheap, I never called in sick or been late. They agreed point, so the assembly person in the morning, has prep to do before we open. We have to bread all the onion rings, pickle chips, fill up all the sauce cups, make sure our station is stocked etc. This restaurant also had a food truck, when the truck guys were there one of them had to handle the slicer, to cut all the tomatoes, cheese, onions, lettuce, etc. Point we needed the store slash truck. But when the truck guys were not there, it is the assembly person's job point first morning I had to work without the truck guys. My crazy hard to get her attention of manager is working there. Great, so I have no clue how to use this thing. It says right there on the label that every employee has to be properly trained before using this equipment. So I ask my manager to teach me. He keeps saying in a minute. After I do this. So I did everything else I had to get done in the meantime. It is almost a hour before opening and the asshole still has not showed me sheet. So one of the Mexicans who didn't speak very good English showed me, and he was a fry guy, so he didn't really know either. If I had got hurt on that slicer it would be a damn lawsuit, I heard other employees have got hurt using it, after I left that job. It is really dangerous, if you don't know what you are doing. The last two weeks of my time in tech school, for graphic design, I asked my instructor, we'll call her Maggie, what help the school provides for job placement. I was willing to take anything I could get as long as it was in the field. Maggie looked at me with a bit of bewilderment, and told me she'd get back to me point upon graduating. Maggie told me, that she has an opportunity for me with a small company, that was local point red flag hash one I went with my instructor, to meet the company owner, we'll call him Doug, at his mom's massage parlor. Doug wasn't available, so he had his mother do the interview, being right of the only post secondary school at the time, I thought this was a good idea, I got the job, and was told to report to the office the following week point red flag hash 2 when I arrived at the office, I found that it was Doug's mom's house. Doug told me, that he was a struggling entrepreneur, but had a great idea, to start a print shop. My role was to be his propris designer. Red flag hash 3 Doug started going over his expectations of me, and told me, that he wasn't looking for me to be an employee, but a partner in the startup. We would share the profits and rent out a small office in the back of his buddies up store. For those of you that are still following, this means that he wasn't obligated to pay me. At this point I figured, ah, what the hell. I've got nothing better to do today. Let's see where this goes. Red. Flag hash 4 I design a few really tacky posters and business cards. Based on some instructions from Doug as a test of my abilities. I found out at the end of the day, that these tests were being emailed to his friends for free as a way for him to get future business I later found out that Doug was a close friend of Maggie's, when he slipped up, and mentioned it to me point I never went back after that day, thank god I didn't sign anything point tldr, my tech school instructor proudly walked me into a job for her friend without pay, he tested my skills, by having me design free stationery for his friends. I walked away after day one. About 10 years ago, I worked at an extremely busy old navy that was overrun by rude customers and burnt out employees. Rude as in, they would pick up an item of clothing, decide they didn't want it, and then drop it on the floor instead of putting it back on the rack point during my first day on the job. My manager instructed me to clean up the women's bathing suit department. When I arrived there I discovered a massive pile of bathing suits on the floor, at least 4 feet x 4 feet, and about a foot deep. Between the straps, hangers, and tags, everything was a jumbled mess. If you tried to pick up one item, at least 5 more came with it point I had to sort through this mess, trying to organize the bathing suits by color, style, and size as I hung them back up. I wasn't allowed to sit or kneel as I did this, my manager insisted that I squat in an uncomfortable position, which looked more professional, but made my back ache, after about 10 minutes, 
Throughout the entire ordeal, I was occasionally approached by customers who would reach into the pile, grab a random bikini top and ask, do you have matching bottom in size 12? At one point, a child, who had gotten bored while her mother was shopping, approached the pile and started searching for matching tops and bottoms as a way to pass the time. My manager yelled at me for soliciting help from customers. After several back-breaking hours, my task was finally complete. At the very bottom of the pile, I found a single chicken nugget. I used to live in Wii, work third shift, and we had a serious snowstorm coming up. I lived way out in the country, and I told my boss, if it got too bad I wasn't going to be able to come in. He was understanding about it seeing as I was working third shift 6 days a week and second shift for him on my one day off. I was promised it was going to be only 2 months. I was at a year and a half at that point. Well it got like really bad. At the factory where I worked, in the cafe on site, it was up past the second floor. We had 16 foot drifts at my house. One of those drafts buried my truck and my front door. Plus back where I lived clothes world not get to the main road let alone my back road for about 2 days. It took a day and a half for them to plow the road by the factory point however, my boss calls less than 3 hours after it stops snowing, bright and early, and not anywhere near my shift. You need to come into work and open the cafe for me, I'm snowed in. I told him, I currently was trying to find out what drift I parked my truck under yesterday, and most of the roads by me were under 2-3 to three feet of snow. His response to that was, if the cafe is not open by the time I get there, you are fired. Because everyone else that he called told him no, I get to be this person, great. I'll let him know what he could do with that job, the proceeded to find my truck, unbury it, borrow neighbor's plow attachment, and make lots of money plowing driveways for the next couple weeks tldr, big blizzard, can't leave house, boss tells me to get to work or be fired. Half a story about my experience, and half about a poor old cleaning lady point tldr, bartender always overserved people, and I had to clean up the mess. Cleaning lady had to do it once and quit the next day point my parents owned a bar a bit back and there was this one bartender that used to scream and yell at me. I was working 6 days a week through my junior slash senior year in high school. I typically bar backed and I'd always stock the bar as much as possible then use the downtime to do my homework at the podium near the entrance. There was a maritime school down the road, so we set up a $2 pitch a night, in hindsight, that was probably not a good idea, and she would always way over serve people. I took it in stride for a bit, and simply mentioned, that she had a tendency to over serve to my parents. This bartender made us tons of money, so they were kind of lenient, in telling her about it. It finally got to the point, where I was sick of cleaning the bathrooms. One night, the bouncer comes up to me and tells me they're puke all over the walls in there and a pair of sheet soaked boxes on the floor. I had finally had it and went outside where my father was talking to his friend and pulled him aside. I told him there was no way I'm cleaning the bathroom for the umpteenth time and he said I'll talk to her about it, just let the morning cleaning lady take care of it. I agreed point the next morning, my dad gets a call from the cleaning lady. The puke had dried to the walls, and she had to use a spatula to scrape it off. Needless to say, she said there was no way she would ever do that again, and gave her resignation point the bartender was much better about how much she served from there on out. My very first job was at a Target store and I began work as a cashier. After I realized cashiering was not for me, I saw that the guys who brought the shopping carts and always seemed to be having a fun time. I asked what they did, and it seemed equally easy, so I decided to ask if I could move to that position and be a cart attendant. After a few weeks of pushing carts around I realized that there was a ranking system that regimented how much respect one was allowed. The cart attendant was the least respected employee. Still, I got to pal around and felt a bit like an underdog until they decided only one cart attendant working at a time was allowed. Still I did my job without hesitation. One day there was a team meeting before the store opened, and one of the team leaders was explaining how we needed to give more effort and someone made a wise crack about the cart attendants. After the comment was made the team leader explained that even cart attendants work hard. I was in a what the fuck moment as this was normally a guy I felt respected everyone. 
After the meeting he asked me to come with him, so I did. He guided me into the women's restroom to show me that a piece of sheet was lying on the floor and asked me to pick it up. I told him I didn't have any gloves and it wasn't my turn to clean the restroom. This guy, again whom I respected, picked up the piece of sheet with his bare hand and said see even the team leaders help out, if I can do it so can you. At that point I decided that retail wasn't for me. Well this one doesn't fall under the vomit, sheet, and rotten meat categories, but it's the one thing that I think I've been asked to do for work that I found unreasonable, but also sad point I do quite a bit of work in the wills, trusts, and estates arena. Usually, this simply means crafting clever documents and properly orienting someone's assets and affairs to reflect their wishes after they've passed away. It isn't glamorous, but it is something I do, so whatever, I feel good when the day is done point however, a month's back, an emergency hit the office. A woman had come in, who just found out that she had an atrociously aggressive form of cancer. Worried that some unscrupulous relatives would inherit her belongings, rather than those she cared for most, she engaged my firm to plan her estate point whelp. Later that night she slipped into a coma. I'm not sure if she was put into it chemically or what, but she was left unconscious. This event forced us to toss everything aside and focus all of our minds on her. Well, needless to say, we put together some extraordinary documentation for her and got everything lined up for her to sign point she woke up about one and a half days after she slipped into the coma. She was lucid, clear thinking, and seemed scared. But we put on the brave face, and we took care of everything she asked point it should go without saying, but we don't really do this that often, and as a result, I was both unprepared and out of my element sitting in a hospice wing. Two days after everything had been signed, notarized, and otherwise completed, I was asked to run up to the hospital she was in and give her the final copies. Duplicates were given to other people but whatever, I went up there, really just wanting to get in and out, as that day was my birthday point whelp, I went up and saw her in the room, walked in with the intent to just drop off the package, say a kind word or two, and be on my way. But when I arrived, I found that all her friends had scattered to grab a quick bite, they'd been by her side for days, perhaps since she knew she was alone, and sensed something that I didn't, she asked me to stay. I obliged, and together we made small talk about the weather, eventually moving on to the things she liked and loved about the city, and other such superfluous topics as I was asking her about something or other, she cut me off, lightly moved her hand over mine, and looked me in the eyes. We both got quiet for a bit, and then she asked me to give her a smile. I obliged point she smiled back, said thank you, and then closed her eyes she passed away with her hand in mine. I stayed there, quiet and in shock, until the doctors rushed in. I just slipped into the corner of the room, and stayed there until the commotion died down about 20 odd minutes later the friends and family showed up, and I fumbled through what happened, escaping to the subway the first chance I could. I didn't go back to work for a few days and nearly drank myself to death that night, not saying a word to any of my friends out celebrating my birthday point all in all. In a way, I resented her. I think it unreasonable, unfair, to choose me to die in front of, like some sort of odd performance art. But this is how I deal with sheet I guess that's my story. Whatever. Edit. I know she was looking for help. I do have compassion, and I think about her more than I could care to admit. Point the thing I suppose I forgot to mention is that she was young, only slightly older than myself, and it scared me to my core. Life can be quite difficult, and in a way, I had to process that her making me understand the frailty of life when I was there to be a postman shocked me in a way I internalized as unreasonable point I know it's selfish to have this view, and I was never anything short of kind to her, but that's the effect of fear. Being told on multiple occasions to get metal shopping carts in the middle of a thunderstorm, even after repeated factually accurate statements like, if you can hear thunder even with no clouds around then lightning can reach you, and the more obvious one of metal plus lighting minus anything tall around, to redirect the charges means increased chance that you're the target. And on top of that being told to wipe down every shopping cart taken out of the rain brought under the overhang. 
before bringing back in the store, while being expected to also maintain bagging duties with no help slash extra staff called in, and carry out some bathroom checks, and jump on register, if it gets busy, which you can never get away from for a solid 30 minutes, and then after all that being yelled at that the cart's are low. There was also the occasional floor spill during a rush period up front and them watching me go back to clean it up and still repeatedly calling me over the intercom to come up and help with the rush, which you can't leave spills unattended. There was also carts to consider during a rush while you were thrown on register in the first break in the madness you rush out to get them making eye contact with the front end. Office watching the whole thing while they twiddle their thumbs waiting for lotto people. And when you finally come back, in getting yelled at for not sticking around the cashiers more for bagging, while being told you never told anyone where you went, and we have been calling you for the record the store was always understaffed we would regularly have one register open morning and night midday two registers and three during the peak four hours, and regardless of the fact that there was only ever one. Bagger on staff during all of those hours the bagger was responsible for picking up all the slack register and cartwise. When I first started working for this one photography company I was asked to go on a weekend trip to photograph a chill in competition. They didn't tell any of the staff to bring blankets or pillows or that we would have to share beds. Mind you there were 8 women crammed into a 3 bedroom condo. Two girls shared the couch, myself and another girl shared a full, another set of girls shared another full and the last two had twin mattresses. Our male counterparts were all put up in a hotel with their own individual beds. That Saturday morning we were out of the condo by 6am and proceeded to work for 18 hours with minimal breaks or periods to sit. I was situated directly behind the main stage photographing the groups as soon as they walked off the stage, which was horrible planning as the girls were sweaty, some injured and almost all dry heaving and trying to catch their breath. The music was so loud I was having to use body language to direct the groups of sometimes 30 age groups ranging from 3 to 4 years old to college level. At one point a college age girl came up to me after the shot and asked me if I was deaf since I wasn't speaking. Um, no. I just was trying not to lose my voice from screaming over music all day. The next day they spent 30 minutes teaching me how to use a heat press to make products before the swarm of groups started making orders. I had never done this before and ended up working for 7 hours without a break with people screaming because I was messing up orders all whilst burning myself repetitively and shaking uncontrollably from the stress and exhaustion. It was completely insane and I ended up outside chain smoking and crying from the stress. During that weekend four of us ended up taking breaks to cry from the exhaustion and stress that was put on us. Not to mention the owners of the company were blatantly drinking on the job and having no facts to give while the rest of us were miserable. TLDR got sent on company trip and worked 18 hours one day, 15 hours the next with minimal breaks and was required to learn how to use all the equipment on the spot while my bosses got drunk. I work at a flower shop and one of the things we do is wrap these huge floral arrangements up and cellophane with a box on the bottom to make it easier for customers to drive with these bigger arrangements in their car. One day a customer we've never seen before, this place is mostly regulars, comes in, picks the most expensive arrangement, $250 and huge, asks me to wrap it then goes and pays. Fine. I wrap it, slap some bows on it, tell him it's ready. He asks me to deliver it to some lady. I tell him, sorry deliveries are done for the day it'll have to wait till tomorrow. This 6 feet 1 man then tells me, a 22 year old, 4 feet 11 girl, that I have to get in his car, carry it up to a woman's apartment, where the elevator isn't working, because he paid $250 for it, and has back pains I tell him, sorry we don't offer services like that, and his delivery will have to wait till tomorrow. He then offers me $50 to do it. I start to get nervous and tell him he needs to speak to my manager if this is really that important. He then offers me $100 so I nope away from this man and into the back area which is no customers allowed. He follows me back there, increasing his offer to $150, then $200, then $300. He is now offering me more to get into his car and deliver a floral arrangement for more than he paid for the actual arrangement. I call the manager's desk from the phone in the back 
Tell him to get there now and keep my distance from the customer. My manager comes, takes the customer back out to the front, loads his arrangement into his truck, and tells the customer never to come back. Point customer comes back two weeks later and repeats the whole process again. I used to work in home healthcare in a care driving role. I had this 17 year old autistic client that still wore diapers, was nonverbal, and was highly aggressive. I was one of the very few CNAs that actually agreed to work with the client, despite the aggression. I later learned that, out of my company, only two CNAs ever stayed there for longer than two weeks, me, and the guy who got fired for doing cocaine point even though I still have physical scars from that job, I maintain 100% that the client was not the issue. His freaking grandmother was. My job as a CNA slash home health aide was to take care of my client's activities of daily living. That is to say, making sure he was able to eat, changing his diapers, giving him his showers, making his bed, and etc. Point his grandmother decided that really I was a maid and that I needed to do her laundry, her dishes, clean the entire house, run errands, and a lot of other various things. This was my first job in years, and I didn't want to lose it, so I just went with it. I was using my personal vehicle to drive my client around to parks and to the store to get things for her and was occasionally given $5 for gas. When my client destroyed the headliner in my car, she said my company would have to take care of it. I told my company about it and they came up with some BS paper that I should have signed before driving my client around when in the past they had yelled at me for refusing to drive my client and never mentioned the paper and claimed that they weren't liable because it wasn't signed. They then continued to insist I continue to drive around for them point I made it clear at this point that I would no longer use my vehicle. Okay, they said, use the grandmother's vehicle. One day when picking up the grandmother's medicine, I decided to stop for my lunch. When I got to her house, she freaked out on me for using her car for doing her personal things. Ugh. This is when I finally had it, told her off, and called my company, and said I'm done. Oh, and that's not even mentioning the overpass deal I had with them. I worked 9A to 9P on weekends, and my client's insurance approved him for 24-hour care. So I came up with an agreement that I'd sleep on their couch or in their second home next door and come over first thing in the morning as long as I remained on the clock. One night, my client woke up and began flinging poop everywhere while I was asleep on their couch. I didn't wake up, but she did, and she didn't bother to wake me up. When I finally did wake up the next morning, I was yelled at for not getting up the second it happened, using my psychic powers I presume, and she wrote on my timesheet that I fell asleep on the job. So all of my night time hours for that weekend were now null, and the director of nursing yelled at me and threatened disciplinary action on my license if I slept while I was there again, even though the original agreement was for me to sleep there overnight. The Don said, if I was getting paid, I had to be awake, but I could still spend the night if I clocked out. Yeah right, that's going to happen. This whole nighttime day barkle was about a month before I finally had it point this job only paid $8 slash HR, and according to old cowhawkers, still does 5 years later. Not nearly enough money for that kind of bullshit. Alright this happened last Sunday, I work at a banquet hall for the last few years now as a server, and have worked my way up to slacker anyways the boss is apposheet crazy, love it, and the staff is a bunch of bananas and dumb sluches, I say this all jokingly and lovingly, there really is no other way to describe my staff though, Ena who are one banquet hall has been getting leaks from the roof, and has been leaking into the hall, so anyone would get it fixed right, no my bosses. Very different in the way he goes about fixing things now his idea is to go up into the ceiling and just use a shop vac for it. A big. Industrial. Shop vacation. This thing gets crazy heavy when you just vacuum sheet in it and he wants to vacuum something as heavy as water. Now you need to realize this is a hall. So the ceilings are pretty high above us. So of course we need a ladder. And of course we don't have a ladder that reaches the ceiling point what we do have though is a lot of tables so at this point, it's up to the head chef, who's Portuguese and half retarded I'd say, and myself to put a ladder on top of a table. And he has to climb up with said shop vac point now as I said before, the shop vac is very heavy. 
So what do we have to do? We find a nice strong electrical wire. Cut it. Wrap it around. Throw it over the rafters and pulley this beach up point now this whole story seems fun and hilarious, but as it went on, my girlfriend was able to take a snapshot point, so I present to you Reddit, my regular Sunday. I know a lot of people wouldn't find this odd, but I drive a taxi on weekends. The company is made up of, and advertised as all our drivers being EMT slash paramedic slash police slash firefighters as that is where we get them all from, when we aren't busy working other stuff. I have a lot of people ask me to buy them drugs. I find it rather odd that, if they were smart enough to find our website or card, that they wouldn't realize it was a bad idea, to ask us to buy stuff for them. I always just say no and drive them home, but I make a mental note, of who the crazy ones are for later. Honestly I have no idea where I would even go for them if I did want to help them out. Usually the drug of choice is marijuana which really isn't that big of a deal. It's just still illegal in our state, so I can't let it happen. Other times I've been offered stuff as a tip. I once had a guy try to give me heroin and was invited to use meth while I was still on the job. I find these people rather odd. I'd imagine this stuff is really expensive to begin with, but usually these people are blitzed out of their mind when I pick them up. Not everyone, just this particular demographic. So I suppose that makes their logic make sense point people offer to buy me beer all the time while I'm driving too. That is always amusing. I drop off groups at bars a lot and they ask me to come in with them and have a drink. I don't think they understand the concept of a taxi yet. Ah, I used to work at the world's largest non-profit community center slash swim and gym. Well, one day this 15 year old girl came for our youth government program absolutely piss drunk. She was faking out man. The custodian found me, I was the night manager, and told me there was a little girl violently vomiting in the bathroom. I went in there, after it was cleared of course, and found this girl sitting against the wall choking on her own puke. So I helped her, naturally. The desk wasn't responding to my walkie talkie calls to call her parents, so I called from my cell phone. Let me put this in perspective, I'm in a freaking metal band and see people drunk daily this girl was drunker than any drunk ever drank. I had to help her vomit, got puked on a little and hold her head up so she didn't choke she could barely say her own name. Long story short, her parents came, were extremely grateful to me, said thank you, and apologized profusely for the debacle, to which I responded to not worry, we are here for our youth, and I'm glad she ended up here where we could help her instead of at home alone. Point the next day, my boss called me into a meeting with her and the director of youth development and they were infuriated that I didn't allow my underling, the teen leader, who was dealing with 70 plus other kids rig to handle it instead of me, so she could take credit and offer the girl new programs to ultimately spend money on. I'm not exaggerating, they were literally pissed because I handled the situation, since I'm the night manager in charge of I dunno, our kid safety, they ask me to next time, walk by, just walk away, find a leader who can connect with the youth, to build a connection to offer them new programs, and forget about it the parents came, and told me that they called them, and apologized that I handled the situation, and were connected to a teen leader who tried to get money out of them for programs. They cancelled their membership, and brought me a nice suite of gifts, they were itch. I told them what happened on my end, and they told me I should consider quitting point I quit a month later. That was single handedly the most disgusting thing I have ever been asked to do and reprimanded for, especially being a community center and non profit aimed at youth development. This summer I took a part time sales job at a major electronics retail store in the computer and tablets area. I'm in college, so it was seasonal. They hired about three people. Upon being hired I was told to be impartial and helpful, that's why I was being paid a salary and not commission point fast forward 2 months. This store was historically around number 250-300 in the nation, but the month before they hired, helped they jumped to top 10, and after hiring, fell back to where they normally were. The managers of the place proceeded to call all seasonal employees into their office. When I got called in, I was told I was doing a crap job because I wasn't selling enough premium computers. Excuse me? I thought I was supposed to be helpful and provide the customer what they need, like you told me. 
No. You need to upsell premium computers. We make no money on those crap ones. I was then told that from now on I had to write down every interaction I had throughout the day, including everything they were potentially buying, and a breakdown of the financing options down to the minimum payments every month. I would then have to hand all these papers over to management at the end of the day to be approved, and if they saw problems I would get written up. I happened to ask who was doing this now my manager goes well you and Jeb, another seasonal hire. CJ, the other seasonal, doesn't work here enough to justify that, and I trust everyone else. I work one more day, quit, and found a full-time job that pays more, and has more stable managers TLDR I worked for a major electronics chain, and was told by my manager that only two people in the store had to write down every interaction throughout the day and lie about being fair and impartial to upsell computers to old ladies and children. I worked at an ice cream store when I was 17. The owner and his manager wife often left me alone to run the shop when I wasn't allowed to handle cash at the cash register. Said owner would watch his employees, another new hire girl and I, on his cameras and call us on the store phone if it looked like we didn't do something right x. Too many sprinkles on a cone. Too many kokido pieces on the soft serve. Scoops of ice cream were too big. Guy was a huge cheapskate. He underserved the portions and jacked the prices. Owner also took taxes off our paychecks that didn't add up to the proportionate time we worked. He was eventually caught by the other girl's mother. He was also a graduate student at the time and would often call me over to ask me what so and so meant in his textbook. Then he would proceed to tell me that he would give me his shop one day. So creepy. Owner's wife accused me of stealing some ice cream yogurt bags once because their inventory didn't match up. I have no reason to take large bags of liquid. I don't have an ice cream machine. It made no sense, but this accusation continued for months, and she liked to watch me closely. Point owner liked to go across the street to his competition to observe their prices. He was banned from that store, but he'd bribe people to go in there for him and report their prices and portions to him. Anyways, I stopped working there after a couple of months and he refused to give me my last paycheck. They threatened my mother over the phone when she asked about it, and the owner's wife proceeded to bash me, calling me a thief, and threatening to call the police over the phone lol. Owner also threatened that he had lawyer friends if we didn't stop bothering him. Then, my dad went over there personally with my brother and I, and demanded the money, threatening to call our lawyer on him. Owner eventually spat out a paycheck with a couple of hundred dollars more than my hours worked asked for fact that guy point edit, grandma. I was employed as an ed administrator for a small company that does sales, maintenance, installations, etc. Point for small businesses. Our biggest customer was a 50 person insurance company in the CBD. Their server room had no account, and so the room got uncomfortably warm. My bright spark of a boss is always keen to make a dollar, and so why outsource something you can do for yourself? So he buys an R2D2 style air conditioner, portable unit, that has an 8 inch exhaust tube coming out the back. I get to work on this day, and says I'd like you to visit, redacted today. There's a portable air con there, that I'd like you to set up. Take the ladder and the toolbox. I was conflicted. I'm not a small man and most ladders are not prepared for my weight. Still, I figured surely it's not rocket science and the ladder is new, not old and rusty points so I visited and had a look. Very quickly, I discovered that there was nowhere to send the exhaust. I cut a hole in a ceiling tile but where next? There's an account condit there, but I don't know if it's a sucker or blower, and I do know that feeding unexpected hot air into either condit may upset the system. I called the boss. He said it didn't matter. Just use the tin snips to cut a hole and stick it in. I refused to modify a building account and ended up leaving it blowing the hot air into the ceiling cavity. Then I discovered that this R2 does not have a built-in means of dealing with condensation water. Just a drain pipe. So, I can't have water running across the floor of the server room. So I visited one of the very few hardware stores in the CBD, bought a bucket and some adhesive plastic loops to hold the water pipe in place. When I left, I showed the it staff the bucket and said okay, I'm not sure how long this is going to take to fill, so keep an eye on it. When it reaches the one half full point, go empty it. Yes, 
carry a half full bucket of water about 30 meters through an office to the sink. When I got back to my office, I asked the boss what I was supposed to do with the drain pipe. Oh, you expected me to take a masonry drill and bore a hole from the inside of a major commercial building to the outside. Aside from that probably being a violation of the customer's lease and several building and OHS codes, particularly of the ones involving electrical cables running inside the wall I'm drilling. Redacted do you know that when you bore masonry clean through, a piece of concrete typically chips off the outside and falls? 14 floors, down onto people sitting at tables having their lunch? He pretty much ignored me and kept doing whatever he was doing point later when a similar situation arose at a customer site. He wanted me to bore an outward hole to pass a wifi cable. I just reminded him of those considerations and flatly refused. He took it in his stride and did it himself point for someone with a diploma of electrical engineering. He's a faking cowboy. At a different site, he mounted an external directional antenna, extending the network to a couple of portable classrooms on the eaves of a school right next to the announcement bullhorn. I had to visit the site later to do some maintenance and the customer said ever since, redacted, put in the antenna, the bullhorn has been buzzing. I think it's related, I'm not sure if it's to my credit or not, that I bit my tongue and didn't tell the customer of course it faking is, it's like sitting your mobile phone on top of your computer speakers. Instead I just said oh, I'm not sure. I'll ask, redacted, when I get back to work. Naturally he just shrugged one shoulder and kept working. I worked at a toy store in the downtown area of my city. Locally owned, popular place. The only catch was the building across the street. It used to be a hotel, but had been converted to housing slash treatment for mentally ill and physically handicapped individuals, mostly war vets with PTSD or other issues. Most of them were really awesome. A few were real hassles one guy was pretty infamous. I never actually got his name, but let's call him Frank. He was wheelchair bound, but his mind seemed pretty good. It was mostly physical issues he dealt with. He had been trouble before, but nothing major. The biggest issue was he kept one of those hospital style cups for patients to pee in hanging on the back of his wheelchair and it usually had pee in it. The smell was pretty terrible point he rolled into the toy store one day, just myself and an older woman working the register, and started browsing. He found his way to our musical section. It had child sized instruments and such. Miniature pianos, slide whistles, etc. He took a liking to this tiny red piano and decided to buy it. I brought it up to the counter for him and he purchased it. $60 or so. Then the weirdness began point he explained that he lived in an apartment building down the road, not the hotel as we had assumed. He needed someone to help him get back home with his new purchase. My coworker volunteered me as the poor soul to carry this guy's toy piano back to his apartment point off we went, Frank slowly rolling along and myself following alongside him. It was just after New Year's in the Midwest, so it was pretty cold, but I was alright. The first difficult part was when we saw a young woman walking her dog. Frank commented to me, oh, look at that cute dog, Jai. He then started whistling. This poor girl probably thought this creepy old guy was trying to hit on her, while some weird guy next to him carried a child's piano for an unknown reason. I can't imagine how uncomfortable that was for her. I just smiled sheepishly and said happy new year. She hurried by and we continued, eventually reaching the building point it was a dump. Four units inside. He stopped before the main door and started digging for his keys. I stood, awkwardly, holding this puny red piano and a small plastic bag of groceries he had asked me to carry along the way. After some time, he decided he didn't have his keys on him. Frank then asked me to go into the building and ring the three other units to see if someone could open the door for him. As I stood there, I started to freak out. I was cornered and alone with this man. What if he was less mentally stable than he appeared? What if he pulled a weapon? How long till my elderly coworker started to worry? Perhaps that was too quick of a judgment and a stereotypical one at that, but still. I was concerned point Frank decided he had left his keys at the shops. I asked him what to do with his piano and groceries. He told me to leave them by the side of the building. I thought I had misheard him. Surely a $60 piano was not something to just leave outside in the cold and snow. And it's bright red. 
Someone will spot it and take it. Frank assured me, just leave it. So I did. His purchase, his property to lose now point the worst part happened now. He had not attached his leg supports to his wheelchair before we left. They were at the coffee shop next door, as he was planning on returning, after we dropped off the piano. His legs, however, were getting tired. He was able to hold them up on the way to the apartment, but he didn't think he could for the trip back point, so I had to alternate. Half the time I was pushing the wheelchair, the aforementioned cup of urine a foot below my nose. The other half of the time, I was in front of him, holding up his legs, so they wouldn't drag on the ground as he wheeled himself along, uncomfortably doubled over, and shuffling backwards down the street. Thank goodness there wasn't anyone else on the road, or I have no idea what they would have thought, or how I would have reacted. Point we made it back to the stores. We went to the coffee shop so he could get his leg supports, and, after the keys failed to be located, used the business's phone to call someone with a spare key. I stopped next door to tell my coworker I was alright and how strange this all had been. I then went back to Frank. The key was coming, but that piano was sitting outside the building. I asked what he wanted to do point, and so he said, well, there's another way into my apartment. You just need to shimmy up the drain pipe. At that point, I was done. There was no way I was going to that length for this guy. So I said, I'm sorry sir, but I'm not about to do that. He was upset, but I wasn't going to deal with it. Our left point he never came back. I never found out what happened to that piano. I worked for a moving company one summer during my college years. They were pretty unethical overall but one day stood out among the others. The previous day the truck driver had gotten injured. The doctor put him on some pretty epic pain meds and told him point blank he wasn't fit to operate a tanker truck, much less a 20 ton semi. The driver told management this, including the signed doctor's note clearly stating he was impaired, and their response was too bad, you're driving too, 80 miles away today. Guess who was on that truck's crew that day, well, surprise surprise, the driver got into an accident. Thankfully nobody was hurt, but the trailer was damaged pretty badly. It was no longer safe to tow and it definitely wasn't fit to hold a customer's entire household's worth of possessions. We snapped pictures of the accident and sent them back to management, explaining that we could not work in this state. They said to continue onwards anyway with the damaged truck and to park it in such a way that the damage was hidden from the customer later that night. When we were bringing the cargo back to the warehouse, the trailer began to fall apart. Bits and pieces were flying off as we drove down the highway, and more than once a car behind us had to swerve to avoid all the debris. By the time we made it home the trailer had no roof left, and only half of its walls my first action, after getting back to the warehouse, was to unload on the boss and quit. He only responded whatever, pick your check up Friday. I was a 14 years old stock boy at an appliance store. One of our sales was that, if you bought a new appliance you got a free watermelon. This lasted for two weeks. The watermelons came on a pallet that had a thick cardboard, about 4 feet high, canister on it point by the end of the two weeks the last 6 or 7 watermelons in the canister were now partially squished, some were white, some were black, some were fuzzy, some were jelly, all of them smelled like death. My job was to jump in with them and lift them up, somehow climb back over the side and carry each of them to the trash compactor. I'm proud to have finished the job, but the horror, or picking up the first one, that looked like an ice green watermelon, and feeling your hand sink into something soft and fuzzy on the underside, and then the rank smell was traumatic. I couldn't eat watermelons for years, got the smell point they gave me no gloves, apron, etc point and made fun of me, when I asked for some. This is also, when I found out I'm allergic to most molds. I've always avoided penicillin due to both of my parents being allergic, so I got these red hot itchy hives the next day over all soft parts of my skin. Neck, backs of arms, left side of stomach, inner thighs, knee pits that felt like an unreasonable experience for the $5.15 hour I was getting paid. When I was in high school I got hired at a restaurant as an after school job. I ended up working there for several years into college, and would come back and work there during summer breaks. The franchise in question was notorious for manager turnover, and after the first year I don't think we had the same manager for more than 6 months. 
Because the management was terrible, the place went downhill very quickly. There weren't enough employees to cover shifts completely, and so labor was cut back massively. We had very few cooks, not nearly enough to cover all the shifts with more than one, so each cook was usually scheduled for 8 hour shifts alone. Over time, the management gave me more responsibilities and work without even a title change. I was paid minimum wage even after 3 years of work, because I was technically tipped out, but with a severe decline in customers, there was also a severe decline in tips. Also, the cooks were tipped separately from the servers, so we got even less. Through all of this, by the end of the summer I was working the equivalent of three different shifts at once, cook, dishes, and line, to refill the buffet. The franchise manager visited the restaurant near the end of the summer, and while we had few people visit, I never got to speak with him, because I was so busy. When I tried to return to the restaurant the following year, I had been blacklisted from reapplying, because I had shirked duties while cooking. Because I was doing two other jobs that should have been covered by other employees, because my bosses made me do that work, because they knew I needed the money, but wouldn't give me a raise. I worked in a greenhouse with small plants. Right next to it was a stroke of land with a small canal. A lot of greenhouses have that, and it is not uncommon for the owners to have some sheep to keep the grass down and it also looks better with a few sheep walking around. In our coffee break the neighbor comes checking in on us and tells us that one sheep is dead point, so the next thing to do is call a special service to pick up the dead sheep as it is technically bio waste. But our owner is a bit of a cheap man, so he decided that me and two friends who also worked there had to bury the sheep. This would save him a call and the money. So we get some gloves. Luckily there were a few gloves laying somewhere in the greenhouse and go to the sheep. We thought he wasn't dead for very long so me and a friend grab a nice chunk of wool and try to lift it up point we hear a big tear and the sheep falls down leaving us with some wool in our hands and we see the entire inside of the sheep loaded with maggots. It was filled with maggots, maggots every faking where. After a few minutes of gagging we get a cart and try to load the sheep up on the cart. Bear in mind this all just a few feet next to the canal, so we had to watch out. But the sheep is already stiff, so we had to manually break two legs in order to get it on the cart point after that we were digging for nearly two hours. In order to bury it properly we just buried the gloves with it. We didn't really mind doing it, but we really cold become sick from the sheep. It was very irresponsible from the owner. Pretty funny story to tell at parties though. I used to work for a non-profit advocacy organization focused on non-proliferation that wanted to shift from being a policy slash wank type organization to one that specialized in highly visible actions. I was responsible for organizing college students in the northeast. We had a pretty strong network in Boston, but absolutely nothing in New York point I was tasked with getting 20 to 30 college students to be out in front of the Today Show at 5am in the middle of November dressed in superhero outfits, so that we could try and get up as poor messaging on national TV. It was right around the time that Syria agreed to give up their chemical weapon stockpile, and our messaging was even superheroes know when to put down their weapons or something equally as lame a point I was given one part time employee based in New York City to help with outreach, since I worked in DC. The on the ground employee started in mid October, and we had until November 15th to recruit students for the action. In case you aren't aware, organizing like this is based on having strong relationships with people. We were essentially going up to college students and being like hey you interested in a world without WMDs? Yay. Awesome. Do you want to join us in front of the Today Show at 5am in a superhero outfit? You'll be exposed to tons of other great opportunities. No. Okay right on then. That's pretty much how it went for the few weeks we had to prepare. I told my clueless slash ass munching managers that there was no way we were going to be able to pull it off in the time given, and that it was a waste of our time and resources and we would be much better off focusing on basic capacity building. They didn't want to hear it, and waited till the last minute to call it off acting like me, and my one support employee completely faked everything up, and wasted tons of time and money. They fired me a week later TLDR. Working at non-profits isn't what it's cracked up to be, and most managers suck. I was a case manager for a group home, three separate residences, 
comprising 20 children, ages 12 to 17, in foster care. As you might imagine, most minus 98% I would say, had major major behavioral issues and psychiatric issues. The other 2% would just freak out on occasion, to get some attention amid the harangue. I think point I arrived at work as scheduled at 8am on a Friday. At 4.30, as I prepared to leave, I received a call from the house parent at one of the group homes. This particular residence was located 45 minutes away from my office, and an hour and 15 minutes from my home point the house parent informed me that one of the clients was complaining of severe chest pain and claimed to be coughing up blood point with kids in foster care. There are no chances taken. They chip a nail and you take them to the ER. Not because the agency actually cares, but because they are covering their as lest they get an abuse report called into the state and lose their license, that is lose their paychecks. So, with a heavy sigh, I headed out to the residence instead of going home for the weekend. When I got there, I spoke with the child. I knew this child very very well, and I knew she was malingering, faking it. I knew it point, but I couldn't take any chances, right? So we went to the airpoint we arrived at 6pm. She was taken back as outpatient at 7.30 point I sat by her side as the doctors and nurses came in, taking blood, taking temperature, taking blood pressure, sending her off for x-rays, everything point at 4am, they let us go. There was nothing wrong with her. They sent her home with Tylenol. I gritted my teeth and told her I was glad she was okay. I knew she had done it for attention. I took her back home at 4 colon 30 am point I had been up since 6 the previous morning point I began the drive home with an eater of about 6 am point I was 10 miles from my home when my phone rang point it was the same house parent. Now a different child in the home was complaining of chest pains. Delirious with exhaustion, I turned the car around and got back on the highway. I arrived at about 6.30, arrived with the child at the hospital at 7.15, and she was admitted at 8, colon 15 and point the same process. Blood, vitals, questions, and x-rays and nothing absolutely got him nothing wrong. We left the hospital at 2pm on Saturday. No, I'm not exaggerating point at 5pm, I crawled into my bed, having cancelled the date I had scheduled a week before and losing all hope for having any kind of semblance of a social life, now that I was beyond exhaustion, and would need the whole weekend, to recipe before I went in again on Monday, to start all the bullshit again, at 8pm, my phone rang again, it was the house parent, you can guess the rest of the story four different girls, four different trips to the airpoint now, here's where the unreasonable part comes in point throughout this whole process, I'm leaving voice emails on the phones of my supervisors, it's protocol. I also have to write incident reports and send them in. Also protocol. I do both of those things I get about 5 hours of sleep over a 72 hour period point on Monday. I call and say I will be in afternoon. I arrive at 1pm to find my supervisors waiting for me with a write up for coming in late. At 3.30pm, I received yet another call from the same house, alleging chest pains, and I flatly told my supervisors that I would not be going out there and that they would have to call relief staff to attend to the situation. I was given another write-up and told that my attitude was bad and my work ethic was worse this after an already 50-hour work week. A what? I can't even do the math. What? A 60-hour work weekend. So I worked 100 hours that week. That Friday, I submitted my resignation. And somehow, by the grace of God or the flying spaghetti monster, I did not inform them of what massive short-sighted ass stinking piece of sheet cunts they were. And that is the whole story, as they say. These people were the worst people I ever worked for in my life. Point TLDR. Worked as a case manager at a group home. Ended up working a 100 hour week, then getting written up twice for coming in late the following Monday, because I was so exhausted I couldn't drive. I worked for an organization that had a lot of print work done by a local printer in the form of brochures, tickets, programs, etc. We had an event that needed a program, so we contracted the printer, gave them our theme and ideas for the program. They submitted a proof to us, we made a few changes, received an edited proof and docked it for printing point a few days later, when we received the printed programs, the boss boss spotted a few glaring spelling errors, one of which was the boss boss's title. 
This needed to be changed. I advised everyone in our office, looked at the proof and knocked it. We are 100% liable for the prints that we received. Not good enough. We need to have the entire program reprinted. And I was the one that was going to have to make that call point. I think I was 20 at the time and had to tell this poor guy that had been in the print industry for 25 plus years that we need a full reprint on the house. It was one of the most excruciating phone calls I've ever had to make because I hate confrontation and it was firmly my organization's mistake. Apparently they valued our business a lot because they did a full reprint. My supervisor and I felt so bad that we had lunch catered at the printers and went there to hang out with them. That was also painfully awkward for me because I still perceived myself as the as whole. Thankfully they were really cool about it. The caterer also screwed up the food order, so the printer got another free lunch the next day. I work as a pharmacy technician at local retail store. Job isn't exactly rocket science, but this puts the fuel in my tank and the puppy chow in my dog's bowl point now. About me, I've got a good head on my shoulders, but I'm human and sometimes my attention span isn't all that golden. This catches my boss's attention, and for the past 1 to 2 years, I've been kept as a cash register. Sometimes I fill, at others, I credit return medications that have not been picked up. It's all cool point this not so great attention span of mine is there, but of everyone's faking jokes in the pharmacy point however, he's unbearably disrespectful to me. And I understand that I should talk back like the crass second in command chick he gets along with, but that's not me. I'd rather be professional. So I take his sheet like a beach point haha and I have two rather run reasonable things to be asked to do at work. Both have made me break in tears maybe a month or so since doing them point the as once handed me 5 to 6 telephone prescription pads and told me to take them apart and hand them once I'm done. My eyes meet is in one of those you're joking, right? Glances. He's not joking. So I do it and all I can hear is snickers from the peanut gallery. My heart makes a audible crack point, but I refuse to cry or have a tantrum point after this. He then slaps a heaping load of paper pharmacy bags and a glue stick. That sheet eater grins smugly and tells me that every bag in that pile was defective and he was not going to send them back. As he's telling me this, he sets the box that these bags came from. All of these were to be glued point I accept. More gasps and giggles from the box eating. Cunt wipes in the back. No. Tears. Just dreams, says my mind. Of course, this is due to the immense sense of anger and embarrassment point the dam is close to breaking, but I persevere point tldr. A swipe pharmacist boss makes me glue nearly 500 defective bags together and take apart notapods because he's too good to do any of that sheet point p point s. Formatting my tail is hard. Also, sorry for the pity party. I had a job as a homework helper at the city library. My boss, the librarian was asked by a lady to help type an ML up because the lady claimed she had wrist issues and couldn't type. Boss referred her to disabled services, but I guess they had already denied her, so my boss relented and typed her ML up for her as she dictated it. This lady continued to come in and ask my boss to type up emails for her at least on a weekly basis and my boss would do it because she felt bad for her and her sob story needed to communicate with her son and the military though half the time spent with my boss was her talking her ear off eventually my boss got tired of doing it so gave the job to me i'm usually not too busy at my job as there was often no kids to help but it is important i'm available to help kids if they do come in one time the lady came by and began to chat my ear off I started typing her email, and not long after, my boss brings in a teen girl who wants my help. My thought is good, time to drop this lady and help the kid, but my boss just asked the lady I was typing for if it wouldn't take much longer to finish the email, and asked the girl wanting tutoring if she could wait. I tried to finish as quickly as possible, but when I finished and turned around to help the girl she was gone and couldn't be found anywhere in the library. I was pissed point when I told my boss about the girl leaving she was puzzled but didn't bother to change the policy on this lady using us as her personal secretary for two more months. 
after talking to the children's librarian at that site and having her bring it up to my boss a couple times, I was finally allowed to cite policy on my job, being to help patrons do things themselves and not to do things for them. If she needed more help, she would have to work with disabled services to get it. Worked one summer at a computer distribution company. One week, management had a falling out with our vendor, and we couldn't get any of the special chassis we needed for the server builds. So, I was sitting on my, but doing odd jobs all week. But each day they got weirder and weirder. One day my boss, who was also the company's owner, handed me a BB gun, and asked me to take care of the birds that were flying around the warehouse building nests. I explained that I had never fired a gun before, and he calmly replied, I figured. This isn't a gun, it's an airsoft rifle. Whatever. Needless to say, for every 12 I fired, I may be connected once. Thank god it was CO2 cartridge instead of pump, or it would have been quite a lengthy process the last day, before we got our new shipment, in was the weirdest request. He comes over to me as I'm sitting, spinning in the chair. This is the conversation, verbatim, I will never forget it, boss. Hey, you dipping, me, no, sir boss, you can't dip while you're inside, I don't care, if you have a can point me, I don't dip, sir boss, that's great, good to hear, tobacco's a killer, you know, I need you to do something point me, sure point boss, I need you to go wash my car me, okay, do you have any quarters, boss, ah, see, that's the thing, I don't like auto washes, just take the hose from the loading dock and wash it up, Co-worker has a small vacuum for you. Two point me. You want me to vacuum it? Boss. Yeah point me. All right. Boss walks away and then, with the least convincing performance ever, stops and acts like he just remembered something boss. Oh, if you find a little sunglasses case in there, it's yours. Thanks a heap. I'm sure it was pure coincidence I saw him pulled over just down the street from the building that evening when we were all leaving. Not sure who tipped him off, but I ended up flushing the sunglasses. In his head, it was a generous tip. Knowing the trouble I could have gotten into, I vowed that day never to get mixed up in any of that crap again. And to this day I haven't shitty as that was, he was actually a great boss and paid a very respectable wage. Sometimes I catch myself wondering what he's up to these days. My clown shoe boss was dumping illegally in my dumpster. I knew about it. He decides he's going to clean out the basement of his triple decker and completely fill an empty dumpster on a Friday night. Welp. My landlord was remodeling one of the apartments in my building and needed space to put the demoed stuff. Sees it's full and finds a box with my boss's address. Then goes to his house immediately. At 630am on a Saturday point my moron boss calls me at 715a asking me to tell my insanely pissed landlord that I told him it was okay. I look out at the dumpster and see my boss and his crew standing around their trucks looking pissed. Waiting for my boss to either pay for or personally empty the dumpster apparently the landlord was so pissed he actually called the cops. My boss is freaking out. I tell him I'm not going to jeopardize my living situation because he is an idiot. He blamed me and said I actually did give him permission. He kept telling me how much he needed me to take the fall for this. I told him he was overstepping my boundaries and he didn't stop. Kept pushing point I freaked out and stabbed him point kidding. I quit the job and never stood face to face with him again. That sort of self-absorbed nonsense was not worth the $400 a week for a full-time job fuck you, Mike fuck you, and your shitty clothing company. You can go right to hell point fun fact, the second or third result, when you google his name is a story about him getting kicked off warp tour for screwing a 14 yo. He was at least 24 at the time point tldr, go to the damn dump, yeah cheap bastard. When I arrived at work early one day for my internship my boss pulled me aside and said he needed a favor from me. Handing me 7 $100 bills, he told me I'd need to take the express train to New York City to meet one of his business business partners to retrieve some paperwork point he didn't want me to spare any expenses and told me that I should take the Acela Expressway, expensive high speed train, and to valet my car. He told me to call him once I arrived in the city. Once I arrived in the city, my next directions were to head to a specific Starbucks and wait at a table and that his partner would meet me. 
After about 20 minutes, a gentleman in his mid-thirties sat down at my table. Dark sunglasses, baseball hat pulled low, shady looking guy. He confirmed who I was and then slid a thick envelope across the table telling me to put it in my bag and to be very careful with it point the guy left immediately after I put the envelope in my bag. So I went to a bathroom to see what was in it. It was about an inch, inch and a half of $100 bills. I was a bit freaked out because what I had potentially gotten myself into. Of course I didn't charge my phone that morning and my phone died. I spent the rest of the day getting a nice lunch and dinner and took the train back to Philly Point once I got back at the office. I called my boss and put the envelope in the back of one of his cabinets. He was freaking out at me because my phone had died and that he thought something serious had happened to me. He also told me to not tell anyone at the office about what happened and to keep the extra $500 from the trip point I'm pretty sure that I was a mule of some type carrying dollar sign 25k dollar sign 30k cash in my backpack through New York for the day with a dead phone point TLDR as an intern. My boss made me mule dollar sign 30k cash from a shady guy in New York City to our office in Philly. Edit grandma. A W W E A my time to shine point where to begin. Fakin work 76 hours a week at $5 an hour with no overtime. Wasn't an easy job by the. I was a line cook at a fine Italian restaurant point it was an apprenticeship, but it soon was revealed to be a full-time job. I started with pantry stuff and the chef was there the first couple days to help me out, but it turned out he was pretty lazy and would skip most of the day. I get that to an extent that he doesn't need to be there the full shift, but he'd generally show up in the morning, sit in the office, leave for downtime, show up again for the dinner rush, and wait in the office again, unless we had a rush at me and the other cooks, who were there 6 out of 7 days for 12 hours at least, couldn't handle, in which he would eventually help out point, but I can't really hate on the chef that much, he had a good heart. It was the owner who was a scumbag point I really do feel bad describing him. He's a stereotypical sleazy Iranian, which I didn't even realize was a stereotype until after I met the guy. Round, greasy slicked back hair, shirt button just one button to low, with sunglasses hanging down the V, always grinning like he's better than the world. Egg point anyways, he was the one employing me for what turned out to be a terrible wage. It wouldn't have been so bad if I was actually shadowing somebody, but I really wasn't. I was working full time, desperately trying to scrape off what little info I could from the Spanish speaking cooks, who did more than a fantastic job, while also keeping up and running a pantry and part of the line with literally no prior cooking experience. Now, the owner pays only two people a reasonable wage. The chef, who got paid a salary, and the bartenders, who make minimum wage plus tips. The servers all got paid 2.17 an hour plus tips to meet minimum wage, and the cooks and dishwashers were all illegal immigrants, so they got paid whatever the owner wanted to pay them. I really shouldn't complain, because whatever I complain about, I guarantee they got much worse point, but I'll tell my side of the story anyways. Basically, since I wasn't getting minimum wage and I wasn't being paid overtime, the owner couldn't legally pay me with a W-2. So at the last second, literally April 25th, I think that's tax day, he hands me a 10 to 99 which is a form for commission work. Basically it meant that all the work I had done was by commission, which is false, because I had set hours to come in and leave work, wasn't paid for anything over that time, and wasn't paid on the work, but rather the hours I was scheduled. And there were plenty of times where I had to stay several hours over closing. Didn't get paid for any of those point oh. It also meant that I had to pay all work related taxes myself point now. Since I wasn't getting paid that much and I had to make several work related purchases. Including but not limited to a $200 knife. Which is awesome. But way out of an 18 year old's budget. I was hardly meeting rent. Wait. What? I was working 76 hours a week. With almost no guidance by the chef that was supposed to be apprenticing me, and I was walking out with no cash in my pocket? Hell, I was concerned as to whether or not I was going to default on the apartment. I tell my boss that I'd filed the taxes, I really filed for a delay, didn't tell him, because I didn't want him to get pissed, and call my mom for guidance. 
she basically called the Texas Workforce Association who told her that this 10 to 99 bullshit was surprisingly common, but very illegal among restaurants. She called the owner and talked very politely about her confusion with the whole ordeal, while innocuously dropping the name Texas Workforce Association in the conversation, God bless you mother. He calls me in a day later, beaches me out about lying to him, and then a few days afterward presents me with a W-2 and says that he'll have to cut my hours down to 40 a week because he can't afford to pay me overtime. A day later, on my birthday, I quit. Best birthday gift I ever got point I could stayed. Honestly, the 40 hours a week deal was pretty solid, even working at a fast paced high quality restaurant like that for minimum wage. But that restaurant was my life. Literally, I woke up, went to work, went home, and slept. That was my social time, my leisure time, everything. I had nothing else. To try to change that to a job and maintain a life outside of it would be like trying to change the love of your life to a casual acquaintance. It just doesn't work. Not afraid to admit I cried multiple times during this whole ordeal point. Before moving back home for a bit, I revisited the restaurant and the chef. Easily ended up being one of the most melancholy moments of my life thus far. The chef told me I was probably best suited towards another line of work. Thanks, Pier. I do miss the cooks though. I love those guys I guess this doesn't really fit in with the prompt, but it feels good to share it. I've got a few more stories from that whole year if anyone's interested, including almost getting hit by a car crash, not having power for a full month, and literally walking 2 miles in a snowstorm with the flu on Christmas day to get food. I worked as the night manager at a cafeteria in a university dorm. We used a closing checklist with spots to initial and timestamp next to each item, so my crew completed a task I would mark it off with my name and the current time. Every night, my final task was to take the elevator down to the loading dock, empty our garbage and recycling bins, then lock the elevator on the way out. One week there was some construction in the basement near our elevator, so our facilities manager took our elevator offline for that week. On our log sheet, I crossed the elevator locked boxes out, since that task wasn't possible during the construction point well, my supervisor disagreed. I got called in on my day off and had to explain myself for such reckless behavior pointer, these log sheets need to be completed. The elevator needs to be locked every single night, construction or not. This is a serious threat to the cafeteria's security, me. Well, the elevators are flying for the week, so that's kind of impossible, huh? No, it's not. Security can turn it back on for you, so then you can check to make sure it's locked. They can take it back offline when you're finished, I was so dumbfounded by the amount of stupid in that request. I remember sitting in her office just speechless. I must have given her a you're joking, right? Look because she kept going pointer, this isn't up for debate njvd, I will have to write you up for not checking the lock yesterday night. This cannot happen again at this point I was faking furious. My mom always told me not to burn any bridges, but sometimes people make it really hard not to. I told her I needed a minute to calm down and compose myself, which was only half true. I also had to think of a way to call her a moron without actually calling her a moron. Me, Susan, requests like this are the reason me and the rest of the staff don't respect you as a supervisor. Find me a legitimate reason to check the elevator lock and I will. Until then, don't waste my time with pointless tasks and threats of a write-up. You don't pay me enough to put up with this bullshit. She was not happy, but she caved. She retired a few months later, and I happily told her to have a good retirement and go fuck herself. I used to have a dickwad boss when I worked retail, and he made any employee available go get him breakfast or lunch. Regardless there was one girl that would wait around for him so she could be on the clock, go outside and take her sweet time getting food for him instead of working. She also did other things like sit with him in the office and entertain him with small talk point multiple times I have had to stay at this lousy low paying job in terrible weather conditions when there were clearly no costumers or business worth scavenging, we would have to sit there, look out the window and pray that we make it home safe. I had a manager that in the event of bad weather would sleep over outside on his car or in the back room. I'm guessing he was also partially to blame for obsessing a tiny bit over work. He lived about an hour away. 
that same manager was fired a few months later when he was set up by corporate to take money out of the safe to a bank, which is illegal. He did it because the person who requested it was someone on the higher up. Bottom line is, he was too nice of person, not a good thing to have in retail. Naturally he was fired after Dick Wadboss decided he didn't like him anymore. Point on the event of a blackout during busy work hours we have been told that, if the lights are out, and the registers did not work, that we will have to pull out a flashlight, walk in costumers one by one, and check them out with a calculator. It never came down to that, but I'm not surprised it has in the past. And, to get this off my chest. This is Walgreens Pharmacy I'm talking about. I've also worked for CVS which was a similar scenario, but I didn't work long enough with them to get too much of their crap. I'm sure none of the corporate people know or have approved to any of these rules and this is because they are too busy looking at the numbers instead of the wellness of their employees I was overwhelmed with school loans and decided to come back out of necessity. I got turned down, maybe because I aced the tests and looked like I knew too much. It was the best thing that's ever happened to me. I worked as a bagger in a mill, filling, sewing, and stacking about 40 ton of 20 kilograms. 44 pound bags of feed every night one humid summer night one of the mixers guys who mix the feed Faked up and dumped about two to three ton of feed in the five feet high cellar then left it for two days There was also a small water leak unchecked the last two hours of my shift I was asked to bucket the wet feed slop into 25 gallon pails and hold them upstairs to a waste bin I stand 6 feet tall, and the smell was horrible and the light was very dim, the sweat ran into my eyes. After the first 15 minutes I realized the flies got first crack at this, and the ground was moving with maggots. Every shovel of moving bio slime, I had to keep myself from retching as the maggots jumped around onto my coveralls, and climbed up my legs. After 2.5 hours of this I went up, and my boss asked me to stay overtime. I said I would, but only doing my regular job, he would have to send someone else. He insisted I go back downstairs for the next 2-3 two to three hours to finish the cleanup. I informed him that overtime was not mandatory and he should try it, then I left. I don't think I won any brownie points that day TLDR, had to shovel maggots on a hot summer night in a moist, smelly, dusty basement that was a foot shorter than I was. Note, I was not part of the full-time cleanup crew, they just did not want to do it. Pick garbage up off a field in the rain at 5 in the morning, and then clean sheet off the walls and floor of various bathrooms for the rest of other day. My first job. I was a maintenance worker at FDR State Park in Westchester, New York. Terrible times. When I was a cook at Applebee's about two years into my employment corporate cut the floor crew, a group of people who would come in every night and clean the floors, because they figured they could save a quarter of a million dollars every year by doing this. You may ask who would clean the floors, if they got rid of the floor crew. The answer is simple. Have the cooks and servers do it with no additional pay for the added responsibilities. I wonder if it really ended up being worth it seeing as how a year or two after I left the establishment there was a fun class action lawsuit about unfair wages due to a lack of compensation for additional responsibilities. Then I worked for a couple golf courses. Those jobs were fine. Nothing to complain about there. After that I got a sales position with Vector Marketing. They're the people who sell Cutco knives. They expect you to start by trying to sell their very expensive products to your family and friends and then solicit their family and friends for additional clientele. If you ask me this is a scummy business practice. I stayed with them for a few months as I quickly got out of the family and friends circle since that idea made me uncomfortable. Then I worked for the university telephone soliciting alumni for donations to the university as I finished up that undergrad degree. Honestly, it wasn't that bad. I didn't make much, but I had loans, so that didn't matter. Now I'm a marketing rep for an exterior renovation company. I like this job. The company is ethical, and I get paid very well. My only complaint is that I have to work weekends sometimes, and that the communication in the office isn't always too great. These aren't big problems considering all things, though. Oh man. Of course I would be late to the party the one time I have a good story to share. Gonna tell it anyway point I spent most of high school working as a waitress slash food prep slash dish beach at what the owner referred to as a pub grub. 
this guy already had some fat pockets from the oil business, so he basically owned the bar, so he could get drunk all day with his buddies. Dude gave no facts. Unreasonable, drunken, requests were pretty common with this guy, but one in particular always stands out. It's a Friday night and we're pretty swamped, and for some reason, the owner has taken it upon himself to get particularly trashed to prepare for the crowd. I go back into the kitchen to grab some salads and there is blood everywhere. Everywhere. It looked as if someone had taken a small squirt gun of the stuff and gone to town. So I follow the trail back to the office and find the owner throwing back a double shot of whiskey with a sizable gash in his ankle, squirting into a small pool of blood next to him. The conversation went something like, what the fuck, owner? What happened? Huh? Oh shit. How'd that happen? Go get some gauze and bandage this up for me, would ya? I grab some gauze and hand it to him and tell him there's no way I'm wrapping that for you. But I'm your boss and I need you to do it. I'm sure you want to keep this job, right, did. I mention that Steve is also the only cook working that night. Because he was. Eventually, his wife slash waitress wanders back into the kitchen wondering why the hell no food orders have been filled and loses her sheet. They're white trash arguing in the office, but mainly over whether I should take over the cooking or start cleaning the blood. I'm sure you can guess which task I choose. Having never cooked on the grill before, I'm sure I lost us a few customers that night. But I went home with a fat bonus and the next day he had no recollection of the event. We never did find out how he cut himself. I was it slash purchasing slash facilities slash swiping manager at a manufacturer who recently went bankrupt and was bought out I was told to cover up FDA and deeper regulations for this chemical company. We had hazardous chemicals in bad Chinese drums that leaked near a major water source, as in slowly kill you, but not fast enough to raise eyebrows. I said absolutely not, and was let go a couple weeks later, because they had to follow up with me too often on things I looked the CEO dead in the face, and said unfortunate for you, that your fabricated statement is about to kick you in the bulls I turned them into EPA and the New York State EPA department, they were fined over 30k, and ripped in the local newspaper. Not sure how much the FDA has fined them. I would guess all in all, 100 plus k in fines, which for that type of evil, seems like bullshit to me point they are still in business, as I liked a couple of the guys there very much, so I'm glad they are still employed, but the business owners probably took a nice hit point by the way, this was owned by Hasidic, SP, Jews, so I had to run this company top to bottom for all of September and December, and the profits spiked, and expenses dropped those two months, so follow up with me? I couldn't even call anyone to get a signature for major licenses or inspections as they are off the grid for most of this time point follow up my ass.